Me and Rick have been together for a year now, and ever since we moved into this old house near Colorado Springs, something peculiar and honestly kind of terrifying has been happening. I really don't know what to make of it, so I'll just get to the meat of my problem. My boyfriend smiles while he sleeps. I don't mean like a gentle curl of the lip. I mean his eyes are wide open and he has a massive grin from one side of his face to the other, and sometimes he breathes heavily or faintly laughs. During this time, he never blinks. The first time this occurred, I had gotten home late from work and went straight to bed. We had been in this house for less than a month and the house is at least a century old. I had a pretty late shift and wasn't really all that tired. It was a fairly sleepless night for me, so when I tossed and rolled over to face my partner's side, I nearly jumped out of my skin. He was staring at me, his chest rising and falling and his face was in a contorted sneer. I thought he was just being dumb, so after I took a minute to settle and relax, I let him know he got me good. Only he didn't respond, just kept uh, staring and smiling. I talked to him about it the next morning and he was confused. He didn't know what I was talking about and had said he's never had any complaints regarding that specific issue before. I believe him. The following night I went to sleep again and woke in the middle of the night to find what I thought sounded like scurrying across the room. I followed the sound until I was face to face with two bright eyes and a very toothy grin. Needless to say, it was a very sleepless night as well. The next day I said that we should put pillows between us while we sleep. He happily obliged, but seemed distant for some reason. I really didn't want to press him any further. This was a very uncomfortable discussion, and I think he knew that neither of us really wanted to talk about it. That night, I went to sleep, and again, woke up to the same scurrying sound that I heard the night prior. I thought I caught a glimpse of a shadow glide across the room, but I dismissed this as an REM breaking hallucination. What I will not chalk up to as being a hallucination is that I saw Rick staring at me, his eyes peering over the wall of pillows. I begged him to wake up, even slapping his face, but he never responded. I pulled my covers over my face and tried my best to fall asleep, even let out a few prayers. If it means anything, I'm, I'm an atheist. I was going to get to the bottom of what was occurring, and the next night I charged my phone and placed it against my bedside drawer, pointing at both of us. I wanted to know what happened and when, so I could maybe call a doctor and give him correct info for a proper diagnosis. I slept to the best of my ability, waking up to hear the scratching but refusing to turn around to see my partner's side. I was going to pretend like I didn't know, like everything I had imagined was just a bad nightmare. In the morning, I brought up the phone recording to my partner and he refused to watch it, but wanted me to tell him what I saw. I began the clip. Unsurprisingly, the phone actually hit the floor within the first few minutes. I supposed I did a poor job of setting it up against the bedstand. There wasn't any audio, so I decided to fast forward. I wish I hadn't. Two hours into the recording, I saw two impossibly wide eyes looking over the side of the bed, a wide grin covering the starer's face, blood veins near bursting in the whites of his eyes. It was me. I was staring at the camera, and as soon as I had finished fast-forwarding, my hand emerged over the side of the bed and waved. I chucked my phone across the room, nearly screaming. I refused to tell Rick what had happened, but he told me solemnly that he already knew. He didn't want to tell me because he thought I'd be too freaked out and would want to leave. I haven't slept for two days since. One of the hottest trends on YouTube right now is ordering these random mystery boxes from complete strangers on the deep web and opening them on camera. I don't know why I didn't realize a clear majority of these videos are fake and staged for their scare factor, but I didn't. I thought it was a great idea and hopped on the bandwagon to claim my YouTube stardom that I desperately longed for. For those who don't know a lot about the deep web, it's simply a part of the internet that isn't accessible from your basic Chrome, Firefox, or Explorer search engines. You must download the encryption program Tor and the Tor browser for starters. It's not illegal to access this part of the internet, but since it is anonymous, a great deal of illegal actions happens there. The possibilities are endless.
I grabbed my laptop I've had since I graduated in 2011 and downloaded the required programs. I prefer to use my laptop over my desktop in case of viruses and such. My seven-year-old laptop is a little more disposable. I had a little Bitcoin phase a few years ago when it was blowing up, so I had a little saved already. It wasn't much, only 0.1 Bitcoin, which translates to roughly 632 US dollars. But it was enough for what I was looking for. After the downloads were finished, I opened the browser and started my journey at the Hidden Wiki website. They provided a lot of useful links to get you started on the deep web. I scrolled through the warnings and gifts of what it was and found the links I was looking for. Almost forgot, I muttered to myself as I grabbed the duct tape from my desk drawer. I cut a tiny square piece off the end and placed it over my webcam. Call me paranoid, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. I clicked on the first link and waited what seemed like forever for the page to load. It was another very plain page with a list of popular websites that you could scroll through on the side. I continued my search through the web links until I found a page dedicated to mystery boxes. I wanted to find one around $500 so people knew I meant business on my channel. These were relatively small, staying around the 0 0.0125 to 0 0.05 Bitcoin range. I was worried about being scammed. I decided to continue my search after a quick bathroom break. When I came back, I noticed my cursor was off to the side and was able to click on a link that must have matched the background color of the web page because I couldn't see it. I indulged in my curiosity and hit the link. I was taken to a pitch black page with small white texts near the top. I'm selling one random package to any brave soul to receive it for only 0.12 Bitcoin or best offer. Only one, huh? I thought to myself, I'll shoot my shot. I hit the small payment button and was asked how much I'd like to spend. I entered 0.1 Bitcoin with fingers crossed. The payment went through without any hesitation, and I was instantly met with a chat box asking where I'd like my package sent. I know this wasn't a good idea and I regret it to this day, but the other YouTube channels use their own address often, so I thought nothing of it. I gave them my home address. I waited over a month for the box to come in, 36 days to be exact. It arrived directly on my front porch and was wrapped numerous times in red tape. I set my camera on the tripod and adjusted it to show me and the box on this small wooden table. I draped a sheet in the background so it looked a little more professional. I collected some gloves and scissors so I can bang the video out in one go. Hey everybody, welcome to tonight's vlog. Boy, do I have a surprise for you. I continue my monologue, mentioning how I got the box and how much I paid. Without wasting further time, let's open this deep web mystery box. I grab the scissors and cut along the red tape. I make sure my gloves are on tight and I rip the box open. My brow furrows as I see just one book. Without saying a word, I take the book out of the box. I was pretty pissed I spent over $600 on a book. Well, folks, looks like we got us a dud. These pages better be made of gold. The outside of the book was old and tattered, and it smelled of mildew and mold. I cracked the book open to the first page and glanced over the contents. It's an old photo album. Smells of old rot. Let's take a look at the pictures. I showed the camera a view of the page's contents. It has four pictures on the first page, all labeled by days. The first one says day one, the second one day two, and so on. The pictures were taken with an old Polaroid camera. These were pictures of airplanes, random suitcases, a couple of taxis, and some pretty shady motels. Looks like someone's old travel photos. I continue flipping through the pages. Every day was a different photo of nature or cars or trains. Day 18 held the oddest photo yet. It was just a mask, handcuffs, a gag, and a bottle of some sort of drug it looked like. These people have one hell of a fetish. I try to keep the video interesting. I zoomed into the picture with the camera so everyone can see it. Around day 32, 
things started getting weird. There was a picture of a house, but not just any house. It was the house I grew up in, my parents' house. My hand covered my mouth as I gasped for air. How is this? I'm unable to form a sentence. I'm at a loss for words. Day 33, I turn the page and see a man and a woman handcuffed and gagged. I immediately expel the contents of my stomach as I see my own mom scared and crying face and my dad face first in a pile of what looked like black tar. Day 34. This photo was taken inside what looks like a vehicle. I focused my gaze to the dashboard where a small photo was barely visible. It's an old school photo of me. They're in my dad's truck. Day 35. Another house. But this one much smaller. The photo was too blurry to make out the details. My hands are trembling and all I can hear is my heart pounding in my ears. I flip to the last page. I immediately throw the book to the ground and run to the window. I jiggle the hatch frantically and throw it open. Without hesitation, I jump out and run to the neighbors. As I'm running, I turn around for a brief second. What I saw haunts me to this day. A tall, hooded figure stood in my room. Looking at me through the window, he stood motionless. Before lifting his hands, and waving. I screamed for my neighbor who heard me inside and called the cops. I sat and just cried. I cried out of fear for my life. I cried for my parents. I cried because it was all my fault. My lack of common sense got my parents killed and I will have to live with that forever. If you access the deep web, do not release any personal information. Even if people on YouTube do it, most of it's not real and always check your boxes. It would have saved me a lot of trouble if I would have noticed the box I received had no tracking sticker on it. It was hand-delivered. There used to be a small YouTube channel called Sam's Online Food Review. It was run by my best friend Sam Ryder, a channel full of videos that consisted of Sam eating and reviewing food and drink before a camera. His channel garnered around 10,000 subscribers, which, although wasn't huge, it was big enough for Sam to be dedicated to it. I can recall numerous times of sitting in the passenger seat of his car, staying out of his shot as moments prior, he announced he wanted to video himself trying something he picked up in the store. Only moving after he signed off with his signature, thumbs up or down and his catchphrase, I like it or I loathe it. He was liked for his friendly attitude and happy all-around good guy persona. He was well received by his audience. Rarely were there any hate comments, and when there was, Sam would shrug them off and keep smiling. Sam was always smiling. Sam's online food review went dark seven months ago. No warning, no notice, just deactivated. I didn't hear or see from Sam despite numerous phone calls and house visits to no avail. Six days after his channel was deleted, I called the police to do a welfare check on Sam. I was worried he had fallen ill or hurt himself. The police made entry into his property and found nothing, and Sam was declared a missing person. A week after Sam was declared missing, a dog walker discovered a horrifically mutilated corpse on a railway line. The body had severe lacerations all around the head, arms, chest, and legs, and was almost cut in two across the waist. The decomposing internal organs splayed out of the gruesome V-shaped cut. The autopsy report noted that although no direct cause of death could be confirmed, it was likely the large slit in the throat that brought on death. The autopsy also turned up questionable findings, including the body missing its stomach and heart. Long strips of flesh removed off the chest, arms, and lower back, and that the body was exsanguated. The scene wasn't remarkably bloody, yet the body was almost completely drained of blood. Two weeks later, the police had identified the deceased. Despite the damage that occurred to the corpse, the teeth were intact enough to get a viable reference for dental records. My worst fears for Sam were realized. It was him. The police investigated, but could not find forensic evidence of any other person being on the scene. They eventually came to the conclusion that he was hit by a passing freight train, 
the lacerations and disembowelment attributed to being dragged under, and the missing organs being explained away as being eaten by wildlife, a fox maybe. Sam's mother decided it was best to cremate what remained of her only son. I stood next to her as the beach coffin was pulled into the large furnace. As the door closed and the gas jets ignited with a whoosh, she broke down into tears and so did I. I stood there, sobbing for the 90 minutes it took for one of the people I grew up with and shared so many memories. It was vaporized. I mourned my friend and did my best to move on. And it was going well. I got distracted, got a new job, started dating a girl I met through my work. A few months passed, and even though I missed Sam, things were going well. Right up to the point when I was browsing Reddit at 3 a.m., and I received a Facebook message from the account of my dead friend. I froze, seeing his profile picture in the messenger bubble, a picture taken during good times. Sam's white smile plastered on his face. I felt a sudden chill. A profound sense of fear enveloped me. You know the fear that makes you cold and your limbs ache as the slow drip of adrenaline spreads throughout your body? With dread, I opened the message. It was a link to a file-sharing website. I stared at the seemingly random amalgamation of numbers and letters that made up the URL. My head racing through what the hell was on the other side of the link, and more importantly, why did my dead friend send me it? My hand, seemingly on autopilot, brought the cursor above the link. With my gut instinct screaming no, I clicked on the link. Before my finger had lifted from the click, I immediately regretted what I just did. Chrome opened a new tab to the website. The screen was gray, apart from a black rectangle in the middle of the page which had a play button on it. I stared at it, unwilling to click. What I was scared of, I did not know. Around ten seconds had passed, then the screen refreshed. Instead of the play button, the rectangle had the words auto-playing in five seconds in bright white on it. I watched as the numbers counted down, trying to understand what was going on. An abrupt buzzing noise made me jump. The video began to play. The camera was pointed at what appeared to be a grimy, white, tiled surface. I could hear the sound of muffled whimpering, followed by footsteps of someone approaching the camera. There was some slight, rustling noise as the camera was adjusted. The screen blurred out as the camera was turned. When the camera came back into focus, I let out a choked gasp. In the middle of a white, tiled room, Sam lay on his back on a stainless steel table. His eyes were pure, unfiltered terror. The light of a single bulb hanging over the table reflected the sheen of sweat that coated his forehead, his naked chest rising and falling rapidly in panic. He looked into the camera and attempted to yell. The noise, muffled by a tight cloth gag that was bound around his head. His hands were also bound together tightly with duct tape. I stared at the screen, feeling increasingly sick my brain failing to grasp what was going on before I could even comprehend what was happening. The sound of Sam squirming and whimpering was interrupted by a high-pitched, Welcome to Sam's Online Food Review. Today, we have a special treat. The mocking tone came from behind the camera. Sam's panic increased. He started jerking his body, trying to free his hands. The voice continued, Today, we will try what is considered a delicacy in many countries. Although... Usually a forbidden one, that is. The camera zoomed out slightly, and a man appeared in the frame standing in front of Sam. He was dressed in a white coat with a red striped apron on. He wore a butcher's hat and a cloth face mask. In his rubber, gloved hands, he held a large, red-handled butcher's scimitar, and in the other he held a sharpening rod. The man started running the knife up and down the blade in a smooth fashion. The steel on steel making a smooth sh 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 noise. Sam's panicked, muffled yells grew stronger. The man placed down the sharpening rod and walked around the table. Sam turned his head and started what sounded like a desperate pleading with the man. Poor little man, the man cooed. It won't hurt long and you'll be delicious. Even from here I could see that tears filled my friend's eyes as he struggled. The man rolled Sam onto his front 
and pulled his head over the edge of the table. As I watched this happen, I threw up. I fell out of my chair in horror. I pulled myself away, not able to see any more. I fell again by the door, the speakers of my computer loud enough to hear what sounded like slicing and grunting. I lay curled up in the corner, sobbing amidst a panic attack. The minutes feeling like hours. When the sound stopped, I shakily got up and walked to my computer, avoiding the pool of sick on the floor. I forced myself to look at the screen. The page had closed, and Chrome displayed the Reddit screen. The Facebook tab had one notification. I didn't want to click it, but I willed myself to. It was a message from Sam. I like it. Nine one one. What's your emergency? There's something up with my roommate. Are they sick? Hurt? No, but she's probably gonna hurt someone else if you don't arrest her. What are you talking about? She's insane. Completely batshit. She turned my first semester of college into a fucking horror movie, and now she's disappeared off doing God knows what. You have to arrest her. Ma'am, calm down. What is your roommate's name? All right. You said she's disappeared. When was the last time you saw her? Yesterday morning. So not very long. Have you tried contacting her family, friends? Is there anyone who might know where she is? No. I don't know how to get in touch with her family. I barely know anything about about them. About her. How long have you two been roommates? Only since September. We've both been students at. I assume you two both have busy schedules, huh? Yeah. What about it? Do you sometimes go a couple days without seeing each other? Well, yes. So why do you say she's missing? She left a note. A note? Yes. It said that she was leaving for a few days and that I should stay out of her room. Uh huh. There's a real nasty smell coming from there. I'm scared to go inside. I'm scared of what I might find. Do you believe your roommate left willingly? Yes, but you have to find her before something terrible happens. You think your roommate is a danger to herself, to others? Yes, and even if she wasn't insane, I would still be worried. We have exams coming up, and she takes her studies seriously. Also, she left her wallet and phone behind, and all the sharpest knives from the kitchen are missing. You think she stole them? I wouldn't put it past her. All right, can you tell me a little more about your roommate? What is there to tell? She's so secretive. I know that she's from out of town, and that during her teenage years, she spent some time in a psych ward. She has a history of mental illness? Well, that I can't say for sure. I don't know if she's mentally ill. I'm pretty sure. She's just a sociopath. Is that a mental illness? I don't know, dear. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Just find my roommate, please! I need your address. Thanks, dear. I'm sending an officer over to speak with you. He will take down whatever information you may have and search your place. No! You have to send someone after her, not to me! This is standard procedure, dear. Just trust me, everything is going to be okay. You can't promise that! Stay calm, kid. Stay on the line with me, alright? Okay. Are you alright, kid? I almost hope you guys don't find her. What do you mean? I don't want to see her again. I don't want her near me. I need you to calm down. I'm scared. I know, honey. I understand, but you're going to be okay. This isn't the first time it's pulled a stunt like this. It's not? No. What happened? About a month ago, she disappeared for the weekend. Uh-huh. She didn't tell me where she was going, but she packed a suitcase. So I assumed she had gone home to visit her family. Uh-huh. I was sick and stuck in the bed for two days, so I would have noticed if she came back. She didn't. Uh-huh. I didn't hear from her all that time. It didn't surprise me much, since we don't talk much, even when we're both home. Did something happen? That's what I think. She came home very early Monday morning, and she looked exhausted, like she hadn't slept all that time. She was covered in mud and blood. Excuse me? Blood? Yes. She said it was her blood, and that she had been in a car accident. She had fallen asleep at the wheel and driven headlong into a ditch. Instead of trying to get help, she crawled out of the wreckage and walked the rest of the way home. Did she go to the hospital? Yes, I took her. On the way there, she was acting very out of it and babbling incoherently. Something about a fire and men and speaking in tongues. It was weird. What happened next? I thought she had a concussion. 
but the doctor at the hospital found no signs of a head injury. It had broken an arm and four cracked ribs. But other than that... She was in pretty good shape for someone who had been in such a serious crash. Uh-huh. After the car accident, she only got worse. I mean, she had always been weird, but now... I didn't feel safe living under the same roof as her. What did she do that made you feel threatened? She began sleepwalking. She would wander around her dorm room in circles, muttering about how she was going to hell and how there was demons coming for her. Sometimes it sounded like she was praying, but I didn't recognize the language. I see. I began finding dead files all over, piled up on the window sills and drowned them in the toilet. And I once found a dead rat on my bed. It had been gutted and drained of blood. I hate rodents. It was disgusting. And you think your roommate was the cause of all that? Yes. You're sure? Look, it sounds fucking stupid, but there is no other explanation. At least, none that I can think of. Just hang in there, kid. I hear them! Good. I have to see what's in the bedroom. No, you don't. Just stay put, alright? No, I have to see. What if it's... <laughs> hey, are you there? What's wrong? <laughs> The police found the caller locked in the bathroom, crying and freaking out. It took them nearly an hour to calm her down and talk her into going back down to the station with them. In the room, they found dead rats in various stages of decomposition, heaps of dead flies and a charred human body. It was later identified as an elderly woman who had gone missing around the same time the caller's roommate vanished. I could not find the cause of death. As for the roommate, she was found a month later, hanging from a tree deep in the woods. A couple of hunters stumbled upon her totally by mistake. She had left a long rambling suicide note that only raised more questions than answers. She had died the day she disappeared. Police never found the missing knives or figured out why she had taken them. As far as I know, the murder of the elderly woman remains open to this very day. I don't know what became of the caller, but I hope she was able to recover from the trauma of such a horrific experience. I also hope that her new roommate was much easier to live with than the last. Nine one one. what's your emergency? I'm being stalked. Stalked? Yes, I've barricaded myself in my house, and if I dare set foot outside, the little shit'll kill me. Who? One of my students. He's hunting me down. He's standing at the foot of my driveway, waiting. He's wearing a mask of some sort, but I know it's him. No one else gives off such a sinister aura. Your student? Yes, I'm a teacher. French, to be specific. He's in one of my classes. Uh-huh. And how old is this boy? Thirteen. Thirteen? Yes, I know it sounds absurd. And I know how foolish I may seem, a middle-aged woman terrified of a teenager, but... Ma'am, calm down. Can you tell me your address? All right. The police are on their way. Where are you in your house? The bedroom. I'm watching the boy through a gap in the curtains. How long has he been there? About thirty minutes now. And he's remained in the same position the whole time. Yep, he hasn't moved an inch. And he's wearing a mask? Yes, a plain white mask, like Phantom of the Opera. Only it covers his whole face. And you're sure it's him? I'm sure. Okay, ma'am, just stay where you are. The police are on their way. Is there anything else about his physical appearance that stands out? Can you tell if he's carrying some kind of weapon? No weapons, but... He could be hiding God knows what underneath his raincoat. The thing is much too big for him. He's practically swimming in it. Oh God, what if he kills the police before they can get to me? Don't worry about that, ma'am. Just stay put. Stay on the line with me. He's probably hiding a gun under that ridiculous coat. He's probably hiding ten guns. There isn't much I would put past this boy. He's developed some sick fascination with me. His twisted desires have been festering for months. What do you mean? The boy's crazy. He seems to have a crush on me. Can you imagine I'm old enough to be his mother? Hell, I am a mother. My eldest is only a year younger than that Jared is. Jared? Is that the boy's name? 
Yes. Ma'am, are you alone in your house? Yes, that is why Jared came tonight. He knew I would be alone. He knew? He's been spying on me. I'm sure of it. For months. He's been leaving elaborate flower bouquets on my desk, writing me sexually explicit notes, and trailing me to and from school on his bike. He found out where I live. And he swore revenge after I rejected him. Rejected? He, he cornered me in the teacher's parking lot one evening. He had a knife and a dozen roses. He shoved the flowers into my hands and he told me that he loved me. That he believed we were meant to be. He, sa he said he was prepared to leave his family and his life behind. And in order for us to be together, I would have to do the same. Uh-huh. I told him I would do no such thing. Of course I did. I told him he was acting crazy and needed to leave immediately. He lunged at me and he held the knife to my throat. I was convinced he was going to kill me. But then a police car drove by, scaring Jared off. And he disappeared into the darkness. I fell to the ground and just sat there, sobbing for the better part of 30 minutes. Finally, I regained enough composure to get into my car and drive away. Uh-huh. And did you report this incident? <sighs> no. No, I did not. God, what a foolish woman I am. Why didn't you report what had happened? I was in shock and denial. I didn't want to face the danger I was in. The following morning, another note appeared on my desk. It said, You will be fucking sorry. I am going to make you suffer. You'll be begging me for mercy once I'm through with you. Uh-huh. And now he's just standing outside my house, wearing a mask, and staring up at the bedroom window. He knows I can see him. He knows I'm watching. Oh, thank God. The police will handle this, ma'am. Right now, I need you to stay where you are and await further instructions from the cops. I see them. I see the cruisers. Oh. Oh, no. What's the matter? He's pulled out a gun. Jared's pulled out a gun. He's aiming at the police. He's going to shoot. Stay calm, ma'am. How the hell am I supposed to stay calm? He's going to kill the police next. And then me. Jared wounded one of the officers, but they still managed to apprehend him. He was taken to the police station. The caller was taken to the hospital suffering from shock. The call itself is unnerving, but it's what happened next that truly terrified me. After his arrest, Jared spent some time in a mental health facility. His obsession with his French teacher ran deep. An investigation uncovered hundreds of photos he'd taken of her in secret. He had several journals filled with long ramblings, detailing all the sick fantasies he wanted to act out with the woman he desired. After several months, it seemed Jared had improved enough to be released from the hospital. He still had to attend regular sessions with a therapist, but it seemed he had made a turnaround. He graduated from high school and went on to college, all the while maintaining zero contact with his former French teacher. The story didn't truly end for over 20 years. While searching for background information regarding this call, I discovered that in 2018, the woman who made the call had been murdered. She was in her 60s by then and had been stabbed to death in her own living room. DNA found at the scene matched Jared's, but before they could arrest him, the psychopath was killed in a car accident. Some suspected he had crashed on purpose, choosing to die rather than face the consequences of his horrific actions. I guess that old cliché is true. You never forget your first love. Pair that with bitter rejection and a mind warped beyond repair, and you get a brutal murder over twenty years in the making. We live a normal life. We have a beautiful little two-year-old baby girl. Yeah, 
we're both pretty weird and love paranormal everything and are pretty alternative in style, but in this day and age, that's normal. Today was a typical day. Hubby kissed me and the baby goodbye this morning and left like he does every morning. Me and the baby go about our day playing and cleaning. We even decide to make daddy's favorite dinner. He gets out at 6 p.m. and it takes him about 15 minutes to drive home. He usually calls me and we talk until he drives up. But today at 6 o'clock, almost on the dot, my doorbell rings. I peek and I see it's my husband. I open the door and greet him, telling him I didn't expect to see him so soon since he didn't call. He says, oh, I guess I forgot, honey. When he spoke, my skin crawled. I instantly noticed something was off about him. He was making me feel like he was a crooked painting on the wall, unnerving. Not to mention, in our entire five-year relationship, he's never called me honey. I'm just being paranoid because the night before we had watched Invasion of the Body Snatchers and sometimes movies like that make me question my reality. Can you let me in, babe? He says, breaking my thought. Sorry, babe. I open the door and he walks in. Instead of going to his usual chair to take off his work boots, he goes to the couch, which is weird. The baby runs out of her play area to do her and her daddy's little love game they do when he gets home. But when she gets four feet from him, she stopped and runs to my side. Say hi to daddy, sweetie. She hesitates and looks at me, but eventually says, hi daddy. He says nothing to her, just waves at her. We made your favorite dinner, babe. I look at him with a smile. Oh, what is it? My husband is a big boy. He loves his food. And we both know his favorite dinner is meatloaf and my special mac and cheese. And my baby has never once reacted to her own daddy like that. I mean, they're best friends for God's sake. She waits all day to see her daddy. I put the baby in the high chair to eat and I sit down next to her. He stays sitting on the couch, just sitting there with a resting smile, staring at the blank TV. I start analyzing him from my seat. Were his eyes always that dark? Was that what he was wearing when he left this morning? Where's your keys, babe? I asked him. In my pocket, he replied. Then why did you ring the doorbell instead of just coming in? I must have left them here. My mind starts railing. This isn't my fucking husband, bro. I don't know who this motherfucker is, but it's not the father of my child. I tell the baby that we have to go to sleep early because we have to go to grandma's in the morning, even though that wasn't true. I scooped her up and sheepishly walked past him to get to my bedroom. Good night, girls, he says as we pass. Once I get out of his line of sight, I bolt down the hallway into my room and lock the door. The baby and I are watching a movie now. I just texted my husband's phone and say I love you just to see if he responds. Husband texts back, I love you too, baby. Daddy will be home soon. We just had a lot of extra stuff to move over here. Give Bubby a kiss for me. I freeze as the realization of something pretending to be my husband is in my house. I'm in a room with no protection, with my precious baby, and the only thing separating us and whatever that is, is a one inch thick flimsy door fully sets in. I texted him back explaining somewhat that there's someone in the house and I can't call 911 for fear of him hearing me. It's currently 6.45 p.m. and I can hear police sirens coming closer, but I see him. I see his feet under the crack of the door. All I can do is sit in the furthest corner of the room behind my dresser with my sleeping child on my lap and pray that the cops get here before it decides it's going to do whatever it came here to do. I had questions. Questions no one would or could answer. As a parent, I needed to know. I needed to know what had happened to her. My princess, my only child, gone, disappeared into the night, and the police refused to let me into her apartment, treating it as a crime scene. They told me to take a step back and let them do their job. Not to get involved and just sit by the phone and wait for more information, but I couldn't. Could you have in that situation? So I did what any parent would do. I began poring over everything I had access to, looking for names of her friends, places she used to go. Anything that could potentially help me find my girl again, Alison. After two days without any further information from the police, I was lay in bed, lost in purgatory between grief and hope, when it hit me like a truck. The call tracing app we downloaded for her phone. A couple of months back, Alison was getting grief from an ex who couldn't let her go. But as it was all on the phone, the police refused to get involved, so we downloaded an app that automatically recorded her calls in the hope it would help her case. 
I jumped out of bed and logged into the cloud that stored all her recordings. I wish I hadn't. To attempt to make sense of what I heard, here are the transcripts to the calls that led up to her disappearance. Call incoming, unsaved number, 2nd of July, 2021, 1404. Hi, who is this? Hi, is this Rob? Or is Rob there? Oh, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. Okay, my bad, don't worry about it, thanks. Call ended. Call incoming, unsaved number, 3rd of July, 2021, 1530. Hi, I don't have this number saved. Who is this? Hi, hope you don't mind me calling you again. Again? When did you call me? Wait, is this the wrong number from yesterday? It is. My name's Jared. I'll be honest, I like the sound of your voice yesterday. I thought about you for the rest of the day. I had to speak to you again. Wow. Okay, bit forward. Well, unfortunately for you, I'm taken, sorry. You sure? What do you mean, am I sure? I should know if I'm taken or not. I'm just saying, are you sure you're taken? Not lying to me, are you? Yes, I'm sure. I'm going to hang up now. Wait, Alice. Call ended. Call incoming. Louise. 3rd of July, 2021. 1540. Lou, I'm being serious. It was freaking weird, okay? Okay, okay, I believe you. I called you as soon as you text me. What do you mean he was going to call you by your name? Are you sure you didn't tell him your name? And what did you say back to him? No, no, I told him I was hanging up. And just as I pressed the button, I swear he was saying, wait, Alison, as if to tell me not to hang up. But I didn't tell him my name, I promise you. Have you rang your father? You know how overprotective he is. If you're worried, why haven't you called him? Don't want to bother him. Can you just stay at mine tonight? I know I'm overreacting, but I don't want to be alone. I'll rent whatever you want on Prime, and we can get pizza. (laughs) Girl, you just needed to say pizza. I'll be right over. Let me just get ready. Call ended. Call incoming, Louise, 3rd of July, 2021, 1750. Hey, how far away are you? Not far. Got off the bus a few stops early. Was getting a real weird vibe from this guy sitting at the back of the bus. Okay, not a problem. Wait, I see you coming up the drive. It's fine. Al, what? I see you. You just got to my drive. I'm upstairs in the bedroom window. I'm waving right now, see? You saw me, you waved back. Al, I'm not on your street yet. That's not me. Don't play with me. I can see you holding the phone up to your ear. Well, what am I wearing? Why are you still playing with me? You're in black trousers and a dark hoodie. I knew it was you as soon as I saw the hood up. Lame way to scare me, Lou, especially with why I called you over not cool. See, now you wave back. Giving up on the joke? Go to the bathroom, Al. Or hide under your bed. That's not me. I swear. What are they doing now? Being serious. You need to tell me now. Because if that isn't you... Then whoever it is, is walking closer to the house and is looking straight up at me. I still can't see their face yet. I'm running now, I'm coming. Put the phone down and call your dad or the police. You need to call someone. Can't. Please don't put the phone down. I don't want to be alone. I'm scared. They're getting closer. I... That's... That's a man. I'm certain of it. Shit. What do I do? What do I do? Do you have any scissors or a knife or anything to protect yourself with? Go to somewhere you can hide. I'm almost at yours now. Oh God, oh God, oh God, they're in the house. No, please, no, please hurry. What do I do? What do I do? Get in the wardrobe or under the bed. You need to hide. Listen to me. Go hide now. Don't want to cry. I can hear him coming up the stairs. Alison, you shouldn't have put the phone down. I only wanted to talk to you. It's him. It's the guy who was calling me. Lou, he's here. What do I do, Lou? Lou, are you still there? Lou, what's going on? He only wanted to talk to you. What? Who? What do you mean? My brother. He's been away a while. And now he's out and back. He just wanted someone to talk to. So I gave him your number. It was his idea to pretend to be a wrong number. He said it would be sweet. You know him! What the hell, Lou? Lou! You really shouldn't have hung up on him. Has a terrible temper. Get away from me, Lou! He's... He's... He's going to... I guess there's no point beating around the bush. So I'm just going to get straight to it. There's a dead body in my basement. No, I'm not kidding. 
It's the God's honest truth. And here's the thing. It's been there for over a week now. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, dude, that's fucked up. And you're right. It is. But I can assure you, there's a perfectly valid reason for why it's still there. I'll explain why in a minute. But let me fill you in on the details first. About a week ago, I was taking some dirty laundry down to the basement. I walked down the stairs and made my way over to the light switch on the other side and discovered there was a guy, dressed in a suit and tie, lying on his back in the middle of the floor. His hands were folded together like he was praying, and he had a big knife sticking out of his chest. To say that I was gobsmacked would be like the frickin' understatement of the century. I couldn't move. I just stood there, completely frozen, staring at the guy like a deer trapped in oncoming headlights. The first semi-coherent thought that passed through my brain about twenty seconds later was that it had to be a practical joke, that some of my douchebag friends would come running out any second with a camera and big grin screaming, Gotcha, dumbass! And I wished that that had happened, but no such luck. There was no one else there. It was just me and Mr. Mysterious Dead Guy. And that's when the enormity of it finally hit me. And I nearly passed out. And can you really blame me? There I was in my own basement, thinking everything is fine and dandy and wham, frickin' bam. I stumble across a dead body. So a couple of minutes goes by, and I'm slowly starting to come out of the days I'm in and working up the necessary courage to go over there for a closer look. But as I approach the guy, I have second thoughts. So I stop, turn around and grab a hammer from the tool shop behind the staircase. Don't ask me why, but that's what I did. Then I go back to the body. And that's when I see that his eyes are open and my heart skips a beat. It's creepy enough having a dead body in your basement, but it's even creepier having a dead body with its eyes open. Anyway, I walk a little closer and I see the bluest eyes I have ever seen in my life. It's almost like they're made out of polished ice. And they're staring straight up at the ceiling like the owner has just seen a goddamn ghost up there. So I stand where I am for a few minutes, wondering what the hell do I do now? And then, all of a sudden, I decide to check if he's got any ID on him. I mean, that's what they do on TV, right? Figure out who the victim is and all that shit? So I take a few breaths and kneel down next to the guy and start going through his pockets. I'm careful not to touch him, which is actually fairly easy if you take your time. Then, about a minute into the search, I find what I'm looking for. A wallet. And that's when all fucking hell breaks loose. As I'm going through the content of his wallet, the light goes out, and I'm cast into complete darkness. I mean, I can't even see an inch in front of me. All I manage to say is, Jesus Christ, and then a cold hand locks itself around my wrist and starts to squeeze. If you've ever been truly scared, and I mean really fucking scared, then you can multiply your experience by ten, and you know how I felt. And yeah, you guessed it, I wet my pants. There was nothing I could do to stop it. It just came pouring out like water from a goddamn garden hose. Then I sucked in a couple gallons of air and nearly passed out. So there I was. My heart was doing somersaults inside my chest, and I could feel the taste of blood and sulfur in my mouth. And last, but not least, I had a dead, cold hand wrapped around my wrist. I tried to jump up to my feet, but the hand was holding me tight and didn't see it a millimeter. There was no way I was going to be able to stand up. Then wham, another hand locks onto my arm, just above where the other one is, and that's when I started screaming from the top of my lungs. I was like a wild animal. I was kicking and screaming, hitting the hands, trying to extricate myself, but it was no use. It was like my arm was stuck in a vice. Then the hands try to pull me closer, and I go fucking mental. I throw myself backwards and kick the guy repeatedly, trying desperately to break free. I throw my arm behind me, hoping to find something I can grab onto. And that's when my hand bumps into the hammer. I hit it with such force that I should be withering in pain. But the adrenaline numbed the sensation and I was able to ignore it. At that point, I probably could have taken a few sucker punches straight to the head and still kept going. So I finally realize what it is. 
And after fumbling around for it with my hand for a second or two, I manage to get hold of it, and then something inside me takes over, and I go straight into autopilot mode. My arms start swinging with full force, and the hammer keeps striking the guy repeatedly. It was like an out-of-body experience, like witnessing a psycho bashing the shit out of someone on TV and not really caring when iota about what happened to the victim. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I probably kept at it for a good minute, and then I noticed the guy's hands had relinquished their grip on my arm. So I jump up and bolt across the room and manage to run straight into the wall and almost knock myself out cold, but I remain conscious. Then I race over to the stairs and run up to the kitchen where I throw myself into a corner and assume the fetal position. Well, actually, I pushed a heavy cabinet up against the door leading down to the basement first, just to be on the safe side. So I sit there for almost an hour, hyperventilating and sweating bullets until I'm finally able to think coherent thoughts again. Then I grab a torch and a new bulb and I return to the basement. The hand holding the torch is shaking like a vibrator, but I'm able to hold on to it. The first thing I do is to shine the light on the guy's face, just to make sure he's still there. He is. His face looks like an overinflated punching ball. It's covered in blood, mucus, and bruises. Then I grab a stepladder and change the light bulb, and approach the guy for a second inspection. And this time, I make sure to stay a half a dozen feet away. And that's when I notice it. His hands are exactly in the same position as they were when I first saw him. They're folded together on top of his chest. It's like he never moved them and never grabbed my arm. I shake my head in disbelief and blink a few times, thinking my eyes are doing a trick on me, but they're not. His hands really are folded together which means he must have folded them while I was bashing him with a hammer or someone else latched onto my arm. The thought scares the shit out of me and I quickly snatch the hammer off the floor and raise it above my head. Then I start going through every inch of the basement. I make sure to take my time and I do a thorough search. But the basement is empty. It's just the two of us down there. So I go back upstairs and that's when I realize what a terrible predicament I have managed to get myself into. If I call the cops, they'll automatically assume that I killed the guy and I'll get locked up for life. And if there is one place I don't want to go to, it's the penitentiary. Or, as the folks around these parts jokingly refer to it, the penetrationary. Guys like me, who's only five foot ten and weighs just shy of 150 pounds, generally don't have a good time in places like that if you get my drift. And that's when I realize I have to get rid of the body. That's the only way. And that's where I'm at now. It's been exactly one week since I punched the guy's ticket. There has been no mention of him in the media. So I guess he wasn't that popular, and thank God for that. I don't think I could put on a straight face if the cops came knocking at my door. I am not gonna lie. The last week has been pure hell. The memory of the ordeal never leaves me. It's like a dripping faucet. It doesn't matter how hard I turn the tap. I just can't stop it. But I think I've managed to deal with it pretty well. I don't think I've given anyone a reason to suspect that I've recently bashed someone to death with a carpenter's hammer. I've also reached a decision as to how I'm going to solve this problem. Although it's not something I'm looking forward to. But hey, beggars can't be choosers, right? I've been down to the local hardware store and acquired two new handsaws, some heavy-duty bin liners, duct tape, and a hazmat suit. Items that will come in handy for what I've got planned. It will probably take me all night, but I don't think I'll run into any major problems. All I can say is thank God that it's winter and that the temperatures are in the low 20s. Everything should be frozen solid by now, so there won't be much of a mess to clean up afterwards. I've also done a few online searches, and I've got a good idea of how to dispose of the various evidence. But that's not something I'm going to share with you. That's a secret that I'll take to my grave. Well, I think that about covers it. Please wish me luck. If everything goes according to plan, I just might be able to get away with it. And with time, 
put this entire mess behind me. If not, I guess you'll see my face in the papers and on TV before you know it. How will you recognize me if it comes to that? Well, that's a pretty easy question to answer. I'll be the little white guy, looking straight into the camera, protesting my innocence. This happened a few years ago, and sometimes I still have nightmares where I didn't manage to get away. Let me start off by saying I live in a pretty big city, lots of bars and clubs, and I have experience with partying and drugs. I've been in blackout drunk situations, and this was not that. I no longer go out on my own. That night, I had decided to go out with some friends, bar hopping. I mainly knew only one of the girls that I hung out with on the regular. The other two were more acquaintances or strangers. I was very outgoing and loved meeting people, so that was nothing new for me. We had a few drinks at a bar and continued on to the next one, having fun, great times. One of the girls I didn't know well pulled out the party stuff sometime during our second bar visit. I decided to skip it because I wasn't looking to get effed up that night. My friend said yes, and she and the third girl went to the bathroom. The second girl, let's call her Barb, kept saying I should go with the two others. I declined and declined. She got a little aggressive and mean after the third time I declined. My friend came back just then, and Barb acted like nothing had just happened. We had some new guys join our group to flirt. I'm in a relationship, but my friend and Barb were not. By then, the second girl had left. Barb and my friend were starting to get pretty messed up. I went to use the bathroom and text my boyfriend that I was coming home soon and saw that my phone was dead. When I came back, the guys had gotten us shots. I was still pretty sober and declined the shot. Barb shoved the shot into my hand and to avoid a scene, I took it. I started to tell my friend I was heading home, but one look at her face and Barb and I saw they were out of it. I was starting to feel pretty woozy myself. So, I grabbed my things and their things and started shoving them to go. The guys that bought the shots were protesting, but I wasn't getting resistance from the girls. I hailed a cab. My phone was dead, so no Uber. And I remember putting the girls in the back and telling the driver that we were dropping off my friends at their house, then going to my address. Then, blacked out. I remember dropping off my friend. Then, a blackout. Then I was alone with that driver. I was in the front seat and he was holding my hand. I looked around, disoriented, took in the sight of him holding my hand while driving, like my boyfriend would. I saw my wallet in the center cup holder. The meter was off and was telling me that he was taking me to a romantic place. I told him no, please take me home. My boyfriend was waiting at home. He said something along the lines of, stop talking about him, I told you, which to me in hindsight indicates that I had told him already many times. He said he just wanted to pretend for a little and held my hand tighter. I didn't want to trigger a violent reaction, so I left my hand there and started to reach for my wallet with my other hand. He saw, let go of my hand, and took my wallet from the cup holder to his other side where I couldn't reach. I was still woozy and blacked out again. When I came to my senses, we were parked near a very known romantic and touristy location in my city. Normally, this place is packed, not that night. It's pretty far from anything else too, and surrounded by woods. I started to cry and tell him please take me home. I want to see my boyfriend. I won't tell anyone, please. He looked at me and said, I'll take you home if you pretend you're my girlfriend for a little while. I sat there, in shock. I wished my brain wasn't addled. I wished I had never gone out. I wished I could see my boyfriend for the thousandth time that night. I said okay. He smiled, put my wallet back in the cup holder. I took it slowly and put it under my leg. He took my hand and looked out the front window out into the little lake he had brought me to. He started talking, and I don't remember what he was saying. I was trying not to black out again. I waited for him to look at me and asked again, Please, take me home. He said if I let him give me a kiss. I said no. He looked mad for a fraction of a second and squeezed the hand he was still holding. He leaned in fast and kissed me anyways. I kept my lips sealed tight against him, ready to fight, ready to bite and scratch and not go down easy. He let go of my hand and backed away. He started the car and started our way back to civilization. I was crying as silently as possible, trying not to be heard, so he would forget I was there and want to touch me, hold my hand. I waited till we were near enough to people that I could bolt out of the car and find another way home. I think he saw me grabbing my wallet from under my leg 
and knew my intention to jump out at the next red light. He snatched it again and said he would drive me. I just nodded, but by then I didn't care about the wallet, my phone, or anything else. Lee jumping out. No matter what, I was going to get home. I didn't know what time it was by then. I do know there was almost no cars driving in my usually busy city. No buses. No people. I didn't care anymore. He stopped at a red light. I unlocked the door and yanked it open and ran. I didn't look back, but I heard a car peel out of the intersection. He was running, too. My phone still dead. No wallet, so no money. Really far from my house. I was still drowsy and crying. I had no idea of the time. I started walking home. I heard a car pull up near me and started running out of instinct. I heard a woman's voice yell out, Are you okay? I stopped and swirled around. The most beautiful person I've ever seen in the world was walking towards me slowly, hands out in front of her so as to not scare me. I started crying even harder, even more incoherent than I had ever been in my life. She hugged me so hard and asked for my boyfriend's number. She called him. He answered straight away. She started telling him where I was, that I was okay, that she was taking me home. I cried the whole way back, trying to explain what happened, but still woozy, still freaking out. It was hard, so we drove in relative silence. When we got home, my boyfriend was waiting outside losing his mind. My savior gave me a phone number to call her when I felt better, and drove off. It was 5 a.m. I left the bar at 10 p.m., that's all I can remember. A week later, my wallet showed up in my mailbox. So yeah, taxi driver, I hope we never meet again. Nine one one. what's your emergency? My ex is here, and I think she's gonna kill me. Excuse me? My ex-girlfriend. She's parked outside my apartment building. I think she's waiting for me to come out. And you think she's going to kill you? She will kill me if I leave my apartment. Stay where you are, sir. Is the door to your apartment locked? Yes. And your windows? Yes, but I'm on the third floor. I don't think that bitch will try to climb up and get in through the window. Actually, that sounds exactly like what she would do. Oh, shit. Stay calm, sir. My little sister is here with me. So is my new girlfriend. I'm afraid she'll kill them after she's done with me. Sir, I need you to stay calm, alright? You're going to be okay, but I need more information. What is this woman's name? Her name is... I dated her for about a year, but we've been broken up for six months now. She's fucking insane. Uh Uh-huh. Has she ever threatened you before? No, but she's dangerous. How so? She once attacked another girl back when she was in high school. That was long before we even met, but I heard about it through a mutual friend. She beat some poor girl unconscious with a curtain rod. A curtain rod? It sounds fucking insane, but it's true. Broke the girl's rib and gave her a concussion. She got away with it, somehow. Uh Uh-huh. And while we were dating, she threatened my female friends. She was really jealous and always thought I was cheating on her. Uh Uh-huh. She left messages on their answering machines. I'm not sure how she got their numbers, but violent messages and scared them half to death. Uh Uh-huh. After we broke up, she left me threatening messages too. Followed me home from work a few times. Once, she left a dead bird on the hood of my car. Are you sure it was her who put it there? Well, I guess I can't be 100% certain, but who else could it be? I don't know anyone else that crazy. Please, you have to believe me. I believe you, sir. Really? Because I went down to the police station a week ago and begged them to help me. But they just blew me off and told me to stop being such a wimp. They said there was no way a woman could be a genuine threat to me. I'm very sorry that happened to you, sir, but I promise I'm taking you seriously. Is your ex-girlfriend still out there? Yes. Describe her car. It's a beat-up old truck with white spots of rust. I don't know the exact make or model. I'm not much of a car guy. I see. She's waiting for me. If I don't come out and face her myself, she'll come into the apartment building. Uh Uh-huh. She might try and break into the apartment itself! Tell me your address, sir. Alright, sir, the police are on their way. You told me that your girlfriend and sister are in the apartment with you, right? Yeah, just a second. Are they safe? Yes, they've gone into the bedroom. How old is your sister? She's only 16. She is 12 years younger than me. A complete surprise baby. My mom was 40 when she became pregnant with her. 
Shit, why am I even talking about all this? It's alright, sir. Shit! What's wrong? She got out of the car! She got out of the car! Stay calm, sir. <laughs> She's got a... Holy shit! Is that a fucking axe? The bitch has an axe! Sir, go into the bedroom with your girlfriend and sister. The police are on their way. Make them go faster, goddammit! Go into the bedroom, sir. Sir? We're all in the bedroom, ma'am. Good. Now, when the police get there... She got inside. Stay where you are, sir. What use is it? She'll get in anyway. You should be able to hear the police sirens now. I do! Good. Hang in there. The police arrived to find the caller's ex-girlfriend inside the apartment, attempting to break down the bedroom door with an axe. She had gotten into the residence by jimmying the lock, and when the cops tried to arrest her, she fought back viciously. It took three strong men to subdue the petite young woman and get her in handcuffs. The subsequent investigation revealed that the crazy bitch had a rope, duct tape, and a shovel in the trunk of her car. At her apartment was a collection of knives, homemade explosives, and enough firearms to stock a small army. She did not have any kind of permit to own such weapons, and it was unclear how she had gotten her hands on them. The caller was unharmed. So were his sister and girlfriend. I can't imagine how terrifying the experience must have been. What infuriates me is how the police initially treated the situation. The caller was obviously dealing with a dangerous and unstable individual, and they laughed it off like it was nothing. I guess stalking and abuse just aren't taken seriously if it's female on male. But this case is proof of how damaging that way of thinking really is. This man deserved protection from the law. Had the police not shown up when they did, he probably would have been killed. I'm not sure what happened to his ex, but I hope she's off the streets now. It's true what they say, you know. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Nine one one, what's your emergency? I need an ambulance, stat! What is the nature of your emergency, sir? It's my wife. What's wrong with your wife? She's bleeding a lot and she won't wake up. If she doesn't get help now, she'll die. Calm down, sir. I'm going to get your wife some help. But first, I need more information. What is your wife's name? Donna. Donna Henderson. How old is she? 57. And how did she get hurt? Uh, excuse me? You said she's bleeding a lot. What happened? Um, well... Sir? Well, ma'am, it's kind of my fault. What do you mean? I'm the one who hurt her. Shh, 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 hey, I, I know, I know. What was that noise? Is that your wife? Yes, it, it seems she's coming around. Donna? Honey? You with me? Your wife has regained consciousness? Yeah, but she's incoherent, doesn't seem to be aware of what's going on around her. And I still can't stop the bleeding, you have to send help! Sir, what is your address? It's... Alright sir, an ambulance is on its way. Now, I need you to tell me exactly what happened. Can you do that for me? Kind of a long story. I've got time. Listen, ma'am. I need you to understand that I did not intend to hurt my wife. Never. I love Donna. She's my soulmate. Besides, Billy told me that the procedure was perfectly safe. He tried it on his own wife last year, and her behavior has improved significantly. What are you talking about, sir? <laughs> um, <laughs> I gave my wife a lobotomy. Come again? I couldn't get my hands on a real or... or... Uh, the, the, the tool the doctors use, so I made do with an ice pick. 
I knocked Donna out with a combination of sleeping pills and vodka, tied her to the kitchen table, and went in through her nose. I dug her around for a while, and though I kept pulling out bits of tissue, none of it was brain matter. Plus, all the blood was getting in the way, so I decided I would have to do it the hard way. What do you mean by that, sir? Uh, I knew I would have to cut her head open to access her brain. So I moved her into the living room and gave her another dose of sleeping pills. I figured it would be easier to operate on her while she was sitting up, you know? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, shh, shh, it's okay. I shaved her head. I knew she wouldn't be too happy about it, but hair grows back. Besides, it was graying and lost its luster, so it wasn't as if she had much to lose. I see. I used a hacksaw. It cut through the skin with ease, but once I hit bone, I began to struggle. The stupid hacksaw wasn't sharp enough to cut bone. At that point, Donna began to wake up. I guess I didn't wait for the pills to take effect. She began to scream, so I I knew I had to stop. I set aside the hacksaw, bandaged her up, figured I could finish the operation later. But then Donna passed out and she won't wake up and I can't stop the bleeding. Let me get this straight, sir. You tried to lobotomize your own wife? Jesus, you make it sound like I raped and murdered her in front of our grandkids. I told you I wasn't trying to hurt Donna. The procedure wasn't supposed to go horribly wrong. Shit, now I know I should have taken up Billy on his offer. Who's Billy? An old pal of mine. He's a dentist, so he knew what he was doing better than I did. He offered to lobotomize Donna for me, but I turned him down. Didn't trust him to take care of my wife properly. Got it in my head that I could do it all on my own. Well, I fucked up big time. Sir, why did you lobotomize your wife? She was too stubborn. Too willful. She was going to leave me. I, I had to do something. What? Look, I love Donna, but she can be a real fucking bitch at times. Acts like she's smarter than me and thinks that she can mouth off to me without any consequences whatsoever. I have tried many times to put her back in her place, but she never learns her lesson. I see. She found out that I've been sleeping with my young secretary and threatened to leave, to file for divorce. I tried explaining that I still loved her, that I only had sex with Barbara because she could satisfy me in ways that Barbara hasn't been able to in years. You see, when a woman gets old, the things that make her a woman in the first place cease to function. She becomes stale. Tell me, ma'am, are you married? That is irrelevant. Because, well, don't take this the wrong way, but your husband will probably start to lose interest once you've hit menopause. That's not... Uh, Hey, would you look at that? The ambulance finally arrived. Sure took its sweet time. Hey, what the fuck? Why is there a police car following it? You bitch! Did you snitch on me to the cops? God damn it! The caller, you'll be pleased to learn, was arrested immediately. Donna was taken to the hospital. By some miracle, she survived, but not without lasting damage. I don't know what her current status is, but if still alive, she would be quite old. I can't imagine what she went through. For the sake of my own sanity, I try not to think about it too much. As for Billy the dentist and his own wife, well, I wasn't able to find much information on either of them. I just hope that Billy, like the caller, also got what was coming to him. Fucking piece of shit. It disgusts and horrifies me that a man would do something so horrible to his own wife. First he cheats on her, then he tries to fucking lobotomize her when she does the right thing and walks away from him and his bullshit. Just, uh, no. That's just wrong and fucked up and gross on every level. Men, treat your women right. Girls, if a guy ever tries to treat you like dirt, kindly tell him to fuck off. Nine one one. what's your emergency? Something has been lurking around my property. I want it gone. So you've got a trespasser? Yes. Can you describe this person, sir? Person? Yes, can you tell me what they look like? Lady, I think you're mistaken. It isn't a person. Excuse me? It isn't a person. It's 
Um, well, well, whatever the fuck it is, I want it off my property, so can you please send the police? What is your address, sir? My place is kind of isolated, set back from the main road. Uh-huh. I'm watching it from my bedroom window. I've locked the door in case that thing gets inside the house. Good. Stay where you are, sir. Now, what makes you say this trespasser isn't a person? I'm not crazy. I didn't say you were, sir. I'm just trying to understand what the problem is here. I've got a fucking trespasser. It's not complicated. God damn it, what more do you need to know? Sir, I need you to calm down. Tell me more about this trespasser. How long has it been on your property? Two hours, maybe? No, no, three? Yeah, yep, it's been three hours. This isn't the first time it's shown up, though. Oh. It came by the other night. My girlfriend and I woke up to this god-awful screech. Then my dog started barking. He's a Great Dane and fucking huge, but he's a gentle giant. He doesn't bark unless something serious is happening. Whatever was out there, it had my dog freaked. Uh-huh. I ran downstairs and found my dog, his name is Hulk, and he was at the back door, barking his damn head off. His teeth were bared, hackles raised, he looked like he was ready to kill. I'd never seen him like that, and to be honest, it scared me. Uh Uh-huh. My girlfriend had followed me and was freaking out too, but I told her to take Hulk and go back upstairs. Then I grabbed my hunting rifle and stepped outside, yelling at whoever it was to show themselves. What happened next? I heard another screech coming from behind me, like right behind me. I spun around, but all I saw was this dark silhouette disappearing into the woods. It was humanoid, but I knew it couldn't be a person because no person I've ever seen has had a neck that long or or limbs so out of proportion with its body. It was like, like over six feet tall, but its legs were tiny. It was fucking weird. Uh Uh-huh. I didn't know what to do, so I went back inside. I told my girlfriend it was just some neighborhood kid fucking around since she was already scared and I didn't want to make it worse. Neither of us could go back to sleep and Hulk spent the next hour or so pacing and growling. It It was insane. Did you call the police that time? No, there was no evidence that anything had happened, and I knew that if I told the police what that thing looked like, they would just blow me off. I see. I tried to forget about it, to pretend it hadn't happened. I would convinced myself that the thing wouldn't come back, so I shouldn't waste any more time and energy freaking out over it. But then I kept finding footprints in the backyard. And then that thing killed my neighbor's cat and tried to maul her teenage son when he was walking home from school. Uh Uh-huh. And now it's back, and it's hanging around my front yard. The police are on their way, sir. Can you see this thing right now? Can you see it from the window? Yes. What is it doing? It's by the fence with its back to me, just staring into the woods. Almost like it's keeping an eye out for something. Hulk is with me, and he's growling up a storm. Whatever this motherfucker is, my dog is fucking scared of it, and so am I. It's not moving, sir? No, it's not moving. Okay, that's good. Stay where you are, sir. This thing has already attacked my neighbor's kid. Probably would have killed the boy if he hadn't fought back. The cops better have their guns out. They'll handle it, sir. Just worry about yourself for now, alright? Alright. You're going to be okay, sir. I don't know about that. Stay on the line with me, sir. Oh, fuck, it moved! Moved? Yes, it It turned around. It's looking at me. It, it, it's... Shit, it's smiling! Smiling? Yes, at me. It doesn't seem to have eyes, though. Are you sure? Yes! Sir, stay calm. The police will be there soon. Promise? Promise. Hulk is freaking out. He just threw himself at the door like he's trying to break it down. Hulk, Hulk, buddy, buddy, chill. C- come here, B- boy. It's going to be okay. We're, we're going to be okay. I- isn't that right, ma'am? Yes, sir. The things move closer to the house. I, t- I hope it doesn't try to break in. Just hang in there, sir. 
The police are nearby. I, I can hear them. That's good, sir. Thank you, ma'am. The intruder ran into the woods when it saw and heard the police cruiser pull up. The cops gave chase, but lost sight of it. The caller gave a statement, and the police advised him to leave the area while they conducted an investigation. The young man packed a bag, grabbed his dog, and went straight to his girlfriend's house. An extensive search of the man's property and the woods surrounding his house turned up mutilated animal corpses, odd symbols carved into trees, and the chewed up skeletal remains of a human male, who to my knowledge has never been identified. Interviews with neighbours revealed further strange sightings of an odd humanoid creature, and there were also reports of strange noises, pets going missing, and an inexplicable intense smell, described by one woman as a combination of sulphur and mildew. The police left baffled, with more questions than answers. I did some digging and found more information on the man who made the call. I will not divulge his name here, but I learned that after a week or so he returned home. For about a month, everything was okay. Then one day the police were called back to his house. It wasn't he who had made the call this time though. It was his girlfriend. She had come over to find the door ripped off its hinges, the house in ruins, and her boyfriend gone. Blood was tracked all throughout the place, and his broken teeth and bits of skin were also found. The rest of his body was found stuffed inside a hollowed out log. His blood had been drained, and his internal organs had been removed. Two more people went missing, never to be found, before the violent intruder seemingly grew bored and left the area in peace. There were newspaper articles on this case, so I know it isn't bullshit, as outlandish as it may seem. Of course, certain details could be exaggerated for the sole purpose of selling more papers. God knows, the media loves to embellish and make events seem more bombastic than they really were. But that 911 call, I know Grandma Evelyn wouldn't have kept it had she not believed it was genuine. So what the fuck was that thing that terrorized a rural neighborhood back in 1985? Well, that isn't a question I can answer. I like to imagine it was just a flesh and blood human being behind the whole mess. A deranged and violent human being, of course, but it's better than the alternative, because part of me knows deep down that the young man who made the call really meant what he said. It isn't a person. Just let me warn you that the story behind this one is pretty gruesome. So, if you have a weak stomach, I suggest you skip this instalment. Anyway, here's the transcript. Nine one one, what's your emergency? I'm calling about a noise complaint. All right, can you give me the details? What? What was that? Sorry, I could barely hear you over all the racket. I can't hear anything, sir. You think I'm a liar? No, sir. <laughs> yeah, you do. First the landlord, now goddamn 911. Nobody gives a shit. Sir, I need you to calm down. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be such a jerk. I'm just so goddamn tired of that fucking asshole disrupting the peace. Who are you talking about? The little shit making all the noise, of course. It's so loud I can feel it in my back teeth. Sir, I honestly can't hear a thing. Well, it's driving me crazy. All right, sir. Can you describe the noise? It's music. Heavy metal, to be exact. Uh-huh. He's been playing it nonstop for three hours now. Uh-huh. He, he moved into my apartment building six months ago. He lives right above me and is always making noise. If it's not his music, it's either him pacing around in his giant work boots or having sex with his girlfriend. Have you ever tried talking to this neighbor? What about your landlord? Oh, believe me, I have. The landlord just told me to stop being such a curmudgeon. A little prick upstairs, he just laughed in my face. Uh-huh. I'm sure he makes all that noise on purpose just to annoy me. And I'm also sure his skank of a girlfriend is in on the whole thing. What makes you say that? Because she does nothing to stop it. She just laughs along with him and encourages all his bullshit. They're both assholes. Please send the police. What is your address, sir? 
All right, sir, the police are on their way. Good. Hopefully that will teach him. I thought for sure he would shape up after the trick I pulled last night. What are you talking about, sir? Ah, oh, shit. I guess I should have mentioned that before. Mentioned what, sir? Well, there was a bit of an altercation last night. An altercation with the man upstairs? Who else? Explain what happened. Well, he and his girlfriend were playing their stupid music, as usual. And they were having sex. Pretty rough sex, by the sound of it. Uh-huh. I felt like I was going insane. Like my brain was swelling up inside my skull and would soon leak out of my ears and nose. Which sounds ridiculous, but that was honestly how I felt. I see. I'm not usually an angry guy, and I'm not violent either. Never laid a hand on another human being in my life. But that night, something inside me just came undone. You know, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. Did you confront your neighbor, sir? Yeah, I did. But at first I went into my kitchen and I grabbed the biggest, sharpest knife I own. Don't get me wrong. I didn't intend to kill anybody. I just wanted to teach those two assholes a lesson. Sir, what did you do? Well, I, I went upstairs and began pounding on the door, yelling at them to open the fuck up. The kid finally answered and gave me this look that just sent me into a frenzy. It was a look that screamed, you're the lowest fucking life form on the planet, and I love making your life miserable. You get it? I found it irritating that some little shit kid looked down on me. Me, a grown man and a former soldier. I decided I need to teach that brat a lesson. It sounds like you were quite upset. Yeah, I was. Looking back, I know I seriously overreacted. But in the moment, I just got so overwhelmed with anger, you know? I understand, sir. Can you tell me what happened next? I slashed the kid with the knife. Got him in the face and the neck. He didn't cry out. Didn't make a sound. He just fell. Uh-huh. He was still moving, though. So I knew I hadn't killed him. But I wasn't done yet. I wasn't satisfied. So I went after his girlfriend. Uh-huh. She was cowering behind the couch, shaking like a leaf. Her eyes were huge. I, I don't think I've ever seen human eyes that huge before. She was terrified, but she didn't scream. It was weird. You'd think she'd be screaming bloody murder, but no. Did you do anything to the girl, sir? Did you attack her with the knife? Yes. Why? Because I had lost my fucking mind. I didn't want to hurt her, you know. She she may have been a stupid little tramp, but she didn't deserve what happened to her. I know that now. What did you do, sir? I went after her with a knife. That's when she began screaming. She ran, but I chased her down and dragged her back into the living room. I threw her on the couch and began slashing. I didn't want to kill her. I just wanted to teach the bitch a lesson. How many times did you slash her? Shit, I don't know. At least a hundred times, if I had to guess. I stopped when I realized how badly she was bleeding. At that point, the fight just went out of me, so I threw the knife aside and left. You just left? Yeah. All right. I, I guess I should have, you know, called an ambulance for them or something, but... But I figured they would be okay. I mean, while I was in the army, I saw men get turned inside out, reduced to hamburger meat, and, and live to tell the tale. I, I figured the kids would survive and never fuck with me again. I see. Now he's playing his damn music again. The police are on their way, sir. I want you to stay inside your apartment, all right? Yeah, okay. Good. Now when they get there... The man who made the call was a former sniper in the military who had returned from his final tour with a serious case of PTSD. This led, among other things, to severe misophonia. The noise from upstairs would have been easily ignored by most people, but to him it was unbearable. One night, he just snapped. Apparently, no one else in the apartment heard anything unusual, and the horrific scene was only discovered when the killer himself made the noise complaint. The caller was delusional and didn't seem to grasp the reality of what he'd done. He kept insisting that he'd only wanted to scare the couple, then denied ever confronting them at all. He eventually committed suicide in prison while awaiting trial, though I couldn't find out how he did it. As for the music he'd called 911 to complain about, well, it was still playing because there was no one in the apartment to turn it off. The caller heard it, 
thought his neighbors were fucking with him again and more or less confessed a double homicide to my grandmother. I feel terrible for the victims, obviously, but I can't help but feel bad for the caller as well. What he did was beyond terrible, but it's clear he was just very sick and in an awful mental state. If he had just gotten the help he so desperately needed, maybe none of this would ever have happened. I have a cousin in the military, and I sincerely hope he doesn't end up like that maniac. Nine one one, what's your emergency? My brother is missing. I need help finding him. Your brother's missing? Yes, I need help finding him. How old is your brother? Twenty-four. He's younger than me by five years. So he isn't a minor? No, he isn't. Does that mean you won't look for him? Do I have to wait, like, twenty-four hours? No, sir, we take all our calls seriously. I just need more information so I can figure out what we're dealing with here. Fine. When did you last see your brother? Well, I haven't seen him in person in nearly a week. But I spoke to him on the phone last night and I could tell he was upset about something. But he wouldn't tell me. I see. So this morning I went over to his apartment to check on him. He wasn't there, but every reflective service in the place had been smashed. What do you mean? The bathroom mirror, all the windows, the TV screen, all of them were shattered. There was broken glass everywhere. Uh Uh-huh. I have cut myself trying to clean it all up, blood all over the damn place. I'll probably have to get stitches, but first I need to find my brother. Did you search the whole apartment? Yes. And did you find anything else suspicious? Anything that might indicate where your brother could have gone? No. Nothing else was broken? No. And there were no signs of forced entry? No, the the door was unlocked when I got here, but Robert had left his keys and wallet behind. Robert? Is that your brother's name? Yes, Robert Whitaker. I see. Are you calling from his residence? Yes, I decided to wait here just in case he came back. Do you believe he may have left of his own volition? Perhaps leaving his keys behind for some reason? I don't know. But I'm pretty sure it was Robert himself who smashed all the reflective surfaces. Why do you say that? Well, Robert's always been a bit crazy. How so? Well, among other things, he has this weird phobia, I I guess, of looking at his own reflection. Been like that ever since we were kids. Uh Uh-huh. It's not his reflection itself that scares Robert so much, though. It's the things he sees alongside his reflection that freak him out. What do you mean, sir? He claims to see demons in the faces of deceased relatives. Some of them he never even met, but he recognizes them. Uh Uh-huh. And ever since our dad was killed, Robert insists he can see the murderer's face next to his every time he looks at a reflective surface. Was your father murdered? Yes. About ten years ago now, he was stabbed to death with a carving knife 27 times to be exact. It, It was brutal. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Robert took it pretty hard. Well, we all did. But Robert especially. He and Dad had a special bond. Robert used to say that Dad was the only person who truly got him. Uh Uh-huh. The police never caught my father's killer, but Robert has been seeing him for years. He tells me the guy isn't really human, that he's actually some sort of demon with a red face and eyes like a lizard's. He's always bleeding from his mouth as if someone cut his tongue out. Uh Uh-huh. Robert believed that the monster would come for him one day. He was absolutely terrified of the thing. After he moved out, he began having terrible nightmares. The monster would appear before him and threaten to do all kinds of horrific things after it had succeeded in killing my brother. Uh Uh-huh. It told Robert it would rape our mother and choke her to death while forcing me to watch. Then it would skin me alive and drag my soul back down to hell with it. (sighs) Sir... Robert was scared to death. So was I. I should have seen this coming. I couldn't have written it off as my brother being delusional. Everything is going to be okay, sir. And now he's gone. My brother's gone. We're going to find him, sir. Give me the address and I'll send the police. Thank you, sir. I 
let this happen. I love Robert alone. This is all my fault. No, it isn't, sir. But it is. I promise, Mom. I promise, Dad, that I will always look out for Robert. I promise, Robert, I wouldn't let the monster get him. Sir, I need you to stay calm. I know. I'm sorry. I just... I couldn't take it if something happened to Robert. He's my baby brother and I love him. I'm sure you do, sir. Will the police be able to find him? They will do their best to help you, sir. I don't need help. Robert does. So they will help him too. I don't want him to end up like our father. Sir, don't think like that. It won't help you any, and it certainly won't help your brother. I'm sorry. You have nothing to apologize for, sir. I hear them. I hear the police coming. They will be there momentarily, sir. I just hope they find Robert before it's too late. I hope so too, sir. Now when they- The police did find Robert, lying dead under a bridge on the other side of town. He had been stabbed multiple times, his body drained of blood. He had been dead since the previous night, and his killer was long gone, having left no clues. The case is still open as far as I know. After Robert's death, his brother spent some time in a psychiatric hospital. One night, he apparently broke out of his restraints, broke a window, and tried to slash his wrists on a shard of broken glass. A nurse came and stopped him before he could do any fatal damage. I know he was eventually released, but I could find no information on where he is now or if he is even still alive. Robert's murder is actually somewhat well known around these parts, and people continue to speculate about it, even if they don't speak of it. After Robert's death, his mother was adamant that her son had committed suicide, and even tried to have the official report changed to that instead of murder. She was unsuccessful. It seemed she knew deep down that her son had met his end at the hands of another, but for whatever reason, didn't want to acknowledge it. It breaks my heart to know that while Robert's brother was speaking to my grandmother and pleading for help, Robert was already dead. I'm not sure whether to believe he truly saw all those things, or if he was simply delusional. But whatever the case, I can't get past the fact that Robert had been stabbed 27 times with a carving knife, just like his father. Nine one one. what's your emergency? I'd like to report a break-in. Has someone broken into your home? No, not my home, thank goodness. They broke broken into the house across the street. Are the home's occupants present? Excuse me? The people who live there, are they home? No, the house has been vacant for several months now. The owners are missing. Missing? An elderly couple used to live there. Mr. and Mrs. They simply up and left one night, and no one has seen them since. I'm pretty sure their daughter filed a police report. But as far as I know, the investigation has turned up nothing. Uh-huh. And now someone has broken into their home. Did you see this person enter the house, ma'am? No, but I can see them moving around the house, through the ground floor windows. And the door looks like it's been kicked in. Can you provide a description of this person? Not a very good one, I'm afraid. I'm pretty sure it's a woman, though. A woman with long, pale hair. What is she wearing? I can't be sure, but it looks like a hospital gown. Can you see this person now? No, I'm watching the house from my living room window, but I haven't seen her in a while. I'm pretty sure she's still there, though. You have to send the police! Stay calm, ma'am. What's the address? It's... All right, ma'am. The police are on their way. Meanwhile, I want you to stay on the line with me and keep an eye on that house, all right? Of course. <gasps> What is it, ma'am? I see her! The woman! She's standing in one of the upstairs windows, and she's looking right at me! You're sure? Yes, I'm sure! Oh, God, what the hell is wrong with her face? She looks like a fucking corpse! I need you to stay calm, ma'am. Oh, my God! Is she still at the window? Yes! Tell me if she moves. I can't... I, I can't stand to look at her, but I can't turn away! Ma'am... Where the hell are the police? They're on their way, ma'am. They'll be there soon. Ah! She's gone. I think she... Wait, no, she's... Oh, God, no! What's happening? She left the house, and she's heading my way! Fuck! 
Are all your doors locked, ma'am? Yeah, yes, but she sees me. She's going to try and get inside. Ma'am, listen to me. You need to step away from the window and hide somewhere in your house. Somewhere you'll be safe until the police arrive. Okay. Where are you now, ma'am? My kitchen pantry. The door locks. That's good, ma'am. Just hang in there. The police are coming. I can't hear her banging on my front door anymore. Could that mean she's gone? I don't know, ma'am. Stay put, all right? The police! I can hear them coming! Thank you! You're welcome, ma'am. Thank God. Everything's gonna be okay. <sighs> hey, what's that? After reading the transcript, I did a little digging and was able to come up with some information regarding the call. When the police arrived, they found the mysterious woman lying in the hall, unconscious. She had cut herself breaking through a window and lost a lot of blood. The woman who made the call was still locked in her pantry, cordless phone in hand. She was shaken, but unharmed. The suspect was identified as a local woman with a history of mental illness. She had recently been admitted to the psych ward after setting her own head on fire but escaped, managing to evade law enforcement for three days. She was taken back to the hospital, but died of complications from her injuries. As for the missing elderly couple, well, it turns out that, a year after they vanished, their skeletal remains were discovered miles away in the woods, buried in a makeshift grave. Both had their hands tied behind their backs and had been shot execution-style in the head. Police were unable to link their murder to the woman who had broken into their abandoned home. The case remains open to this very day. I found myself at home one week at night. My parents went out of town, and I was returning from a canceled sleepover at my friend's house. The lights were on when I got to the door, and I remember getting a phone call from that same friend shortly thereafter, which would end up being the last normal event of that night. My brother was playing video games in the next room, and I could hear him tapping furiously at the video game while I spoke on the cordless phone. I walked around in the living room and ended the phone call in the kitchen when I remember hearing some sort of high-pitched squeal that came from the house somewhere. I couldn't place where it came from as it sounded the same in every room I went to investigate. It ended about a minute after it started and was interrupted by the phone ringing. But the phone wasn't in the kitchen where I left it. It was in the bathroom on the counter, in front of the sink. I answered the phone and there was no one there, so I hung up. It was at that point I heard a dragging sound. Like a large heavy object was being dragged in the attic crawl space above me. I followed the sound as it slowly navigated from room to room and ended up in my parents' bedroom, who at the time still had a water bed. After the sound made it to the far wall, it stopped and the phone rang again and this time it was my friend on the other line. I told him what was going on and he told me to be careful and call the police. After I got off the phone I laid down on the waterbed. I then heard a knock on the door and answered it quickly but no one was there. It was at this point I called my brother from his room to check something out. I stormed into his room and there's nobody there. His bed was made and his room spotless. Neither the console nor the TV was on, and the controller was wrapped and unplugged. There's no way he could have hid and cleaned his room in those few seconds it took me to make it to his door of his room. I had been alone the entire night, hearing for 20 minutes straight my brother playing his game that he was not present to be playing. The phone rang again, but again, it was not where I left it. This time it was resting on the kitchen counter, where I originally left it. So I walked through the entire house to answer it. It was my friend calling again, this time saying that the call was dropped for some reason and he was trying to call me back. I explained to him what just happened and I heard another knock on the door. Since I was standing right next to it, I peeked through the window within two seconds of the knocks and there was nobody there. At this point I opened the door and stepped out to the porch to make sure I didn't see anyone running away as I had a large wide open yard and there's nothing to hide behind. I walked into the front yard and looked around but couldn't find anything. I found myself engaged in several more minutes of talking to my friend before I got off the line. 
and it was at that moment where I realized that the place I had been staring at while I was talking were two very large black reflective eyes looking back at me. The figure was tall and lanky and stood about 10 feet or so from me. The most notable feature he wore was an inhumanly large smile and he was grinning with oily mechanical teeth from literally ear to ear. (laughs) Despite me staring directly at him for more than five minutes, I pretended that I didn't notice him and through willpower alone, made it back inside the house without running as fast as I could. Instead, I walked calmly. I remember feeling like if I ran, he would chase me and somehow knew that he would have caught me easily. I barricaded myself in my room for the rest of the night, but did not fall asleep. The sun came up the next morning and my parents were home. Nothing like that ever happened before, and nothing like that has ever happened since. The first time I came face to face with this strange man was about seven years ago. It was a normal summer day. My mother was struggling to make ends meet, and we lived in a really crappy two-bedroom house. It was my mother, her boyfriend, my two younger brothers, and myself. My mom worked nights, and so did her boyfriend, so it was up to me to watch my two brothers in the evening. It was just like any other normal summer day at first. My friends and I hung out during the day, walked around our small town, and enjoyed the warm weather. Now, for it being a small town, there's still plenty to do. Walk through the woods, go to the park, all of the typical kids things. We decided to waste time at the park until I had to go home and watch my brothers. It was normal boring stuff. We walked around, played with a basketball that someone left behind sat on the swings and talked about our lives and what we were going to do when we got older. It was nearing 3 p.m. when I noticed a guy sitting on the bench over by the basketball court. Now, it was nearing the time for me to go home anyways, and as the man was giving me and my friend both an odd vibe, we decided to leave. As we neared Main Street, which my house also happened to be on, we parted ways. I got home and my mother lets me know that there's leftovers for the boys and myself and then she's on her way to work. We spend most of the days indoors watching TV or playing video games. Around 7.30 my brothers wanted to go outside to ride their bikes. It's just now getting dark so I agree. They ride their bikes for a half hour. I'm sitting on the curb looking at my phone texting my friend about how bored I am when my youngest brother, who must have been around seven at the time, comes up to me and points over towards our house. I look just in time to see what looked like a man walk inside. I immediately tell my brothers not to worry and continue riding their bikes as I call my mother letting her know what just happened. She calls the police and they show up within five minutes, seeing that the police station is only a few blocks away. They do a full search of the home but find nothing. They speak to my mother on the phone and tell her there's nothing there and it must have just been our imaginations. Tentatively, my brothers and I go back into the house. So I sit them down and turn on the TV. Time flies and I look up and it's already 9.30 and I really got to get them to bed soon. I head upstairs to go into our closet. All three of us share one bedroom, so all of our clothes are in one closet. I turn the closet light on and start digging through a pile of clothes on the floor that we never got around to putting away. I hear a noise that sounds like a deep breath. Thinking it was just my imagination, I continue to pull out pajamas for my brothers. I grab their PJs and go to pull the string to turn off the lights. Out of the corner of my eye, I see movement. I look over and see a face peering out of the large pile of clothes. There's a man hiding under our clothes in the closet. He made a sudden movement, and I booked it. I take off running. I can hear him struggling to get out of the clothes, and I didn't stop running. Down the hallway, down the stairs, knocking anything over in the process, in hopes of slowing him down. I burst into the living room and grab my brother's arms, practically pulling them out of the sockets in an attempt to drag them out of the house. We were outside and three blocks away before I quit dragging them behind me. I reached for my phone to call the police, but it's not in my pocket. I must have left it on the couch. So we hoofed it. I drag my brothers behind me in the middle of the night. They are tired and they don't know what happened and I won't tell them. They didn't need to know. They would never want to go into that closet ever again. I get to the police station and they call our mother. Then they drive us home and she leaves work early. 
They do another full search, but once again find nothing but the mess I made in my attempt to leave. No evidence. Nothing. They basically told me to stop wasting their time, and they left. My mother said she believed me, but of course I knew it was just something she would say to console me. She says I could stay the night at a friend's if I can get a hold of someone, just to make me feel better. We all go inside, and my mom sends my brothers to get cleaned up for bed. I walk over to the couch where I left my phone. It wasn't there though. It was on the floor smashed to pieces. It was very obvious that it was smashed by a hammer, seeing as the hammer was sitting right next to it. I call my mother over and show her the mess of my phone on the ground. She walks over to the storage cabinet and pulls down the toolbox we have. She opens it and our hammer is still inside. I didn't realize what that meant at the time, but now that I think about it, that man was in our home, in my closet, in my room, with a hammer, just waiting and hoping for me and my brothers to fall asleep. Let's not meet again, please. This happened in early 2017. I was a 23-year-old girl and had just finished college. The field I studied was not huge in my area, so I decided to leave. I moved to the biggest city in our country to make a post-graduation course and look for a job. As I was still unemployed, I decided I would wait to make a long-term rental contract, worrying about a possible bad commute to work. In the first couple of months, I was switching from Airbnbs and hostels all the time. I was already tired of this. I decided this would be my last move and then, with or without a job, I would settle. I was running out of money and decided to stay in a dorm in a hostel next to where I was taking classes. Sharing a bedroom is not a problem to me during a trip, but when you're living somewhere, trying to create a routine, sharing a bathroom with some complete strangers just sucks. I would share the dorm with three guys, but it's not with any of them that my bad encounter occurs. They were nice, apart from one of them snoring so bad at night. No biggie. In another dorm, although, was the creepiest person I've ever seen. He was in his mid-thirties, and he was not traveling. He was native from the city where we were in, and was using the hostel as a new house since his parents kicked him out of theirs. <laughs> he introduced himself and tried to be nice and flirty with me. I was polite initially, but declined his advances. He wouldn't stop. He started following me all day long in the hostel. Anywhere I went, he would show up in less than five minutes. On the second day there, I left the hostel to a job interview, and by the time I arrived back to the hostel, late at night, he was seated alone on the front stairs, waiting for me. He told me this like it was the most natural thing on earth. He would buy me snacks, ask me out, try to get information about my personal life. All these things, when I already made it clear of my lack of interest in this friendship. All this happened in three days. I was exhausted of his presence, but what I didn't know is that it could have went worse. As soon as one of the guys that was sharing the dorm with me left, he asked the hostel staff to switch dorms so he could stay in the same one as me. Obviously, he didn't tell me this, so imagine how surprised and disgusted I was when I saw him coming into the dorm with all his belongings. I was so scared of his presence that I slept wearing jeans to avoid any sort of advantage that he could take while I was sleeping. The very next morning I decided to leave. The situation had got worse and I couldn't handle it anymore. While I was packing the guy showed up, noticed what I was doing and started to cry, asking me not to leave him. Then to make things even more creepy and disgusting, he told me that he would miss seeing my face while I was sleeping and thank god that he had taken photos. I was trying my best to stay calm but I lost it when he told me he had taken pictures of me while I was sleeping. I took his phone out of his hand and asked him to see the pictures and deleted all of them. There were a bunch of photos of me sleeping in the night before. I left the hostel and I really regret not reporting him to the staff. Crazy lonely dude in the hostel, please, let's never meet again. Let me start off by saying I know how terribly dumb and naive I was for letting myself get into this situation. Hell. Sometimes I even laugh at how preposterous this whole thing was, and you can too. It is kind of funny at parts. However, at the same time, I knew if I had been just a little dumber, I might have not been so lucky. And no, 
I do not have a foot fetish myself. It all started a couple of years ago. I was a sophomore in high school, 15 or 16 at the time, and I was hanging out with an extremely toxic and emotionally manipulative acquaintance, Holly, who, let's just say, wasn't shy about getting money from lucrative ways. Such ways included scamming older men for their money from fake dating profiles she made of other girls in our grade she didn't like, stealing from her parents, and bumming off money and things from her other friends. She had been doing this for years, same age as Carter and I, and was a minor at the time. Sure, we could have been considered friends, but I was much closer to my best friend Carter. Carter had been best friends with Holly since freshman year, and honestly, the only reason I hung out with her was because Carter insisted on inviting her to her hangouts every time. Holly was not a good person, and I quietly put up with her antics. One day, she starts talking about her friend Sarah. Awesome, but honestly, I really didn't care, especially knowing Carter and her ditched me for her. I wasn't really paying attention to the story until Holly asked me if I wanted to sell my socks for money. What the fuck? She smiles and proceeds to tell me how they found a super senior, kid you not, who bought knee-high socks for $90. All Sarah did was have to wear them outside for an entire day. Yeah, the freak liked them sweaty, I guess. The only thing was, the super senior insisted on meeting in person only. Holly laughed, telling me it was a little weird. Okay, red flag number one. Holly never really thought things were weird unless they were really fucking weird. Then... She proceeds to tell me that this super senior, honestly, I never got his name, so I'll just call him Kyle, was trying to get her in his house the entire time, but finally gave up, and they left. You're probably thinking, what the hell? Who would be dumb enough to try and wrangle money from this freak? Me. I'm an idiot. All I really heard was $90 for a pair of old worn socks. I was in. Being the amazing friends they were, Holly and Carter just laughed and informed me that I would have to do it on my own, since they had better things to do, whatever that meant. They gave me his Instagram handle and wished me luck. Well, we had a problem right off the bat. You see, I had totaled my car just around a month before and I had no vehicle of my own. American and small town, so it was hard to get around without a car. Well, being the dumbass that I was, and still am, I decided, hey... Let's just take my mom's car. Huge mistake. So I start messaging this Kyle on Instagram, explaining my situation and how I got in contact with him. I can't remember most of the conversation, but I can remember the guy being really insistent on meeting at his apartment complex. Red flag number two. Although I am very stupid and naive at times, I had at least had common sense. I brushed it off and suggested other local areas, Starbucks parking lot, local park, etc., but this guy wasn't backing down. Finally, after much convincing, I get Kyle to agree to meet in a nearby park, right by his house. Red flag number three. So I convince my mom to allow me to drive her car, and I meet up with Kyle at the park. It's mostly deserted, but it's a busy street, so I don't feel too uncomfortable. That's when I met Kyle. He was a huge, fat, sweaty guy with a beard that reeked to high hell. Think neck beard. The guy was at least 19, but looked like he could be pushing mid-twenties. That's when I knew I had made a mistake, but there was no way I was going to say no to $90. I awkwardly greeted him and formal pleasantries were exchanged. I didn't remember much of the weird-ass conversation other than a couple of highlights. Number one, the dude brought fucking rope. Turns out he was into bounding feet as well, and I was super creeped out. Dude... Then starts to tie my feet together after I mumbled a weak agreement. All I remember is staring at the sun, wishing I could die right there and then. Number two, this guy had the gall to call my feet ugly while rubbing and massaging them. That kind of hurt, not gonna lie. Number three, dude was insistent, almost straight up begging on showing me his knife collection back at home, and he would pay me extra to come with him. Yeah, no. Wasn't gonna happen. I knew what that meant and my virgin ass wanted no part in that. Highlights continued. Number four. Dude straight up sniffed my socks after I gave them to him. No shame whatsoever. Told me he liked the vinegar smell. 
Yeah, turns out the socks used to belong to my deceased grandfather. I just grabbed a random knee-high pair from my sock drawer. Number 5. After refusing Kyle multiple times to come back to his house, he only gave me one-third of the price we agreed on since I refused to come home with him. Whatever. I was disgusted and disturbed a high hell anyways and wanted to get the fuck out of there. After returning home and getting my ass chewed out by my mom, I told her the truth after she asked me why I took her car, and I promptly blocked the guy and called my friends to tell them about the experience. Much to my surprise, Holly informed me about something she forgot to tell me about. Apparently, the guy had made several threats of shooting up his high school's graduation and very well known to the local police. Although I thought this was over and done with my junior year of high school, I received threatening and grotesque phone calls in which I reported to the police. Carter and Holly were also called and threatened. While mine was more of a sexual nature, theirs involved being called extremely specific slurs. Holly was black and Carter was gay. And he even recited Holly's address. Although I never found out who did them, and there was a good chance Holly could have orchestrated the whole thing herself. I can't help but wonder if Kyle was behind them. So to the foot fetish guy who tried to get a miner to come back to his apartment and look at his knife collection, let's not meet ever again. Like several other posts on this sub, this happened to me when I was a kid. Tend to be exact. I grew up in a military family and lived in the Middle East for a significant portion of my life. Because of this, we frequently traveled to different countries because of the low cost and proximity. On this particular vacation, we flew into Cairo, Egypt, the kidnapping capital of the world at that point in time, for a long weekend. We only lived like two to three hours away. It was late at night and we were staying at the Marriott Hotel, which had a taxi or shuttle service that was supposed to pick us up. For some reason, our driver never showed, so we were forced to find a regular taxi to take us there which took forever to find that late at night. We finally found one that was offering us a pretty good deal. They don't run by meters. Instead, they just give flat rates that they choose and headed towards the hotel. Out of nowhere, another taxi basically T-bones us in the middle of the road, causing us to stop. There aren't really defined roads in a lot of Arab places, so it isn't really that surprising that we got hit. In Arab nature, the two drivers get out of their cars, each yelling that it was the other's fault and looking like they were going to throw hands. Eventually, they got back into their respective taxis and parted ways. My family and I were completely taken aback. We had been in Egypt less than two hours and have already had quite the adventure. We finally get to the hotel, exhausted as it must have been 3 a.m. at this point. Our driver helped us get all of our bags out and get settled, and told us that he felt so bad about the car accident that he offered to pick us up the next morning and take us to the Great Pyramids, which was on our agenda, for a super cheap rate. My parents agreed and decided on a time for him to come, though I can't remember when. Flash forward to the next morning, everyone was ready for the day, excited to see how crazy it was going to be. Our driver was outside waiting for us, leaning against the car like someone in an old movie, right when he said he'd be there. I'm a blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl that had a deep tan at the time. And being in Egypt, that was a rare sight. When the driver saw me in the daylight, he gave me the creepiest, most unsettling look that sent chills down my spine, even as a 10-year-old. I knew something wasn't right with him. Nonetheless, we got in his taxi and headed towards the pyramids. He continued to try and talk to me and joke around with me the whole ride, something I found to be extremely creepy and bold since both my parents were in the car. We get super close and there is an entrance that people can go through and walk the long distance to the pyramid. And there is an entrance that taxis can go through. You have to pay to see them. Strange but true. Our driver keeps making jokes about my blonde hair and blue eyes and bringing up that he could get me into the pyramids for free so my parents wouldn't have to pay the extra ticket price. We laughed it off and my parents paid him, said thank you, and began to exit the taxi. I don't remember how it happened, but at some point after I got out of the car, he did too and directed me towards his trunk. I was confused and thought we had forgotten something, so I stayed behind as my parents walked towards the gate to get whatever I thought we had left. The driver pops a trunk 
but there wasn't anything in it. He grabbed my arm and put a hand on my back, trying to push me into the trunk, and I said, I'm getting you in for free, over and over again as I resisted. Naturally, I freaked out and screamed out to my mom and dad at the top of my lungs, terrified. When they heard me and noticed I wasn't behind them, they started sprinting back to the car. When the driver heard me scream, he immediately let go of me, closed the trunk, and drove away just as my parents started to run to me. I was crying my eyes out, terrified out of my mind knowing that an Arab taxi driver tried to put me in his trunk and drive away the second I screamed for help. It's scary to think what could have happened to me. Had he been stronger, or more prepared, or faster? He is the reason I am still terrified of taxis, Ubers, Lyfts, and any car service of that nature. So, Egyptian <laughs> taxi driver, let's never meet again. I was living in Abu Dhabi when this happened, and I was 17 years old at the time. I've had a number of experiences from taxi drivers out there that could fit on the sub, but this one was by far the worst and creepiest, and I'd like to share it with you all. It was Boxing Day 2012, and I was going to my friend's house for his Boxing Day party. He lived in a compound that was a bit of a drive off the island itself, and although not rural suburbs by most standards, this area could be classed as such. These residential suburbs were also still mostly in development. Every block had a new building site, plenty of empty shells of houses, no security cameras at the time, etc. There were no pavements either, just rubble and sand patches split by tarmac roads. Now, taxis in the UAE are crazy common. You just put your hand out and one pulls up. And back then, there was less security. There were no cameras or mics in the car, just the meter. I hailed the cab and sat in the front as a result of a past experience I had, and we set on our way. Things start normally. We talked as I normally would getting into a cab. How long have you lived here? Do you enjoy the place? Etc. Eventually, we're on the highway, and after we cross the water to the mainland, he pulls over on the hard shoulder, and without saying a word to me, pulls out his phone and calls someone. He's speaking his native tongue, and he's of South Asian descent, so I have no clue what he's saying but I ask him politely to continue driving as the meter is still on. He nods, hangs up, and gets going again. This happens a second time, again, without word or warning, and now I'm suspicious. This time, I ask him again to keep going, but he ignores me and keeps talking on the phone. We're on the highway, so I can't get out for fear of going splat, not being able to hail a cab or being jacked for jaywalking. After a few minutes, he gets going again and we pull off the highway, still heading in the direction I needed to be. We reach the first roundabout where we need to make a right turn, but he goes straight over. Everyone knows where this compound is. It's the biggest one in the city, and as a cab driver, there's no chance he doesn't know how to get there. So now, I'm even more suspicious, and I kind of have a feeling of trepidation, like I know this vibe and what might be happening. I ask him to turn around at the next roundabout, but he ignores me. Now, I'm getting agitated and angry, and I ask him to just stop the car and I'll get out and walk. Nope. He literally just ignored me and kept focusing on the road. At this point, I'm shouting at him, numerous expletives, etc., and it's clear that he's got something else planned. Eventually, he pulls off the main road onto a dirt track that led a couple of hundred yards into a massive building site, and he keeps driving down it. He then turns to me and tells me to get into the back seat and repeats this in an increasingly forceful manner to the point where we're shouting at each other. At the end of the dirt track is an old little minibus with roughly five dudes standing next to it. I don't notice this immediately. All I care about is that the car is stopped and I'm in the front so I can get out. I'm not locked in. Inexplicably, I threw some money at him and jumped out of the car with my bag and started walking away jogging back down the track. I can only imagine that the earlier phone calls he made were to these minibus men, as when I started getting away, they jump in the minibus and drove down to catch me as the taxi turns around and does the same. They all pull up in front of me like police do in the movies when they stop a bank robber and jump out. The taxi driver runs right up to me, grabs me, and screams point blank at my face to get in the bus. I can still smell and feel the damp heat from his breath as it touched my face and the little bits of his spit hitting my cheeks. This honestly just enraged me, so I grabbed him by the throat and pushed him against his car. 
I scream something back at him, I can't remember what, and let go. They all get their phones out and start calling and messaging and moving towards me. So I just got out of there as fast as I could, ran all the way down and back onto the main road and went to my mates on foot. I know I should have taken the number plate, ID number, etc., called the police even when I was in the cab, let alone after it happened. However, I was a 17 year old with a bottle of Jack Daniels in my bag on the way to a party with all my mates drinking in a Muslim country with a drinking age of 21. The paranoia of the trouble from that was enough to keep it quiet from the authorities. Although, I did tell every family member and friend. So yeah, if I could never meet you and your little minibus posse again, that would be great. This summer, I decided to pick up some graveyard shifts at my current full-time job, simply because it pays more and I am a university student, drowning in student debt. About two weeks ago, on the rare occasion that I get to sleep during the time the sun is down, at 3.30 to 4 a.m., I was suddenly awoken by a loud sound. Me, being half asleep, I honestly didn't know what the sound exactly was, so I just chopped it up to being one of my neighbors dropping something. Because I live in an apartment with very thin walls, so I just try going back to sleep. About 10 minutes of laying there with my eyes closed, I heard the sound again, but this time... I'm pretty much awake, so I recognize what the sound is immediately. Someone was kicking on my window. For context, I'm a single female living alone and in a basement suite, so my windows are basically level with the sidewalk. Anyways, obviously I'm freaked out. I don't know what the heck to do. I don't want to move and make any loud noises. So they don't know I am home, and I'm just frozen laying in this bed. Then I hear the knocking again. I instantly bolt up as my fight or flight kicks in, and I run for the front door, which has my keys with the pepper spray on it. The keys clink together and make a noticeable noise, and the knocking starts to get more intense and loud. This is when I realize the window with the screen by my bed is almost all the way open, because my cat likes to sit on the edge, and I forgot to close and lock it. I start to freak out already, having major anxiety. I start looking for my phone just in case I need to call the police. Me being fucking clumsy and shaking from anxiety, I drop the phone on the ground and whoever is at my window proceeds to what sounds like slide either her fingernails or a sharp object down the screen. I realize this person's intentions are either to come in or scare me. So like a fucking idiot and not thinking, I run to the window as fast as I can and slam it shut and lock it while avoiding looking outside at whoever it was. The knocking stops, and I wait about 30 minutes without hearing any knocking. I lay back down and go right back to sleep. The next morning, I honestly couldn't believe that ever happened to me. I start to think maybe it was a dream. So I go outside and investigate. So I see an empty beer bottle and my ripped blanket. I text my only friend that knows where I live and ask them if they were fucking with me. They say no, which I figured because they don't drive and live quite far away, and the buses around my house stopped running well before 3 a.m. So I called my landlord and told him what happened, and he says to ignore it, and this happened before, which is fucking creepy. Anyways, I obviously recognize now I should have done a lot of things differently and called the police right away. It hasn't happened since. Nonetheless, still super terrifying, but I can't afford to move again, so creepy bro knocking on my window. Let's not meet again. My sister is missing and has been for a month and a half. No one believes me, but I know my sister better than anyone else. Natalia would always crack a joke about how, if she would go missing, no one would ever know. It pertains to how she never calls or texts daily. She lets you know about random mundane events weekly instead, bi-weekly if you aren't in her close social circle. It sounds like a dark joke to make, but Natalia always listens to true crime. She always told me that people always notice when their loved one is missing within hours or overnight. Natalia has never been much of a communicator, texter, caller. She doesn't like superficial conversations, so she only messages when she has something to say. When the conversation has run its course, you won't hear from her unless she has something else pressing on her mind. She's always said no one would know if she's gone missing. She would simply be gone and those first 48 hours would slip through everyone's fingers because of her lack of communication. It used to be funny, but now it came true.
I thought people would notice that Natalia's texts didn't quite sound like Natalia. Or maybe they'd noticed instead of all lowercase she suddenly started using proper capitalization. Or they'd notice that she wouldn't use our nicknames. Natalia talks to me the most. So maybe it makes sense that I'm the only one who notices the minor details. I tried showing my mom, but she'd only reply in a bitter tone about how Natalia doesn't talk to her consistently. Offhandedly, I remind her she doesn't reply consistently to anyone, leading my mom to reply about how she's her mother so she should talk to her every day and abruptly hang up. I tried my dad next. Natalia has always liked my dad more than my mom, but she liked him more because he respects her space. He respects that she's busy, and she respects that he's busy. Even with a new wife and kids, he never treated us differently, so I had higher hopes that he'd understand. He didn't. He told me that my mum must have gotten into my head, but when I showed him the conversation, he said it was a little odd that she was texting out of character, but a text is still a text. So, it's only me who notices. I've been thinking about my first move of asking my mum and dad for their input. They live in different states than us. Natalia lives an hour away from me. What would they do from where they are? I drove the hour out to her apartment in a cute area of our city. Natalia gave me a spare key so I could easily enter without trespassing in the event she didn't answer the door. I hated sounding so negative during that drive, but if I believed she went missing, I needed to be prepared to do a wellness check. I know you might think, isn't that what the police are for? The police told me she may run away if she wants, and she's still answering text messages. They ignored the stark difference. They ignored everything I had to say. I'm stuck doing everything on my own. Getting to her apartment is nerve-wracking. Hands sweaty, constantly rubbing my palms against my jeans. I felt lightheaded. I remember feeling as if I was going to faint, if I saw something unsightly. I felt my heart thudding in my brain, loud and echoing through my ears as shallow breaths left my mouth. Hand shaking as I turned the key, and with one last thick swallow, I opened the apartment door. It's hot inside the apartment. Natalia kept her air conditioning off during the day to save money for her bill, but it's never been hot enough to rival the temperature outside. I knew she hasn't been here in a while, but all of her belongings are still in the apartment. As I walked in, I noticed her phone charger plugged in by the blender on her kitchen counter. The fruit started to ruin in the bowl she kept on the bar. Dishes left in the sink's rack, and I noticed she had events written on her calendar that she marked as things she would RSVP to. I knew Natalia didn't run away. She had plans for the future she was going to. Everything else is seemingly untouched, clean, with a small layer of dust against the surfaces. I walked further into the apartment, into her bedroom. All of her clothes were still there. If an outfit was missing, I didn't know which one. But nothing was empty enough to say she packed and ran off. Even her luggage was still there, in her closet, empty. Her social security card and passport are in her nightstand drawer, just on top of her birth certificate. I called the police, and finally, I could fill out a report. I guess seeing no sign of a runaway besides a purse and car being gone is sufficient evidence to at least look into the case. They relieved me as the police questioned me formally. I showed them all the evidence and explained her daily schedule so I can explain why her purse and car are gone. They seemed to take me seriously, and I thought I could start plastering her face all over the city in flyers or even talk to local media. But again, I was proven wrong. Social media isn't lying when they say the police are a joke. Natalia didn't lie either when she talked about her true crime cases. They promised to look into it, gave me a case number and a phone number to call back on. I didn't hear any updates for three days, so when I called and asked, they told me they hadn't even looked. Even though by this time, She's been missing for two weeks. Meanwhile, I'm still getting texts from the imposter holding Natalia's phone who uses proper capitalization and grammar. I check her apartment every day and watch the fruit ruin in the bowl. I searched our conversations for Natalia bitching about horrible police work. I remember she told me a family had to outsource someone or something else to help with their missing or murder cases. That's when I found a private investigator. My private investigator, Daniel Montgomery, proved to be way more useful than the police. Daniel started everywhere, leaving me to do the awareness work. The media wouldn't see me, however, since the police classified her as an adult runaway, even though there's enough circumstantial evidence to suggest otherwise. 
my mom and dad took the police's side, saying she ran away since they still get the weekly text messages that comprise small talk and wishing them well. Both of them forget Natalia doesn't do small talk. I put flyers up anywhere I could until Daniel got back to me a week later. Natalia works at a customer service call centre for a cell phone company. Her place of employment is nice enough to talk to Daniel. They were wondering when Natalia was coming back to work. They had called her for a week, but after her third no-call, no-show, they considered her unemployed. Her boss found it weird since Natalia has never been late, and when she was, she was pulled over on the side of the road with a cop checking her license and registration. She had a ticket to prove her whereabouts 30 minutes into her shift. Her boss told the PI that she completed her last shift three weeks ago. She clocked out at 8pm. The next morning, her car wasn't in the lot. The PI asked if calls at the call centre were recorded and fortunately, the company was quick in getting the permissions and extracted all the calls from Natalia's landline for Daniel to comb through. The calls weren't interesting. Her customer service voice made me cringe as Daniel showed me a few normal calls, but tears welled in my eyes. I hadn't heard her voice in three weeks. It felt nice to know that it was Natalia instead of the dry texts that go unanswered on my phone. Daniel paused before the last one he showed me, reminding me he was showing me what a normal call looked like versus the call he was about to show me. Thank you for calling Cellular X. All calls are monitored and recorded for training purposes. By staying on the line, you are consenting to be recorded. An agent will be with you shortly. Hello, I'm Natalia. Thank you for calling Cellular X. Can I get your account number to get started? 325-69874 Thank you. Give me a moment to load your account. Can you confirm your name for security purposes? Justin Ackerman. And the numbers on your address? 426. Thank you so much. How can I help you today? That's a brilliant question. How can you help me, Natalia? Um, well, I can absolve bill issues, change of address, service issues, or a poll down, logging issues such as report an error message or forgotten password, tracking a phone, ending an account, and more. Is there a specific reason you called? I called to speak to you. I kept getting other agents on the line, but finally, I got to you. I'm sorry, I I'm afraid I'm confused. If this call isn't to service your account on Cellular X, then unfortunately, I'm not able to help you. You never want to talk to me. You never reply. You never look my way, and I can't handle it anymore. How is someone who's always on their phone never texting? Don't you know how to text back, Natalia? You text your sister. What's her name? Marissa. How do you know Marissa? Who is this? Don't interrupt. It's rude to interrupt a customer. I'm Justin Ackerman, remember? Account 325-69874, with address numbers 426. We should be closer. I'm in love with you, and you haven't answered a text from me in months. I text you every day, but I remember the day you blocked me or changed numbers because the blue bubbles turned green. I changed numbers? Is this... It is Justin Ackerman. You already know that, silly. Go on and end your call professionally. Would hate for you to get into trouble on your last day. Last day? End the call. Uh, uh, thank you for your call to Cellular X. If you, um, if you stay, um, on the line, there will be a survey that takes roughly two minutes to complete your service today. Thank you. As you can guess, that wasn't the real Justin Ackerman. They found the real Justin Ackerman dead in the bathtub of his house. He was left to rot there for two months, but no one suspected a thing because he texted. Whoever this creep is who stalked Natalia is unknown. The police still think there's a runaway despite the obvious threat in the phone call, despite Justin Ackerman showing up dead under the same circumstances. They think maybe she ran away after being threatened or something like that. The PI couldn't get the phone records from Cellular X since they held those under federal grounds needing a federal subpoena. There's only so much Daniel could do, but it meant the world that he even tried. I had nothing in our conversations about a creep who texted her. I'm glad I delete nothing. I have texts from Natalia dating back to three years ago when I got this phone. The only thing I have is a list of guys she went on dates with. It's not great, but it's a start at least. I narrowed the list with Daniel to only the guy she saw before she got her number changed. Natalia only met guys on dating apps and gave them her phone number if she got proof they weren't catfishing weirdos like a video on Snapchat or something. The list is small. Giovanni, Jason, Bryce and Johnny. Only four guys in two years and three months. 
She didn't seriously date any of them, but I still could get their last names from conversations. Natalia always gave the last name before a date. Daniel went to talk to them, but nothing came of it. I'm not shocked. Natalia didn't say they were weird. I kept reading, searching, until a text came from Natalia's phone. I called Daniel immediately before I answered, waiting for him to come over. We answered them together, to ensure I said the right things to extract information. I heard you're looking for me. You haven't been at your apartment for over a month. What if I went on vacation, met a boyfriend and took a trip? What if I went to visit family? What if I went backpacking across Europe? Or what if I just ran away? I'd still find you. I know this isn't Natalia. You can stop pretending to be my sister. This is your sister. I know you killed Justin Ackerman because he had a cellular X account. Were you some rejected loser she didn't even tell me she went on a date with? I don't know what you're talking about, Marissa. I'm your sister. Besides, I don't tell you everything about my private life. Stop pretending to be Natalia. I heard the phone call. I heard you tell her it's her last day, and I heard you admit to stalking her. Scary phone call, wasn't it? It's why I ran off, and it's why I'm texting you now. Stop looking for me, or I'll come to find you. I didn't show it to the police. If I showed it, they would think Natalia ran away, and they were just now looking into her bank accounts. They haven't been touched for a month and a half. Natalia is still missing. I guess she was right. I guess no one really would know if she was missing. No one besides Daniel the PI believes me that she's missing. Mom and Dad have their head in the ground, living off those texts as a sign that she's alive. Her apartment gets cleared out next week. Flies swarm around the apples and bananas in the fruit bowl on her counter. I think I know who it is after reading enough into our texts. A guy that approached Natalia in a club, Henry. She told me he was clingy just before her number got changed. Daniel is looking into it now, but I'm not sharing this for awareness. What is a bunch of strangers going to do on the internet besides keep their eyes peeled for the news story that's never to come? I'm sharing this because this past week I'm getting texts from an unknown number of locations I've been to this week. Nothing else. Just shops, my job, restaurants. Sometimes the texts will say Daniel and I went to this place, or what I wore. I'm being stalked now. I tried telling the police but they told me there's no funding to have a watch at my house. I got a text before I sat down here and wrote this all up. He told me I look cute in my pyjamas, sitting on my couch, watching Natalia's favourite movie. I'm sharing this with you because if I go missing, I want someone to know. About four years ago, I worked as a laundress. I worked 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. and would often work alone. We usually have a security guard posted near the parking lot. They carry a radio and pepper spray, and later in the day, they patrol the building. A new guy started, and I saw him watching over the parking lot when I came in each morning. Throughout my shift, he would come into the laundry room. He was talkative, but I noticed he would look at my body a lot when he thought I wouldn't notice. One day, I came into work and started putting my stuff away, getting ready to begin. I hadn't turned on the lights yet, so there were parts of the room I couldn't see. Suddenly. I hear radio static in the corner of the room, and I see a red radio light. I turn on the lights, and the new guy is in the corner of the room, hiding and watching me. When I asked what he was doing there, he said he was just hanging out and started laughing. It was obvious he was waiting for me. He ended up doing this so often that I got used to it. I came in early one day and was working in one of our smaller areas. He came into the smaller room to talk to me. He is a big guy, so I couldn't get around him. He was just talking to me, but I couldn't move or leave the room because he blocked the door. He asked me why I came in early that day and told him it was because I had to leave early later. He told me that I was required to tell him all my hours so that he always knows where I am. He was leaning over me. He was very tall. And I felt like he was trying to upset me. I had this horrible feeling in my stomach that he was about to try something. So I pushed past him and called my supervisor who said he would keep an eye on him. I told him that I had a bad gut feeling about this guy and that I needed to leave for the day. The next day, he was fired. Apparently, he wasn't in the guard tower at the start of the shift because he would spend mornings in the woods near the parking area, recording girls walking in for their shifts each morning. They also found a huge collection of pop and soda cans and coffee cups in his locker that he admitted 
had dug out from various trash bins around where I and the other girls worked. His wife shortly left him and took full custody of their newborn baby. I'm going away for five months this summer to work in Greece. Same thing I did last year. Anyway, this time it's not such a last-minute decision. So I planned ahead to take a few family members away on a low-budget British caravan holiday so we can spend time together before I leave. I booked it for a week, Friday to Friday. The first few days were good, celebrating Wales, winning the Grand Slam and the rugby, etc. Monday, much of the same, we played bingo in the outside clubhouse, and this is when I noticed a member of the security team. He looked quite attractive at a distance. I like beards, glasses. So I said to my mother, Oh, he's nice. And we laughed. A bit later, he approached our table and chatted to us a little bit about general things going on on site at his job. He shook my hand and introduced myself. He then stood by our table on and off all night, trying to engage in general conversation. He did make excessive eye contact with me, which was weird. So I thought that's why I was getting such bad anxiety being around him, because he seemed otherwise normal. When we were leaving, he was on duty at the front of the clubhouse. We walked past and said bye. He said something along the lines of, Ah, don't go. I've got two days off and I won't be able to see you. Which I thought was weird, because we just met him and had nothing but basic conversation. My mom thought I liked him, so she said she was going to catch up to my dad and left me to talk to him. He looked like he was going to say something, but I wasn't interested in being alone with him. So I said, can't believe she left me behind. See you. And left. And I could feel him watching me walk through this dark car park. Again, anxiety. Two days went by and things were normal. But on the day he came back to duty, Wednesday, he noticed us straight away and walked over. He winked at me and stood right next to me, put his elbows on the table, and tried chatting to me, a bit too close for my face. I shrugged it off and went to play with my nephew in the arcade bowling machine. I could see him in the corner of my eye, watching me from behind one of its machines. And I again got really bad anxiety. I went back to my parents' table, and he would walk by every few minutes, looking each time. I couldn't stand the anxious feeling in my gut. So I waited until he was gone out of sight, made an excuse, and went back to the caravan alone. My parents arrived back a few hours later and told me he kept stopping by and asking about me, asking where I was, if he needed to check up on me, etc. And then he gave my mother a piece of paper with his number on it to give to me. I was embarrassed by that and joked with my mother like, who tries to get someone's mom to be their wingwoman? Thursday was our last day. I decided not to go out because I felt uncomfortable going there. Now, after being watched and throwing his number in the bin, my parents went elsewhere, and I stayed in, packing and babysitting my nephew. This was where I got really freaked out. He somehow found my number and began sending me messages on WhatsApp. I replied at first, wanting to be polite, Look, and mentioned packing and going home. He started to get a little flirty, so I put my phone upside down on silent and went to bed. My mom had her window and curtain wide open. My dad had fallen asleep on the couch watching TV with my nephew, and I was in the single room alone. I woke up later because I heard a rustling noise outside. I froze for a second, but I could hear movement outside my window. When I looked through a tiny gap, I saw him standing there looking around and I genuinely thought I was going to have a heart attack. I felt like I needed to cough, but I was terrified to make a sound. I looked at my phone and it was 3.30. I saw a bunch of WhatsApp notifications. I was too scared to open them, so I read a bit from the notification bubble. He told me he knew where I was, and he wanted me to dangle myself out of the window for him to play with, along with sending pictures of himself naked. Numerous calls and texts all while outside my window. I laid there for about two hours, too afraid to move. I must have fallen asleep, because next thing I remember was my mom waking me up, saying she had just opened the curtains in the living room and saw him standing right outside. It was 9 a.m., six hours later. I've never felt so scared in my life. We were packed and ready to leave. By the time we were about to go, he had gone. 
I ran to the car with my hood up, paranoid that it would stop us. My parents thought it was weird of him being out there, but I never told them about my messages, so they didn't know why I was being so weird. I felt sick waiting for my dad to start the engine, because I don't know where he had gone, or if he was waiting. If he found out my number and caravan, he had seen us <laughs> in my dad's car with a license plate. What else could he find out? I've not mentioned this to anyone, because I can't handle it right now. I feel violated in a way I don't know how to describe it. I hope I never, ever meet that man again. My friend and I went into J.C. Penney's for her to exchange a packet of onesies for her infant daughter. We both had our toddler son sitting facing each other in a tandem stroller. After being in the store for a few minutes, they both started tugging back and forth on the package of onesies, the correct size my friend needed to exchange the originals for. I grabbed the package from them and threw it into the compartment under the stroller, ending the game of tug-of-war. Fran did a little more shopping, boys did some more fighting and whining. She exchanged the onesies and cashed out the rest of her items. We left the store, got lunch in the food court, let the babies play in the play place and grabbed coffee, ready to head out. As we received our coffees, a security officer approaches me and asks me what I stole. Completely dumbfounded, I tell him I didn't steal anything. He tells me he has me on video stealing, and if I confess, he'll go easy. I tell him he's wrong. He can check my purse. I have nothing. He immediately pulls the package of onesies from the bottom of the stroller. Amidst our toddler screaming, she didn't realize I put them down there, so she grabbed another package. I didn't pay attention because she bought other things and I was trying to keep the boys from poking each other in the eyes. Toddlers can be assholes. I tell S.G. it wasn't intentional and explain how the boys were grabbing on it, to which led me throwing it to the bottom of the stroller. He goes on a rant on how he's heard every excuse in the book, and I'm just making it worse for myself. So I bring up the timeline and ask, why, if I intended to steal, for an infant that isn't mine, by the way, why would I stay for lunch, let the kids play, and calmly sit down to have coffee? My friend also confirms that she has the infant daughter, and yes, the boys were annoying each other during our shopping trip. This apparently pissed the security guard off because he went into full-on commando mode, pulling me by the arm back to J.C. Penney's and into the security room. We get inside and I urge him to watch the security tape again, figuring he'll see the babies fussing and understand the confusion. He leaves me in the room for 45 minutes, to which I figure he had to have seen the babies fussing and fighting. Nope, he comes back in and calls me a liar. He says it's clearly showed me shoplifting and he's going to call the cops. I'm frustrated, but agree to the cops being called because I figure they'll see the tapes and understand the mistake. He didn't like this either. He tells me that once the cops get involved, that he is required to call Child Protective Services, which will immediately open a case and they will take my son in custody until I have a court date. Keep in mind, I'm 23 at the time and have never been in a situation like this before, so I believe his lying ass. I break down crying, telling the guy that I'm being honest, I'm not a thief, I have a clean record, why would I steal clothes for a child that isn't mine, etc. He was cold, told me the most innocent looking people are the ones who steal. He's heard every excuse and lie you can think of, and I have three minutes to confess before he calls the cops and has my son taken away from me. I still insisted my innocence, because I was, and begged for a manager. Bear in mind, my friend was outside the whole time with my son and hers unbothered other than worrying about me. Dickhead security guard leaves and comes back ten minutes later. No manager, but with a paper, which is basically a generic written confession, saying I shoplifted in the amount of $6.99, literally under $10. And I agree to pay restocking fees, loss and prevention fees, and not to enter the store for three years. Now, I'm hysterically crying, pleading with him that I did nothing wrong. I'm not a shoplifter. The only thing I did was exercise poor judgment by not specifying to my friends that the Wednesdays were on the bottom. He tells me he has no sympathy for thieves and liars, and already called the cops, and they're on the way to arrest me and take my son unless I sign the paper. So I panic, quickly sign the form to which he releases me, I tell my friend, she drove, to hightail it out of the mall ASAP. 
after telling the story to her in the car and other people later, I found out that this was all bullshit. The security guard lied and manipulated me and should have lost his job for that. But he was so far in my head that I didn't want to revisit the situation for even a second. It's been over a decade since this happened, and I still get anxiety just thinking about it. So, Ricky Mall security guard, let's not meet again, ever. I'm an overnight security guard for a large building parking ramp. It's generally a really quiet job with a lot of free time, but occasionally I do have to kick out homeless people. It's a horrible part of the job, and I do my best to direct them to the next safest place to sleep. Most people are understanding, as they unfortunately go through this a lot. If anything, they try to vent, and I try to be an open ear. Our protocol is to ask them to leave. Then, if they don't, tell them to leave. And if all else fails, we have to contact police. I've only once gotten to that last step. It's important to note my general routine at work. I sit in a shack in the parking ramp for an hour. Then I go for a walk around the building and then back to the shack. The doors are all locked, but there's an entryway with an ATM that's open 24-7. This is usually where I find people looking for a place to sleep. For more context, I'm a smaller woman and unarmed. On this night, there was a woman trying to sleep by the ATM. I followed protocol, and after the first two warnings, I had to contact police. She yelled at me, which is out of the normal, but understandable, considering her position. It must be frustrating being constantly kicked out of every semi-safe place. Police arriving and, because I was a little scared, I always am, I watched from inside the building, out of view, to make sure they got her out. If she was yelling at me, she was full on screaming at them. This goes on for about a half an hour before she leaves the building. Unfortunately, that's all the cops are required to do. So she makes her way to the bus stop right outside. The problem with this is the bus stop is parallel with my shack. She just sits and stares at me with hatred in her eyes. It gets uncomfortable pretty quickly, so I decided to take another walk. When I'm passing the door that leads out to my shack, I decide to take a peek out of the little door window. I don't usually do this, but I felt uneasy knowing she was probably still in the area. And it's a good thing I did. I can just barely see it, but behind my shack, I see the slightest wobble. There she was, hiding right behind my shack. It's not a big thing, maybe a ten-foot cube made of large windows and metal right at the entrance of the parking ramp. I have no doubt she was waiting for me. I call the police and just keep watching from the little door window. While I'm waiting, she eventually lets out an angry scream, kicks the miscellaneous junk in front of the shack, and storms up the stairwell in the parking ramp. For an extra kick of anxiety, the floor above me had a broken door that wasn't locked at the time. Eventually the police get there, and after some harsh words, they get her to leave again and this time she walks off into the night. What really scares me was what I found on my next walk. There's a mirror next to the door I was watching her from. I couldn't see it from inside, but from this side, it was obvious. She had broken the mirror and a large piece was missing. Maybe I've allowed my anxiety to build all this up in my head, but from my perspective, she had taken a large, sharp object, hid behind my shack, and waited for me to walk up. You tell me I'm overreacting, but to my nameless potential assailant, I wish you better times and a bed to sleep in, but I also hope we never meet again. This literally happened today. I advise you to skip this story if you're too sensible to grow stuff or if you're eating right now. So I'm a man. Yesterday was my birthday, just turned 24, which means I've spent the weekend drinking my ass off. Friday on a club, Saturday on a bar, and yesterday at a friend's house. So you can imagine the mess I was this particular Monday morning. I have to take two buses to get to work, and the whole stopping all the time thing that they do can make me sick even in a non-hangover day. I considered going by car to avoid this, but then thought, fuck it, I've been here before. Could as well save the gas money and suck it up for the hour I spend riding the bus. Big mistake. I got on the bus and immediately felt sicker. But again, not my first time and I decided to focus my attention on the other bus riders to get my mind off the bad feeling. Bigger mistake. At first, I didn't notice anything weird about this man, about 50 to 60 years old, but then he suddenly got up 
and changed seats for no particular reason, and I could tell that he was probably homeless because his clothes were very dirty. Okay, no big deal. Got nothing against the homeless. Then, he started rubbing his fingers against the filthy bus floor and licking them. He smiled as he did this, and I noticed he had few to almost no teeth. This scene, combined with my hangover, made me extremely unwell. I thought it couldn't get worse but he got up again and started picking whatever tiny pieces of dirt and garbage were on the bus floor and putting them in his mouth. He then got to the back of the bus and started maniacally laughing, which honestly creeped me the fuck out. I then decided to close my eyes to avoid seeing whatever he was going to put on his mouth next, but had to open my eyes occasionally so I didn't miss my stop. When I saw the spot before mine, I got up. So did he. As expected, his smell was putrid, and I had to fight my urge to vomit with him standing next to me. I avoided looking at him, and when the bus finally stopped and the doors opened, he went in the bus's garbage and started licking empty wrappers and plastic cups of coffee, among other stuff. I couldn't contain myself any longer, and as I stepped out of the bus, I puked on the stairs. I didn't go full blastoise, so it was just one squirt. The rest, as you can imagine, I swallowed. I then looked at him, and he was smiling. As I stepped out of the bus, the man got down on the bus floor and started to enthusiastically lick my vomit. He was rubbing his hands against it, licking his fingers, and still smiling. I watched for what must have been the longest second of my life. My stop is located in front of a mall, in which I got in running as fast as I could and proceeded to spend the next half hour vomiting in the bathroom only stopping once to call my boss and inform her I would be late. I know that man was probably mentally ill. I do feel sorry for him and expect that somebody got him the help he needs after seeing what he did today, but I don't want to ever see anybody even resembling him again in my life. It's like he appeared precisely on that day in which I was less able to deal with that kind of stuff, and the image of him licking my vomit off of a bus floor is forever stuck in my mind. I am female. When I was 10 years old, my family relocated from Delaware to South Carolina for my dad's job. We lived near all our family and had never moved before. One of dad's selling points about the move was that people in the South are so friendly. I had just finished fifth grade and would be starting sixth in South Carolina. I rode the bus to and from school in Delaware, and so there wasn't a lot of anxiety about riding the bus after we moved. Sixth grade started and I was excited about my new school and loved my teacher. Dad was right, people in the South are polite and friendly. Well, most of them are. Anyway, one day in the fall, I got off the bus at my stop after school and a man in a dark green VW Beetle that was behind the bus pulled off the main road and called out to me as I was walking toward my house. I turned around and probably even smiled at him. I had no real stranger danger fears at the time. I walked up to the driver's side of his car to see what he wanted. I figured he wanted to ask for directions or something, and I planned to tell him I just moved here and didn't know. But oh boy, he didn't need directions. He was after something entirely different. He smiled at me and said something I didn't catch, comprehend, or understand. So I said, what, or excuse me, to get him to repeat it. I got a little closer so I could hear him better, and he said, want to fuck? So at the time, I didn't know what that meant, except that maybe I kind of did, and knew that was a bad word, and I didn't want to, whatever fuck was. I turned and ran to my neighbor's house and didn't look back. I was crying, and they called my mom, and my parents called the police about it. A couple of days later, the police department had a sketch artist come meet my parents and I at the station to work with me. I did the best I could, but honestly... I wasn't studying the man's features or even trying to remember his face at the time of the incident, so I don't know how accurate it was. My parents and I thought that was the end of it. Nobody really thought they would find him. The cops were saying things like, if they could find him, he could go to jail for a while for his obscene question to me. My mom was nervous that if it came to that, I would have to go to court to testify, and she didn't feel good about putting me through that. She worried that even as an undeveloped 10-year-old child, the defense would attempt to shame me in some way or say I was asking for it. About a week later, I was again getting off the bus and I hear a car horn beep. I look to see 
and it was the same guy, same VW Beetle, smiling and waving at me. I was stunned. I blankly waved back for some reason, but at the same time memorized his tag number. I repeated it to myself over and over as I ran to my house to write it down and call mom. Cops were notified and the guy was identified. He lived about 20 minutes away in another town. His local cops knew and were friendly with his family, the good old boy system, so he didn't go to jail. But apparently, they told him to stay away from me. I never saw him again, and I hope I never do. I wonder how many times he might have followed the bus and watched me that I never knew about. Dear pedo pervert predator, let's never meet again. Okay, to preface this, here's a little backstory. At the time of this incident, I was 17 years old and a senior in high school. I rode the school bus sometimes when my friends didn't drive me home. That was what happened that day. So, here it is. I got off the school bus at my street, and the stop was at an intersection between my street and the highway. My street isn't a big street. It only has about seven houses. And every person on my street is a business owner. I know all my neighbors. Well, I got off my bus and while I'm walking towards my street, a white van pulls up and stops in front of the bus. The van had tinted windows and those sometimes illegal tints on the front window as well. Well, I walked onto my street and the bus drove away. And once the bus went away, the van turned onto my street. It drove slow and kept up with me. I immediately was just like, Oh, absolutely not, because human trafficking is not a big thing in my state. I saw the car stop right next to me, and that's when I ran. I ran across one of my neighbor's lawns as I heard the man in the van open his door. I went on my phone and turned on Noonlight, an app where, if I let go of the button on the screen, it immediately sends police to my location. I ran as fast as I could and hid for 10 minutes waiting for the van to drive away. Once the van left, I went to my house, told my parents, and we called the police. Police came, interviewed me, and told me there'd been sightings of that car all around town, and there were even a few disappearances linked to it. It's been about a year, and nothing has happened, and I'm beyond happy about that. So Van Predator, let's not meet. This happened when I was in my early 20s. I was working in a retail store in a mall. But there weren't enough hours, so I asked if there was anything else I could do, and my boss told me that the location at the other mall needed more help, so I could go there on my weekend. I decided to take the bus route that was a bit longer, but that I didn't have to make any transfers. So I got up early and caught the earliest one I could. The bus ride was fairly normal. I got to see parts of my city I hadn't seen before. I did notice that the bus eventually went into a more dingy neighborhood. There was more trash everywhere, abandoned buildings, houses and cars, etc. I noticed it, but I felt like I was safely on the bus, and my destination was in a nice neighborhood. At some point, an elderly lady got on the bus, and I noticed that no one was getting up to offer her a seat. So I gave her mine, and went to go hold the pole next to the side door of the bus, and continued on my way. While riding, I remember looking at a guy next to me and asking if he knew about how much longer it would take to get to my stop, but before he answered, someone hit the buzzer to get off. The doors next to me opened, and I felt hands on my free arm grabbing me and pulling me. I, on reflex, immediately clenched up because I generally don't like any physical contact with strangers outside of a greeting handshake, and I really think that reflex saved my life because it took my brain a few seconds to register that someone was trying to pull me off the bus. A tall man, in a white tank top, blue jeans, and white tennis shoes had come out of the back of the bus, grabbed my arm, and tried to drag me off the bus. He had pulled me down to the second step before I even understood what was going on, and I was just barely still hanging onto the pole. The arm he was grabbing had my purse on it and I actually tried to shake my purse down to him, so he'd let go, but he had no interest in my purse. I had just about started calling for help, when I felt someone grab my waist and pull me back up towards the bus. The man trying to pull me down must have realized that he couldn't get me without this dragging out longer than he expected, so he finally gave up and ran off. And that was it. The guy ran off, the door shut, 
and I vaguely remember hearing the man who saved me say something along the lines of, you would die in that neighborhood. And I had apparently gone into some kind of shock, because I only remember saying, oh, I don't even remember thanking him. I didn't say anything to the driver. I didn't contact the police like I should have. I don't even remember my shift at that other location. I don't remember the ride home. It was like I was numb. It was when I was at home, had completely showered and gotten ready for bed in my nightgown, that I sat at the edge of my bed and thought, Did I almost get kidnapped? I almost got kidnapped. I have a lot of regrets about this. I regret not contacting the police in case that guy goes after another woman. At least women would be aware that he was out there. And I regret not thanking and keeping in contact with that nice person who saved me. I actually posted an article in my local CL in hopes of him somehow hearing it and knowing how grateful I am. Well, anyway, to that guy that tried to take me off the bus, let's not meet, and I hope you get caught. Something happened to me a few weeks ago that I planned to keep a secret, but recently it has been eating away at me, and I need to speak about it. The situation involves the dark web, but it isn't like all the other stories you hear of some unsuspecting soul learning of the dark web through a friend, going on it for the first time and browsing around until the inevitable comes across some horrifying page that leaves them sleepless for nights. No, this is the opposite, to be honest. I'm actually the one who would be terrifying these curious souls. You see, I'm a dark web prankster. Meaning, I spend my free time on the dark web messing with unsuspecting strangers. I join chat rooms and send them links to gory, but obviously fake videos. I place similar videos in place on my webcam in private chats, tricking the other user into thinking that they are chatting with a psychopathic killer. My favorite trick, though, is taking control of their cursor, manipulating the chat room and making the site unclosable unless they turn off their machine. This one gets the most screams and appalled expressions, and it is all achieved through running some simple bash scripts. Now, some people may think this is cruel, but I see it as a service, a free one at that. You see, those people come onto the dark web for these kinds of experiences. They hear somebody tell a scary story of their experience on the big bad dark web, and they want to be able to tell similar stories in a sad attempt to be interesting. They come looking to be terrified, and I ensure they aren't disappointed. Of course, I get my own enjoyment out of it, so it's a win-win. But recently, this has all changed. If you fly too close to the sun, you'll eventually get burned. I am burning. The night started like any other. I got back from work, made some dinner, and after washing up, I logged onto my PC and got to work. I jumped around a few chat rooms, but they were unusually quiet or taking too long to connect. And when they did connect, people left before I got the chance to mess with them. Eventually, I was able to keep someone around for more than a few seconds. They were some bald dude with a gnarly scar across his nose. His ears and face were both heavily pierced, and he had a python tattoo wrapped around his neck. A tough guy. They were always fun to make cry like a baby. The way I usually do these pranks is I keep the screen blank until I see the person. Then I choose from the collection of cam clips I have and slowly escalate it from there. For this specific instance, I chose a clip of a cute girl who starts smiling and waving. The man smiled back and began typing until a message popped up. Hi, you are cute. Thank you. I like your tattoo. We went back and forth typing and discussing ourselves until I decided to start the fun. I took down the video of the girl and replaced it with a video that starts with a man tied to a chair. A masked man then begins to beat the man in the chair with a hammer. To my surprise, the man didn't seem horrified. Instead, he began to wholeheartedly laugh before sending another message. Funny, but I preferred the lady. I replied telling him to shut up or the girl would get it next. Once that message sent, the man's laughter stopped and he began to stare into the camera with a cold, emotionless gaze. You shouldn't be so rude. That message was the beginning of the end for my pranking. 
He began to type again, and when he stopped, my jaw dropped and my fun was over. He sent the message, and it was my full name. I quickly moved my cursor up and tried to X out of the chat, but my cursor froze before dissipating before my very eyes. I opened my console and began to frantically type some commands, but each one was denied. Slowly the chat began to turn black with red font. I was in a full-blown panic now. My heart was racing and I felt like I had spikes sticking into my arms, legs, and neck. I couldn't control my breathing and I was sweating profusely. All the while, that psycho was smiling into the camera, his dirty yellow teeth glaring at me as he continued to type. Let's have a look, shall we? The light from my webcam lit up, and sure enough, down in the left-hand corner of the screen was my terrified face staring aimlessly at the screen. My brain was screaming instructions at me, but my body couldn't react. I was frozen in fear. Eventually, I snapped out of it and stood up to turn off my computer when he screamed in a deep, grisly, distorted voice. Wait! This stopped me in my tracks. I looked back at the screen and he was gone, but only momentarily. When he returned, he was standing up, leaning over directly into the camera. He lifted his hand, balled into a fist, and opened it, revealing multiple human teeth which fell from his hand and bounced off the desk beneath. Then he sent the last message. See you soon, boy. He smiled as the words in the chat room began to fall off the screen, while a loud, screeching noise blared from my speaker. Just then, my computer switched itself off, leaving me standing, staring at my reflection on the darkened monitor. I must have stood there for at least five minutes before I snapped out of it and went to bed. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't. Every time my eyes closed, I saw his horrifying smile, and I heard the disgusting sound of the teeth hitting the desk. I called in sick to work the next day so I could try to relax and went for a run to clear my head. It helped enormously, and three days later I had put the whole experience behind me. However, a week ago, about ten days after the incident, something happened which made me tell the story. At about 1 a.m. I was awoken by some strange banging sounds. I got up in a haze and looked out the front window to see an old maroon-colored Toyota Camry parked right behind my car and blocking it in. The banging had stopped, but the strange car had put me on edge. I had lived in the neighborhood for a few years and I never once saw this car. I put on some clothes and began to walk down my stairs and towards the front door. But as I did, the banging began again. It was coming from the back door. I slowly walked towards the door with my heart racing. The closer I got, the louder the bangs. Whatever was causing it was trying to smash the door off its hinges. I wanted to scream, get the hell away from my house. However, for once in my life, I made the smart decision and ran up my stairs and into my bedroom before barricading my door and calling 911. The operator picked up just as I heard a window smash from downstairs. There's a man in my house. He's trying to kill me, I screamed before she responded, telling me to calm down and to tell her my location. She asked me to stay on the line and that a squad car was close by. I heard heavy footsteps stomping up my stairs and towards my door before stopping. The operator asked was I still there, but before I could answer her inquiry, the man started to attempt to knock down my bedroom door. The bangs on the door were deafening. The operator kept pushing me to respond, but I couldn't. I was transfixed on the door and how with every sickening thud that psycho got closer and closer. Suddenly I could hear sirens in the distance and the banging stopped, followed by the sound of quick steps speeding down the stairs and shortly after the sound of a car starting and speeding away. A few minutes later the lights from the sirens illuminated my room. This broke me out of my frozen fearful state. I moved the barricade and ran down my stairs and out of the front door to the police. They questioned me for some time and searched around my house. They found shoe and axe marks on both doors. My bedroom door had a massive hole in it from where that lunatic was cutting it. 
I gave them a full statement and told them everything. When all was finished, they drove me to my friend's house as I couldn't stay at mine anymore. The next day, I rang my landlord and cancelled my tenancy, which cost me my deposit and the cancellation fee. I've been staying with my friend while I look for a new place. I haven't been sleeping at all. I'm terrified that that psycho will find me again. The police found no evidence that could be used to find him, bar the Camry. But there are thousands of them in this state alone. I fear for my life every day and I'm unsure if I'll ever be safe again. Stay off the dark web. It was mostly used by jokesters, but it only takes one wrong click to put your life in danger. Nine one one, what's your emergency? There's a woman in my house. Uh, can you describe what she looks like? She's been trying to murder me ever since I did the same thing to her. Huh? Are you sure you're not on any drugs of any sort? Let me explain. Okay, sir. A few months ago, my wife cheated on me with another man. And I was so heartbroken that I couldn't feel happiness anymore. So I murdered her. Taking all of my rage from her cheating on me out on her. After I buried her and I looked down on the coffin and saw what I did to her, I felt so guilty that I just broke down into tears. She used to be the love of my life. How did it come to this? Okay, sir, take a deep breath. The first time she tried to kill me was a week after I murdered her. It was raining hard and I looked down at my shaking hands and there was blood on them. When I blinked, the blood was gone. I was just so guilty that my guilt was making me hallucinate her blood on my hands. At about 3 a.m., there was a noise from across the hall. So I walked down the hallway and there she was, holding a knife in her hands. She screeched all of her agony out and ran towards me with the knife. She tackled me to the ground and pain shot through my body. But when I opened my eyes, she was gone. Uh, what is your address? And now she's trying to kill me a second time. What is your address? 136 Benjamin Road, Oakland, California. And she's walking around my house trying to find me. This time, I was having dinner when suddenly she was sitting across from me. She launched herself across the table trying to kill me, but I disabled her for a short time and ran into my closet. And now I'm hiding from her. What's going on? She's locked my door. Uh, you need to stay quiet. It's too late. She knows where I am now. <laughs> Sir. Sir. The police found his body in his closet with a gun in his hand. His death was ruled a suicide by gunshot. The note simply said, I'm sorry. I found a journal entry written by my recently deceased schizophrenic patient. His name was Roy Simmons. Roy had been diagnosed with schizophrenia about three weeks ago and died only a few weeks ago. I am posting this here because there are so many things that I don't understand, despite having worked with schizophrenia patients for over 15 years. I hope someone here can help me understand Roy's case. I have not edited anything that follows. 6th of February, 2019, Roy S. She watches me sleep and I don't like it. I've told everyone, but they tell me she's only in my head. She's not real, but I see her. I feel her. She knows she's real and so do I. Sometimes she talks to me. We have a pleasant conversation, usually. Nothing out of the ordinary. She moves around my room, sometimes smiling, sometimes weeping, but it doesn't bother me. She gets angry when I stay up too long. On those days, she screams louder and louder until I somehow fall asleep. She even follows me around during the day, watching my every move, smiling when she's pleased with my actions and screaming when she's not. But she's so beautiful. Oh, so beautiful. She's here with me right now. She's watching me as I write this. Please help me. She likes it when I mention her. But she never tells me her name. She says her voice is all I need. All I will ever have. She does have an amazing voice, though. I don't think I've ever heard a voice so serene, so melodious. 190306. Please don't let her get to me. She keeps me safe. But lately, she's been unhappy with me. I don't know why. She stands beside me as I sleep and only watches me 
occasionally singing something that I cannot recognize. She tells me that I've done something bad, and I'm going to be punished. I know that she only wants the best for me, so I have nothing to worry about. She's going to claim me. She told me I had the most beautiful eyes and the most beautiful hair. She plays with my hair sometimes. She doesn't know this, but I know that she grabs my eye. She's telling me to stop writing now. Time to say goodbye. No, 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 no. It's getting closer. She'll get to you soon. Roy died about a month after he wrote this. The reason for my confusion was that he knew how and when he was going to die. He died on the 6th of March, 2019. 190306. His eyes had seemingly been stabbed repeatedly and his hair had been ripped out, along with some parts of his scalp. But the autopsy said that he died of a heart attack. The camera footage from that day didn't provide any concrete evidence either. His behavior had been completely normal. He died inside the washroom, inside his room, where we did not have any CCTV cameras. Roy couldn't have stabbed his own eyes and ripped out his own hair considering there weren't any sharp objects in the washroom and Roy wasn't the type of person to harm himself like this. I hope someone knows something useful. I worked at my county sheriff's office as a 911 dispatcher. I worked there for about a year and then enlisted in the U.S. Air Force while working as a 911 operator. Many calls came in that were considered traumatic to both the police officers and the dispatchers. And if it was considered traumatic enough, those involved would be offered psychiatric guidance and paid time off. What I'm about to share is one of those experiences. And I'm thinking I should have taken the offer because it shakes me to this day. Most of what I've read on here so far has been great, so don't take this the wrong way. But I'm sure a good bit of it has been fictional. I will take this story to the grave with me and assure you that it is 100% legit. I won't post a disclaimer as there is an 18 years and older check to even view this subreddit, but it isn't gruesome. This story, if you share my own conviction, will shake you. But I don't think anyone will walk away from this guard. Day 1. County 911, what's your emergency? I stabbed my dad with scissors. Okay, what's going on? He's yelling at my mom and he has a gun. Are you in the house with them? Are you safe? I ran to the neighbor's house across the street. What's your address? He tells me what street he lives on and his address. Dispatch 302 310. Respond to 310 Maple. Reference to a domestic. 1032. Gun is involved. 302 and 310 acknowledge. 302 is third shift unit 2. 310 is third shift sergeant. Little boy in the background while I'm dispatching. My stepdad hit my mom and I stabbed him with scissors. I'm sorry, am I going to get arrested? No, no, but I'm sending some nice police officers to talk to you. Dispatch 302-310. Be advised complainant is in neighbor's house across the street. Juvenile advises he stabbed the mail party with scissors. Where did you stab your stepdad? 302 and 310 acknowledge. In the leg. He punched me. 302-310 advise on 1052. Ambulance. Complainant advises he stabbed male party in leg. 302 and 310 acknowledge. Don't worry, bud. Everything will be okay. I never regretted saying anything more than that last statement. Thank you. You're so nice. I never called 911 before. I'm scared. Don't be scared. You did the right thing. 302 dispatch. Myself and 310 are 1023. On scene. 302. Can you look out the window and see if my police officers are there? I see their cars. I'll let you go now. No, keep me on the phone, bud. I want to talk to you for a little while. Okay. Can I go talk to the police? No, stay inside for me, okay? Okay. I'm in scared. I don't want my mom to go to jail. Everything will be okay, bud. I really regret these statements. I wish I could take them back to this day. Thank you. 302 Dispatch, requesting additional units. 104302. Dispatch to 304305. Respond to 310 Maple. 302 and 310 requesting additional units. 304 and 305 acknowledge. At this point, my dispatch supervisor takes over the call. I switch to a different frequency to monitor non-emergency traffic and my supervisor takes over the call with a little boy. Okay, buddy, I'm gonna let you talk to a nice lady for a few minutes. Okay, thank you. You're a nice policeman. Okay, hold on. 
Supervisor breaks the line. Hi, this is Anna. How are you doing? I hang up and switch frequencies. The call goes on for a good two hours. Two more units responded after 304 and 305 to include one of the on-call investigators. I didn't hear anything else about the call that night, other than my supervisor telling me how well I handled the little boy and that he will be okay. Things will get sorted out with him. Day 2. Halfway through my shift, 310 comes into dispatch to hang out and shoot the shit for a few minutes between calls. I have completely forgotten about last night's call with the little boy. As we get domestic situations often and being in Georgia, most involving firearms. Crazy call last night, huh? I hear you took the call. Yeah, he couldn't have been more than about 12 or so, right? He was 13. Cute kid. So sorry for him. What ended up happening with it? Anna took the call over after you asked for backup. Well, we surrounded the house and used our PA to try and get them to come out of the house. No one would answer. We asked Anna for the house information and attempted to call inside the house, but no one would answer. We tried all that for about an hour, then busted the door in. Damn. Damn doesn't cover it. Mom was lying on the kitchen floor with a hole in her chest. Dad was sitting on the bed. You guys didn't go out with an arrest last night. His chin was resting on the barrel of the shotgun. His head was on the ceiling. Jesus. Not the worst one I've seen, but damn. That'll stick with me for a while. What about the kid? We got Child Protective Services involved. They tracked down some family he has out of state. He's at a house in county right now, but they'll be here this weekend to get him. Damn. Poor kid. Yeah. But that's what we're here for. Yeah, not fair sometimes. Tell me about it. Day 12. County 911, what's your emergency? The line was just static and almost immediately disconnected. It's our policy to call back 911 hangups. I called the number back. We're sorry, but the number you have dialed has been disconnected. Please hang up and try your call again. Okay. Fat fingered it, tried it again. We're sorry, but the number you have dialed. One more, just to be sure. We're sorry, but the num- Okay, happens sometimes. On a slow night, we pull up call records based on different criteria to see history involving the party in question. I search the number. Dispatch 302, be en route. 911 hang up. Negative contact on callback. Line disconnected, 302. 302 dispatch, 104. Standing by for 1021. Phone call. 302, ring. County dispatch, how can I help you? Hey, it's 302. What's up, ma'am? You know, that's the address from a couple weeks ago, right? What? The one with the double and the little kid. Oh shit, it didn't register with me. Everything was cut when we seized the house, man. Phone, power, whatever. I didn't think you guys did that. Yeah, I'll go check it out, but the house is boarded up. Okay, let me know. Will do. Some minutes later. 302, dispatch 1023. 302. 302, dispatch. Everything appears to be 10-4. Show me 10-8. 302. Ring. County dispatch, how can I help you? Hey man, like I said, the house is boarded up. No one is there, dude. Must be a glitch or something to do with the line being cut. Probably. Talk to you later, bud. Okay, man. Be careful out there. Day 22. 911, what's your emergency? The line is static for a good 20 seconds. As I disconnected and tried to call it back, we're sorry, but the number you have dialed. I look at the number. Guess what address? I send 302 to check it out. Nothing. A couple hours later, another dispatcher gets a 911 call and she literally threw her headset off and screamed, What the fuck? It was just static, but that shit was loud as fuck. Turn your volume down. I got a static call earlier. Look the number up. It says it's 310 Maple. What the fuck? I just sent 302 out there a little while ago. Remember that call we got with the kid that stabbed his stepdad that ended up messy? Yeah, that's the house. I'm going to send 302 out there just to check. 302 and 310 went out. Remove boards and check the interior of the house. Nothing. Day, I don't remember. County 911, what's your emergency? The line is static for a few seconds, then disconnects. I call it back. We're sorry. Look up the number. Guess what fucking address? Ring. County 911, what's your emergency? The line is static, but doesn't disconnect. Guess what number?
I tell my supervisor what's going on. She advises me to keep the line open and she dispatches two units to the house. She gets one of the dispatchers to call the phone company to get information on the line and to advise of the issue. 302 and 304 arrive, check the house and advise that everything is fine. The phone company meets them at the house and does some phone magic with the hookups. They tell the officers that we shouldn't hear anything else out of the house. Issue resolved. A few days later, the revelation. We have the ability to play back calls. After I left for the night of the back-to-back -back calls, 310 came in the dispatch, asking for the audio for the calls. From what I'm told, he stuck around all day to hunt down all audio from that house, starting the day of the initial call, which wasn't even from the house in question. The kid across the street. I come into work, and 310 is in dispatch. Hey, come here when you get a minute, monitoring towards my supervisor's office. I clock in and head in. Close the door, man. I close the door. I think I'm in trouble at this point because, well, who calls you into the supervisor's office and closes the door if you're not? I have something here I want you to listen to, but you don't have to. You remember the 911 hangups we keep getting from 310 Maple? Yes, sir. I went back and pulled the logs. It was just static. I don't need... You need to listen to these, but I can't force you to. I think you'd like to hear them. Up to you, bud. I'll take a listen, but all I heard was static, boss. Me too, at first. I proceeded to listen to the first few calls. Nothing, just static. Just static, man. Not the last one. Play it. I listen. Static. Is this a joke? Again. Play it. Static. Come on, man. I need to get to work. This is a sick joke. It's not funny. Again, I'll turn it up. Fine. Let's get this over with. You sure you want to do this? If there's something to hear, yes. Otherwise, I need to get to work. Listen. I listened again, and I must have turned an unearthly shade of white. The look on his face was a mixture of I told you and can you believe this shit? Play it again. You sure? Play it. I listen again. I, I can't. I can't understand. I can't bring myself to accept. Is this a joke? No, man. I spent all day listening to them. We don't have any high-tech gadgets to run the sound through to remove the static. We don't have anything to amplify the playback. We can't tweak and tune the sound to hear background noise. Our county is pretty well off, but not that well off. This was raw static recorded when I kept the line open the final time the house called. Very, very faintly. Barely audible above the static. Help me. It was repeated at random intervals throughout the static. I didn't sleep that night. I didn't sleep for a week. I cried. I cried for the little boy. I cried for the woman whose voice was on the line. I cried for the mom lying on the kitchen floor with a hole in her chest. Was it her? I went home. I clocked right back out and went home. I took a couple of days off but came back to work and pretended just like with all the other calls that it never happened. It was never about the calls we'd received prior. Just the call we were about to answer. Ring. 911, what's your emergency? Now that I've spent a few moments hyping up my story, and hopefully got in your attention, I want to rewind to 2020, May. The lockdowns are in full effect, and everyone and their mothers are hunkered down in their homes, ordering takeout and going out for groceries and medications. I myself, being happily married and a father of two wonderful children, was blessed enough to be able to work from home in my office, pretty much spending every day, Monday through Friday, working on documents, as well as scheduling appointments for clientele. I remember this being a Thursday afternoon, because that was the day my wife was working 12 hours. She's a registered nurse, and works at the local hospital, which, as you probably already guessed, it was jam-packed with sick patients. As for my kids, they were over at my sister-in-law's house, and I'm just there munching on some Chex Mix and reading an email I received from one of my co-workers. Out of nowhere, I see the screen turn on on my phone, and I notice a really long number. Now, I normally almost never answer calls from numbers I don't recognize, but for whatever reason, I decided to answer anyways. Most likely because I was pretty bored and just wanted to get my mind off of work. As soon as I answered, 
palms and fingers still oily and salty from my crunchy snacks, I'm hit with a very aggressive voice. This is going to pretty much be what I remember the conversation going like, so the wording isn't going to be exact, but you get the idea. I answered, and I said, Hello? Who is this? Hey, do you speak Spanish? The voice on the other line said. I answered no, telling him I barely remembered the words I was taught in my high school Spanish class, and all of a sudden he starts yelling in Spanish. This is then followed by a lot of bad words and vulgarities in English. Then, a line that made my heart drop. We have your wife. Do as we say, and I promise nothing will happen to her. Then, I heard a scream of a woman in the background, crying for help, and yelling out things that were hard to understand. The man begins to speak again and tells me that if I weren't to wire him $10,000 in the next hour, I would never see my wife again. You can already imagine the scene. I'm shaking, heart racing like a race car in NASCAR, and I'm desperately trying to catch my breath. Please, no. Put her back on the line. Don't you dare do anything to my Marianne. Obviously not her real name, just making one up for this story. Regardless, I made the foolish mistake of saying her name, and I begged and cried like I'd never done in my life, as he begins explaining the process of wiring money to him, and all the while I'm starting to think. My wife was at the hospital. How in the world could she have been taken by someone who is now demanding money? I don't know, but I foolishly grab my car keys, and I begin walking outside into the driveway. In that moment, my sister-in-law is pulling up with my kids, and she sees the look of panic and fear in my eyes. The man on the line asks me who I was talking to, and then goes further to say that if it was the police, that was it. In that moment, I put my phone on silent and tell my sister-in-law someone had taken my wife. She looks at me, and then she explains she had just spoken to her no less than three minutes ago to advise her the kiddos were being taken back to me. Still on mute, I tell my sister-in-law who is calling, and that's when she says, She's fine. Hang up, and let's call the police. The man on the line is asking me why I wasn't speaking, and then begins to curse at me yet again. This is when I finally hung up, and immediately I phoned for my wife, who answered me on the second ring. Thank the Lord, she was okay, and she was on her break about to go back to work. I pretty much gave her a spark notes version on what had just occurred, and she manages to relax my nerves my kids staring at me like I was some sort of madman. Long story short, I did phone the police, and I explained what had happened word per word, and the police officer I spoke to tells me that it was an extortion scam. She explained it was common, and that criminals in Mexican jails will bribe the security guards for cell phones, and then they'll dial random numbers, until they successfully connect to someone. Then, using a recording of a woman screaming for help, they trick you into thinking they have one of your loved ones, finally demanding money. I couldn't believe it, but as I mentioned before, I looked this up online, in articles, videos on YouTube, and experiences that I read, and they were almost identical to mine. So that's pretty much the whole story. I never have received a phone call like that ever again, and I now have a filter set up on my phone which blocks international calls, as well as spam. Has anyone else listening to this had this sort of experience, or do you know someone that might have? It would be interesting to see if any of my fellow Creepy Fox listeners got a story to share. I downloaded Tor. Yes, the mother of all evil, Tor. After stumbling around for some time, I found my way to a cache of randomly placed links. There was one called More Power to Those Strong-Willed Ladies, and... Being a sucker for a good advertisement, I clicked on it. I was disappointed at first when I saw that this was like any other random chat room. But what they were talking about was not normal at all. Hello, my dear fellows. Welcome to the place where these strong-willed ladies give up their bodies for our satisfaction. I couldn't help but laugh when I read the message. It felt like I was in a virtual circus or something. Start sending in your requests. We work on a first-come, first-serve basis. All these messages came rushing in from different users. Make her go bald. 
I want her nails taken off ASAP. Poke her eyes out. Burn, 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 burn. Why is her skin still intact? Peel it. Now. I don't like her boobs. I think they're too big. Let's check if she has some silicone in them, shall we? Give her a snake tongue. Give her a third eye. No pinkies. No promises. I think she needs a nose job. Cut it off. Engrave a flamingo on her thigh. Female circumcision for the win. These messages already seemed disturbing. But the real unsettling part was yet to come. I couldn't understand what they were all talking about. So I finally decided to ask, What are you guys doing? Almost everyone in the chat ignored my message and kept sending the same weird requests. Cut her nipples. Use the branding iron on her, please. And could you write whore this time, please? Could you pull her hair out, please? Boil her hand. Use the taser on her. What are you guys doing? This time, someone noticed me. Are you new here? Yes. Oh. They sent me a direct message. Hi, it's me from the chat room. Hey. What do you want to know? What is everybody talking about there? Who is she? And why are they all saying that? You seriously don't know what's happening here? No, I don't. Then what are you even doing there? And how did you get access to that chat room? I just wanted to explore the dark web. And the link to the chat room just randomly popped up in front of me as I was looking around for something fun. Interesting. So you don't have any idea what's going on in there? No. Seriously, I don't know. Could you please tell me now? Do you have the other link as well? Which one? The one that leads to the video. No. Which video are you talking about? I was getting curious now, but little did I know that I would have been better off not knowing the details. I've been scarred for life ever since, and it is all because of my undue curiosity. Do you really want to know? Yes. Really? You don't really seem like the kind of person who would be happy to find out. I want to know. Okay. But it's dark. And I hope you won't freak out after this. Oh, don't worry about me. I can handle it. Just go ahead, please. So, in the chat room, you were just linked to a red room. You know what a red room is, right? No. I knew I would sound dumb. But I really didn't know. It's a place where sickos can play to watch live stream videos of rape, torture, murder, and worse. I was mortified at this revelation. But I don't know how you got into it without paying. I don't know. Do they torture people, or is it just acting? I really wanted them to say that it was all just scripted. No, it's all real. And I know how you got there. Anyone can enter the chat room. But only the people who have paid get access to the live stream, and thank God you didn't pay these fuckers. But how do you know all this? And do you come here often? You have access to the live stream, don't you? Yes, I do. Do you enjoy watching it all? No. Then why? I can't reveal anything. But trust me, I'm not one of them. I work for an organization, and I'm trying to hack into their system and stop them. I don't know why, but I believed him. Why haven't you caught them yet? Why are they still roaming around free? That's disgusting. We're trying. These people are too clever, and their security system is hard to crack. But don't worry, we'll catch them, and then they'll have to face the consequences of their actions. I hope they do. Can I ask you another thing as well, if you don't mind? Yeah. Where do they get their targets? And how do they choose their targets? They kidnap their targets. At the end of each session, everyone gives suggestions. But they just choose their targets randomly. It's always the easy ones. And do you want to know something else? Yes. I've noticed that it's always one of the members who attended the previous session. That makes us all vulnerable. But why do people watch them if it increases their chances of becoming the next target? It's the thrill that drives all of these people here. I was freaking out. Don't worry. I'm here for you. I'm here to protect you. 
Just tell me where you live and I'll make sure to assign someone the duty of keeping an eye on your house. This was when I made the biggest mistake of my life. I believed them and told them my address. I don't know why I did it. I still can't forgive myself for doing it. But everyone makes mistakes. We just talked for a couple of minutes more. And then they went offline. My doorbell rang the next day. I received a parcel, but there was no name of the sender on it. And I couldn't tell which courier company it had come from either. I looked around, but there was no one inside who could have placed it at my door. I took it inside and was disgusted to find a human hand inside. There was also a letter which read, We have found you out, brave woman. You'll be our next guest on the show. That line shook me to the core. I just picked up the box and ran towards my car. My breathing was shallow and my heart was beating fast. I drove the maximum speed limit and went straight to the police. I told them everything. Until then, I had not even thought once that the person I talked to the day before could have been the culprit. But they were. I was placed under supervision for my own safety and the police caught them a week later. The person admitted to 16 murders and multiple assaults. So please, guys, I beg of you, don't ever share your personal information with anyone over the internet. Not until you are 100% sure that the person on the other side is not a psycho murderer. Keep yourselves and your family safe. I went exploring and came across an old abandoned shed. I'll share the journal I found below. April 14th. Laura and I got into a fight today. Got a little heated, which sucks because things had been going really good lately, or so I thought. She got mad because I don't want to go to her mother's place this weekend. Four hour drive just to hear backhanded insults and sleep in a shitty bed? No thanks. Laura said I could use the time to engage with Sean. Whatever the hell that means. I just walk away. Hopefully she'll cool off up there. I guess I got the whole weekend to myself. What should I do? April 15th. Took a walk around the land, almost forgot how big it is. Haven't really explored it since I was a kid, I guess. Now I'm living here again. Married with my own kid. Still exploring. Found myself at the pond old Mr. Miller died in. Been 10 years or so since he drowned out here. Weird to think about. Even weirder. I swear I heard music while I was out there. Maybe someone is staying up at his old place. Thought it was abandoned after he died. April 16th. Grabbed my fishing gear on a whim this morning. Took another walk to the pond. I ended up staying out there all day. Was the most relaxing day I've had in God knows how long. I know it sounds crazy, but it was like the pond itself was singing to me. I took a nap on the bank. Was damn near dark by the time I woke up. Feels like I might be up late tonight. Almost makes me want to go back down there. Would probably fall right back to sleep. April 17th. Laura and Sean came back this morning. It was a little awkward between us at first, but things were okay. I asked if they wanted to take a walk, but she said they were too tired, so we hung around here all day. I understand, I guess. But I really wanted to show the pond to them. I've been thinking about it all day. Maybe it would help her relax. She got a little annoyed, I think, but agreed to go fishing tomorrow after work. Can't wait. April 18th. We got into it again. I was looking forward to our fishing trip all day at work. She knows I was. I was ready to go the instant I got home, even though she sat here all day. It was almost two hours after I got home before she was ready to go. So, yeah. I was a little grumpy about that, I guess, but that all went away once we got out there. The pond was still singing. It instantly put me in a better mood. They both said they couldn't hear it and wanted to leave after only a few hours. I could have stayed there all night. April 19th. Haven't been sleeping well these last couple of nights. I know it's crazy, but I feel like I'd sleep better out in the open air, down by the pond. It's that song. Feels like it was meant for me. I've been laying here for hours just thinking about it. I bet I could walk down there, take a quick nap, and be back before they even knew I was gone. April 20th. Last night's sleep was the best I've had in years. I did not want to go when my alarm went off. Just basking in the sun was like being wrapped in a warm blanket. Tried to get Laura to come with me tonight, and she said I was crazy. She's the crazy one. She can't even hear the song. I wonder where it comes from. Maybe I can follow that song and find the source. Bring it back here. I can't keep sneaking down to that pond, but I can't imagine going to sleep without it now. 
April 21st. What a great day. I called in and spent all day at the pond with a song. It took me a while to work up the courage. I've always been scared of water, and knowing Mr. Miller died out there didn't make it any easier. But I went out and I did it. I found the source of the song. It's the most pretty thing I've ever seen. Like a sphere made of the night sky. I brought it back and put it in the barn. Wouldn't want Laura to see it and do anything with it while I'm away. Not until I can show them. Once they hear the song, they'll understand. April 22nd. Brought Laura out here. She still can't hear song. Called it creepy. Ha <laughs> ha. I yelled at her. I apologize though. I know it's not her fault she can't hear it. Oh well. It gives me reason to sleep out here. Barn's not so bad. Being here next to it is even better than I would have imagined. So nice. So warm song. April 23rd. Been out here all day. Work call, but told them I'm sick and they can't hear Laura come for food. I wanted them to come eat out here with me, but they didn't want to Laura mad. But once I can learn and play song, they will hear it and I'll be good. April 24th. Laura came. Tried to take the source. Take the song. She tried to leave and find other people to take the song. I can't have that. I hit her. I hit Laura like the song said. Song said can't let anyone take it. Tried to let Sean hear the song, but he's just crying. Hope he hears soon. April 25th. Sean was crying. Couldn't hear song. Had to hit him. Make him stop and hear song again. Oh God, so beautiful. April 26th. Baby not moving Laura smell, but okay, song here, song here, song here. And that's where it ends. There was nothing in the barn I saw, but I definitely heard singing while I was there. The song is stuck in my head. I think it's best if I don't go back. The following is a transcript of a 911 call made at 9.17pm EST on June 15th, 2015, from a rural home in The call lasted approximately 6 minutes, from 9.17 to 9.23pm EST. The conversation is presented here in full, unabridged, although out of respect for the victims and their family, their identities and the location have been redacted. 911, what is your emergency? 911, what is your emergency? Hello? There are things in my house. They, they took my parents. All right, ma'am. Can you give me the address so I can notify a squad car and then send them to your location? All right, ma'am. The police are on their way and should arrive in a few minutes. Just remain on the line with me and try to stay calm, all right? Okay. What's your name? My name's... All right. Are you in a safe place right now? Yeah, I'm locked in my room. I'm hiding in the closet. All right. Can you tell me exactly how many people live there with you? It's just me and my parents, but they're gone. They took them. Who took them? Who's in the house with you right now? They're... <laughs> Please, try to calm down and tell me what the intruders look like. They're, they're not human. Did wild animals attack your parents? No, they're dead. Excuse me? They're dead. Thanks. Quips. They're rotting. They came out of the TV and they took my parents into the TV with them. Okay. It's all his fault! Who? Salesman. What salesman? The one who came to our house today and sold us that fucking box. One box? He told us to hook it up to our TV and it would... Oh shit, what did he say? He said something about how it would... Uh, Improve the viewing experience and uh, add a new dimension of heightened realism to what we watched. He said it was a new revolution in home entertainment and would place the viewer in the TV. We thought it was some 3D thing. My parents weren't interested, but he offered us a free one-week trial before we decided to buy it or not. I see. We set it up and started to watch a movie tonight, but... 
Please try to remain calm. Something went wrong. These things came out of the TV and grabbed my parents. I grabbed them into the TV. I tried to run outside, but the door wouldn't open. I ran up to my room. I think some of them are still in the house with me. Are you taking any kind of medication or uh, recreational substances? I'm not! All right, just try to remain calm. The police should be there any time now. I need you to try to... Oh, God. They're outside my room. They're trying to get in. Is there any way you can get outside? No. None of the doors or windows will open. I'm trapped in here. Oh, God. They're breaking the door down. Please, try to be quiet and remain hidden. The police will arrive any second. Oh, God. Don't let them get me, too. Hurry! Oh, God. They're in my room. No! Get away from me! Don't touch me! No! The call ends at this point. Police arrive less than a minute later. They found the residence which belonged to a couple and their 16-year-old daughter empty, with no bodies. There were signs of a violent struggle, and upstairs the door to the daughter's room had been broken down. Her closet was empty, but her phone was found lying on the floor. No trace of the missing three have ever been found, and they are presumed dead. Police found no evidence of the device the girl claimed her parents had installed into their television set. In this official report, one of the investigating officers noted that when they arrived, the film the family had been viewing was still playing on their television set. That film was Night of the Living Dead. No! It was a farm like no person has ever seen. More reports than ever came out from that place discussing something about a creature killing their horses. Taking their insides and basically draining them all the way down until there is no blood. First report ever from the farm was the one with the stalker from the forest, or so they called it. I was the officer on that case. My name is John Horlos, and I'm going to be discussing my weird case from my town of mystery. Now, most people in my town know me as Detective Harlos now, but this was like my first real case when I started working as a regular police officer in my small, yet kind of big town and farmhouse was the one place with the most reports of weird things happening, I'll tell you. The owner of the farm, Mr. Saints, or that is what the locals called him for being such a saint, never really doing anything wrong, just taking care of his farm like any owner would. The first call came in around 3.26 a.m. on a calm Saturday night. Here is how the call went. 911, what is your emergency? Yeah, hello. This is Farmer Saints here. There's there's something over in my forest just standing over there and staring right at me. It's disturbing the hell out of me. He is not even moving anything, just standing there like the little creeper. He is on my property. Could you send some over here to get that son of a bitch out of here? Have you tried asking him politely to move off of your property? Maybe he will answer kindly to your request if you ask him nicely, perhaps. What are you freaking kidding me right now? Do I sound like an idiot to you? Of course I've tried that. I, I tried yelling to him that this property was off limits, but it didn't budge. The bastard just stood there and nothing. Didn't even move a muscle. It's like he was deaf or something. So are you going to send someone over here or will I have to shoot the bastard with my damn revolver? Yes, sir. They will be there in a few minutes. Just watch him a bit longer so he won't get away. Can you do that for me? Of course I can do that. What do you think I've been doing this whole time, huh? Well, okay, just just hang in there. Call again if they haven't shown up in around 20 minutes. Can you do that for me, sir? All right, all right. The caller hangs up. There were no more calls that night except some store owners that were calling about an alarm system going off, but no more about the farmhouse. Apparently someone large and a well-musculated man tried stealing from the gun store again. 
This business with stealing at this place has to stop. The officers assigned to check out the farmhouse called in about who it was that was stalking the old man's house, or more like what was stalking it. To say the least, it was a mannequin. <laughs> Probably planted over there to scare the old man. You know these kids these days just don't know when to quit, do they? A day later, the old man, Mr. Saints, called yet again with an emergency, and here is how it went this time. 911, what's your emergency? Hi, it's Mr. Saints again. About that person that was stalking me yesterday. He is back again. Why is he back? I thought you people took care of that problem. Yeah, I thought we did, except when we went near the person, it wasn't a person at all. It was a mannequin. So I don't think you need to be frightened anymore. It's just a prank from some fellow teenagers. Fellow teenagers? Are you freaking kidding me? No, sir. My officers removed that mannequin thing from your property last night. It shouldn't be back there again. No, it shouldn't. Besides, this time it's not standing still, it's moving. So whatever your officers removed from my property last night, it's not the same thing now, is it? No, sir. I'll send some units down to your farm again to check it out ASAP. Just hang in there. My units will be there in ten minutes. Don't do anything dumb while you're waiting, like going anywhere near it or calling out to him. He could be armed and dangerous. Whatever. Just hurry up and tell him to lay off the donuts and get here quickly. The person's just pacing around like he is insanely paranoid. They'll be there soon. Just hang in there and stay on the call until they arrive. So what's he doing now, this very moment? Wait. Hold on, he's stopped pacing and is now walking towards the house, but in a very slow manner. Oh, shit, shit, shit. He is running towards the house now. I'm going to get my gun. Go inside the house and lock all the doors and windows. And don't do anything stupid like confronting the intruder. Window is heard breaking inside the house. No! Mr. Saint, are you still there? Whatever that thing was, it was no human I've ever seen. It was fast, large, and teeth bigger than I've ever seen on any wild animal. When it took off the hood, I could see its true face. Are the police officers there yet? I'm going to send an ambulance to your farm now. Hang in there. You'll be okay. Line disconnected. A few hours later in the hospital, Mr. Saints passed away after the loss of too much blood. I now realize that I could have done something more about this to prevent his death. I was eager to find out more about this case, so I asked the officers assigned to investigate the farm if they could please notify me if there is anything else they find besides all the blood and broken window. They agreed. A few days of investigation passed and they found a bit more than they had bargained for. All of his farm animals have been drained of their blood. Whatever that thing is, it's no human. I've never been one of those people fascinated by the dark web. As a 16-year-old girl in high school, I had much better things to do. I'd prefer to hang out with my friends and get my nails done than spend all my time on the internet searching for this dark web. One day at school, though, my friend Kelly was telling me about how her boyfriend was dared to go on the dark web. There was some weird stuff on there. He said it was really creepy with videos of cults and sacrifices, Kelly said. Why would someone even want to see that stuff? It's disgusting, I said. Yeah, I wouldn't, that's for sure, Kelly said. At lunch that day, all my friends were talking about Robbie's dare and how one of us should do the dare. I didn't say anything as I did not want to even think about having to go on the dark web. Rape, killers, weapons... I knew what was on the dark web and I wanted none of it. Hey guys, maybe Charlotte should do the dare, my other friend Christine said. Heck no guys, I'm not going on that creepy website, I said quickly. They all started chanting now, do it, do it, do it, do it. People were starting to stare as I turned red. Finally, after more people started to join in, I gave up. Fine, I'll go on that stupid website, I screamed. They all started to cheer with Kelly saying, Okay, but just to make sure you do, you have to FaceTime me while you're going on. And don't worry, I'll have Robbie send you a link, she said with a smile. I was furious with them but didn't say anything. Who cares? 
I'll just close my eyes when I see anything bad. They didn't say I had to look, I thought. That night, I got a text from Robbie, giving me a link to a website. He also said in the text, good luck. I got goosebumps reading it, but I wasn't going to chicken out as I knew my friends would never let me forget it. I FaceTimed Kelly as I was loading my link onto my computer saying, This is so stupid. Can't believe I let you guys talk me into it. Oh, don't be like that. How about this? You only have to click on one site on the web, and that's it. I'll tell everybody you went on and we'll all have a good laugh, Kelly said on the phone. The link loaded and I was taken to a black screen with a skull in the middle and a whole bunch of links, all in red. I gulped as I decided to click on the third link. I was taken to some kind of auctioning website. It didn't seem bad at first, but then I read the auctions. The auctions had female names attached to them with a link. I clicked on a random link which had a picture taken from a car of a girl walking home from school. She looked about my age with dark brown hair and green eyes. It had a description underneath that said Tiffany Smith, age 16, high school, Adelante High, parents, Martha and Gordon Smith, hair color, brown, eyes, green, body description, small but packaged with good sized breasts and small waist, price, 20000 What do you see? Kelly said on the phone. Eh. It's some kind of sick auction where they're selling girls, I said in a shaky voice. Are you serious? Call the police right now, she screamed on the phone. I was about to hang up and dial 911. I froze as I saw a name on the top of the list. Charlotte Miller. I freaked out and started to cry. I don't know why I did, but I clicked on the link next to my name. The picture was also taken from a car of me walking home from school. The description said, Charlotte Miller, age 16, high school, Spring Hill High, parents, Cindy and Harry Miller, hair color blonde, eyes brown, body description, excellent body with curvy hips and great sized breast. Price, 60000 I screamed and started to cry. Kelly tried to talk to me, but I couldn't hear her. I hung up the phone and ran to my parents' room. They heard me and ran out of their room before I could even come in. I told my dad about the website, which he and my mom checked on. They called the police shortly after. After looking at the website also, they said there was nothing they could do. The link was untraceable, so they couldn't figure out where the website came from. They said they would keep an officer nearby watching my house in case someone came. After that, they left. I slept in my parents' room that night. I didn't get any sleep as the image of me walking home from high school and the description of me were all burnt into my mind. How do they know all this? Were they going to come for me? I thought the whole night. I told Kelly and my friends everything that happened as they all listened in shock. They apologized for making me go on the website and said that we should all hang out after and go shopping to get my mind off what happened. I agreed as we made plans to meet at the mall at four. I asked Kel if she could walk home with me, but she said she was getting a ride from her mom. Panicking, I called my parents and asked if they could pick me up, but they weren't even home from work as they were stuck in traffic. I somehow got the courage to walk home by myself. As I started walking to my house, you'll be okay. You're only 15 minutes away from your house and it's the afternoon. No one is going to do anything with people around. I thought to myself as I walked. As I walked, though, I could see out of the corner of my eye a man walking behind me fast. I started to speed up my walking, but he followed and got faster as well. I freaked out and started to run and didn't look back. I ran all the way to my house as I fumbled for the keys to the front door. Just as I was about to put the key in, I felt a prick in my shoulder and the world faded to black. I woke up to find myself in a dark room, lit only by a computer right in front of me. In the computer, I saw that it was on Google Meet with at least 50 people in it. When I tried to move myself, chained to the ground, I screamed and pleaded for help the computer with no avail. Then as I looked at the camera, I saw a figure emerge from the shadows. He wore black jeans and a black hood. I couldn't see his face in the dark. He came up right behind me and spoke in a deep voice to the computer. 
How much? I saw in horror as the people in the meat started numbering off prices. 60,000, 80,000, 90,000. The biggest price came shortly after 115,000. There were no prices named after that. Then the man spoke. Going once. Going twice. Sold. Two days later, Kelly stares at the poster in her hand. Tears in her eyes as she reads, missing. Charlotte Miller. She cries even more as she sees the smiling picture of Charlotte on the poster, looking so happy with her glistening blonde hair and brown eyes. Charlotte, I'm so sorry. When I was around 20 years old, I was living in Michigan. I always had a big appetite for horror reads, so one day I was reading about some spine-chilling experiences when I came across some stories of people who had found extremely disturbing stuff on the dark web. This intrigued me. I wanted to see what the hype of the dark web was all about. I called a friend and asked him about the dark web and how to access it. He was a bit skeptical at first, but after the call ended, I received a message from him explaining how it worked. I made dinner, took it to my room, and turned on my laptop. I had a gut feeling that this wouldn't end well, but I just ignored it. Finally, I reached the dark web. A lot of notifications popped up on my screen at once. I clicked on one of them, and it was some sort of chat room. They were all talking about the most random stuff ever, and then suddenly, one of them noticed me there, and I got a direct message from someone named Ronald McDonald. The conversation, and what ensued after, was the worst thing I'd experienced in my life. The chat went as follows. Hey there, newbie. What brings you here? Hi. I just wanted to see what the hype was all about. Oh, you mean the hype of the dark web? Yeah. Oh, don't worry. You'll find out soon enough. By the way, do you want to play a game? No, I better leave here, as there's nothing much to see here. Hey, come on, girl. Give it some time. You won't regret it. This should have been the first red flag for me. But I was too dumb to notice it. How would he guess that I was a girl, when I had used my boyfriend's name as my username? Okay. What's the game? Two truths and a lie. Oh, I know that one. Let's do it. You're going first. Okay. Two truths and a lie. One, I am adopted. Two, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Three, I grew up on an island. You weren't the first person in your family to go to college. Come on. How did you know that? Well, I have my ways. This message came with a cringy, winking gif. He also sent me an image. I was hesitant to download it and open it at first. But then I did, and I was shocked to see that it was a picture of the college that I went to. What the fuck, dude? You're creepy AF. How are you doing that? I was dumbfounded. There was no possible way for him to know about my college. But I didn't want it to stop there. I wanted to check if he was sure. Or was it just a lucky guess? Can I have another turn? Sure. Two truths and a lie. One, I went to prom wearing a red gown. Two... I can hold my breath underwater for two minutes. Three, I am the fur mama of a Shepsky, a German Shepherd and Siberian Husky mixed breed. Oh, that's easy. Really? Tell me then. I'm waiting on you. I smiled because I thought I had outsmarted him this time. He was taking too long to respond, and it made me believe that the college stunt was just a lucky guess. Didn't you go to prom in a dark blue silk dress? You looked pretty in it. Or should I say, yummy. By the way, say hi to the little fella for me. What's his name again? Buddy, if I'm not wrong. He was right about every single detail and I was freaking out. My hands were trembling. Okay, stop with these fucking tricks now and tell me how you know all this. Dark web isn't that boring after all, is it? Hey, I asked you something. Okay, my turn now. Two truths and a lie. One... I am a cannibal. Two, my fridge is stocked with human meat. Three, my next meal will be you. Stop messing around. 
I know you're trying to play with my head, but trust me, you're doing it to the wrong person. I tried to close the window, but it wouldn't close. This guy had somehow hacked my laptop. Hey, that's cheating. You can't leave the game like this, but it's okay. I'll give you another chance at it because I cheated too. Instead of giving you two truths and one lie, I gave you only truths. I didn't reply. I was still trying to close the window. I even tried shutting off my laptop, but it wouldn't shut down. You're hacking my laptop, aren't you? Stop it now. You won't find anything on my laptop. Ah, oh, don't be mad. You know what? When you're mad, your body releases adrenaline. And let me tell you some inside info. Adrenaline makes the meat dry and I prefer my burger patties soft and moist. So please, my happy meal, don't stress yourself. Oh, shut up. I typed, but it appeared on the screen as, Sure, my master. Your wish is my command. I was disgusted to the core. At last, when nothing else worked, I just closed the laptop screen so I wouldn't have to look at all the messages he was sending me, which included all sorts of gifts and pics. But closing the screen didn't stop him either. Somehow, he figured out that I had done it, and he started to send me weird voice messages which kept playing on their own. I will come for you, my happy meal. My happy, happy, happy meal. Happity bappity meal, he sang. This singing continued for about two minutes and then he stopped. This was enough adventure for me and I promised myself that I wouldn't visit the dark web again. But the worst part was yet to come. So a couple of days passed and I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my bedroom door slamming shut. Then I heard loud footsteps running downstairs. I went to the kitchen to grab a knife, but all my knives were gone. That's when I heard sirens. My neighbors had called 911 because they had seen someone trying to break into my house. They described him as a weird looking clown holding a stack of boxes in his hands. I was scared shitless. To top it all off, I found the boxes and the note stuck to the wall in my room. It read, I'll come again to see you, my happy meal. I spent the night driving around. I did not want to go back to my house. In the morning, I took my stuff and moved out. The event still haunts me, so whoever's reading this, please don't ever go on the dark web searching for fun. It's full of crazy shit. It's kind of a running joke in my office that I always get the weirdest calls. And it's true. One of the more interesting ones I got was from a drunk guy who meant to call the cops and was trying to file a noise complaint about his own party. While some of my calls can be pretty strange, they're usually pretty tame. I've been pretty lucky because I haven't had too many disturbing or sad stories to tell from my years of working as a 911 operator. If you're looking for something like that, I can point you to several of my colleagues because unfortunately, there's no shortage of those in this industry. The call that particularly sticks in my mind is one that I took about a year or two ago. I can honestly say that it's one of the most frightening experiences of my entire life and think it's going to stick with me forever. It had actually been a fairly slow afternoon that day. I know it sounds kind of insensitive, but if you're not taking a call, the job can get pretty boring. I got stuck covering my friend's evening shift and I didn't expect things to get more interesting. I was counting down the minutes until my shift ended when a call came through my line. I put the headset on and ran through the usual script. 911, what's your emergency? I asked. I think there's someone in my house. The voice sounded like it belonged to a young child. My heart sank. Calls from children were always the worst. We're trained to get as much information from each caller as possible. This makes it easier to more fully understand the situation, as well as figure out which emergency services we need to dispatch. What's your name, sweetie? I kept my voice calm and upbeat. There was no need in scaring them any further than they undoubtedly already were. Elizabeth, she said softly. I think she might have been crying. That's a beautiful name. Mine's Amelia, even though I didn't show it. I was beginning to get nervous. This is very important. Can you tell me what's happening right now? The line was quiet for a moment, but then Elizabeth started talking. I think someone's in my house. 
Where are your parents? I asked. They're not home. I'm not sure where they are. I was pretty angry when I heard this. What kind of parents leave a little girl home alone this late at night? Is there anyone else there with you? Yeah. I think they're looking for me, Elizabeth began, but her voice abruptly stopped at the very end of her sentence. Had it not been for her quiet, frightened breaths, I would have thought she or whoever else was there hung up. They said my name. She was definitely crying now. Where are you right now? I heard a door close. In my parents' closet. She spoke a little louder now, probably thinking that the intruder wouldn't be able to hear her from in there. I hope she was right. I was glad she knew to hide. A lot of kids freeze up in dangerous situations like this, especially if their parents or an older sibling aren't there. I asked for her address, which she gave me. But for the sake of privacy, I will only say that Elizabeth's house was in a fairly nice neighborhood in my area, and it wasn't far from the police station, which was very helpful. Elizabeth, just focus on my voice. I need you to try and relax. I'm sending the police to your house right now, and they should be there in about five minutes. Can you hold on until then? Even though I would usually try to get a little more information about the intruder, I always tend to err on the side of caution when children call 911. I'd much rather send someone and have it be a false alarm than risk their safety. Elizabeth did not answer my question, and it took her longer than I was comfortable with to respond. When she did, it was only one word. Listen. I heard the phone crackle as she brought it away from her ear and held it out in front of her. At first, I didn't hear anything. But as I focused on the background noise, I noticed a lot of whispering. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but it definitely sounded like it was coming from more than one person. I hoped the police would get there on time. As much as I help people with my job and as many lives as I've saved, it's always so frustrating that I can't do anything myself other than wait and talk. Elizabeth's voice came out in hushed sobs. He's coming up here. Please help. The police are almost there. I need you to be quiet so he doesn't hear you. You're going to be okay, sweetie. I promise. She seemed to calm down a bit. Everything was quiet for a moment, save for the whispering, which was much louder now. I still didn't know what they were saying, but I was sure it was coming from multiple people. I could pick out at least three distinct voices. When I heard a door creak open through the phone, my heart leapt. Elizabeth screamed and I knew that the intruders had found her. I was so scared for her and I desperately hoped that someone would be able to help her soon. Are you okay? I need you to tell me what's going on. I was trying and failing to stop my voice from cracking. I couldn't let her know that I was afraid. There's a man, Elizabeth whispered. He has really long legs and a really big smile. <laughs> my imagination was running away from me. I pictured this poor girl alone in the closet as an impossibly tall man towered over her. I heard another bang coming from somewhere in the house and someone yelling, Police! Thank God. I could hear Elizabeth crying as the whispers intensified. I still didn't understand how she only saw one person. There had to have been more than four. He isn't touching the floor. The line cut off. I frantically tried to reestablish the connection, but no matter how many times I tried, I was met with only silence on the other end. I would like to close with a message to any parents reading this. Please, please don't leave your young children home by themselves. I haven't heard anything about Elizabeth or her family in the years since this happened. The police only found the phone. I have been living in San Francisco since I was seven years old. Although I am 20 years old, talking to strangers was something that I could not do. I always found it hard to make friends as I never approached anyone myself. Even the people who came up to me would eventually go away because of the dead vibes that I give. That is why I was never much into online dating apps either. If you had not figured it out, I am an introvert. I had only one good friend since childhood, Molly. It was a Saturday night, almost two years back. As usual, we put on some weirdly boring movie, sitting on the couch in the living room. 
We watched the movie when my phone beeped, and I got a message. Someone had matched with me on that app, and now he left me a text. Molly had made a profile of mine on some dating app that I had completely forgotten about. It was all for fun, and I never even opened it. Usual Susan would have ignored the message. But we wanted to try something new since our boredom was at its peak. Molly wanted me to reply to him, and to be honest, his profile picture looked good. From what I could see in the picture, the guy was tall and well-built, and his complexion was complementing his facial features. I could see half of his body and I made my assumptions. Well, what bad could happen? And I replied. We talked for a bit, the usual talk that you do at the start. He was flirty, and I was what I was best at. Awkward. After almost half an hour of talking and getting to know each other, he sent a message that made my body shiver. Pink looks good on you. How did he know that I was wearing pink? Neither did I ever tell him where I lived. How did he know? Was he watching us? Or was it just a coincidence? Molly assured me that it must be a coincidence, and that it was nothing to worry about. We were in the middle of this discussion when I received another text. Who is the girl sitting next to you? That was it. I jumped from the couch and closed all the open windows. He was there somewhere, and I was scared to the core. And this time, Molly was too. I gathered myself up and decided to message him. Who are you? And are you stalking us? You do realize I can report you, right? Well, that was only a threat because I could not report him. I did not even know his real name. All the dating app showed was his fake name, Mr. Joker1514. Who the hell was he? And what did he want? We waited and waited, but he did not message again. Maybe he got scared. Whatever the case was, I felt relieved when he did not text. The next day, I had almost forgotten about last night. Molly and I dozed off on the couch and got up feeling famished. We decided to go to the restaurant for breakfast. We went out and got into our car. Molly forgot her phone upstairs and I waited in the car for her to come back. While waiting in the car, in front of my house, I noticed a car. It was a black Mercedes. I had not seen that car in the neighborhood prior. I was still figuring out what I saw with my half-asleep brain when Molly came back, and I forgot about the car at all. We drove to the breakfast place while I admired the beauty of the streets of San Francisco. I accidentally looked into the side mirror of the car and saw the same black car following us. I went into panic mode and told Molly about it. It's okay. It might be a random car on the road. Chill, she said but I knew it was not a random car. We arrived at the place shortly and sat at a table while waiting for food. I was continuously looking right and left. My eyes were searching every corner of the place to find something or someone out of place. Finally, we got our food and I ate nervously. Molly continued to assure me that things were fine and that I did not need to worry. When we asked for the check, we were told that our food was already paid for. It did not sit right with us. When we questioned about who paid, the waiter gave us a note. He said the man that had paid asked to give this to me. I asked about how he looked, to which the waiter replied, tall and handsome. With shaky hands, I opened the note. I knew it was the same guy. The note said, meet me at the Golden Gate Park tomorrow at noon. And I received a text right after that. Come alone if you want things to go smoothly, else your friend might be in danger. That was a freaking threat. I knew I had to call upon the authorities as the matter was out of hand now. But again, I was scared. That man was capable of anything. That I was sure of. I called the police, and I was told to go meet him at the location. The police had eyes on me at all times, and this was the only way of catching the stalker. At precisely 12 o'clock, I was at the park and received another text. So you are stubborn. I told you to come alone, and yet you disobeyed me. Now bear the consequences.
That text message made me freeze. I was petrified. I ran to the police who were with me at that time and told them what happened. By the time we went home, Molly was heavily bleeding. She was knocked out and lying on the floor in blood. Paramedics arrived at the right moment, and she was taken under care. According to her, someone threw a rock at her head from the window that knocked her out. It was obvious that it was the same psycho man who was stalking us. Proper investigation took place, but police found no one. Since that day, we have never been contacted by Mr. Joker 1514. It was as if he had vanished from the face of the earth. But I am glad he did. And I am so thankful that Molly was all right. July 2017. Four teenagers went missing in New Hope, Pennsylvania. I worked the overnight shift at a Wawa in the area. And from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., we get all types. Normal obnoxious drunks, cops, and the occasional construction worker or gardener in for their morning coffee. So when yet another customer came in covered in dirt, I figured he was just another hardworking man in a blue collar job. He had been in before, so we made small talk and he went on his way. That was Friday. I didn't see him on Saturday, but then Sunday, he was in again. He got food and a drink and after the normal hi, how are you? He went on his way again. Monday comes and I'm working like normal when a few cops come in for coffee and you can tell something's wrong. We got a lead on those missing teens, they said solemnly. We're searching a farm down the road. All of our hearts sank. It had been days since they went missing, so they were slowly losing hope. But this confirmed our worst suspicions. The cops were out there all night, stopping in occasionally to update us whether or not they were actually supposed to. They brought in dogs and eventually found them. Twelve feet down and covered in concrete, it was bad. At the scene, they could only identify two of the teens based on their clothing, but there were enough bones to imply that all four were down there. Everyone was devastated. Then, the cops asked for our security tapes. Why? We asked, confused. We haven't had anyone suspicious. It was then that they revealed that the killer, a guy named Cosmo DiNardo, had in fact been in our store Friday night and again on Sunday. His cousin actually helped him kill, but he wasn't in the store. The dirt-covered man was a murderer. I was floored, and when I left work, I looked up a picture of the man they arrested. It was him. He was covered in dirt because he had just buried the bodies, and I had made small talk and wished him a good day. Part 2 I've struggled with mental issues for most of my life and have ended up in mental hospitals because of it a couple times now. While there, I made a couple of good friends, and we would tell each other stories and random things about us. One of my friends had briefly been in jail with Cosmo DiNardo. Apparently, even though he seemed completely normal when I met him, he has completely lost his mind, lashing out and talking to himself the whole shtick. So this happened about two years ago, and it still gives me the chills when I think about it. Before I explain the story, it's important to understand the layout of the second floor of my home. When you walk up the stairs, the first room is a bathroom, and then it's my room then my parents' room. So usually I wake up once a night to go to the bathroom and my parents never notice since they sleep like actual babies. Nothing will wake them up other than the sunlight in the morning, a really loud alarm or a light turned on on the second floor. So anyway, I wake up and go to the bathroom as usual and to avoid waking them up, I do not turn on the light. The toilet is close to the opposite wall from the door, so you have a clear view of the door when you do your business. So I finished what I needed to do, and then I turned towards the door, and oh god, there he is, only visible by the moonlight. I saw a very tall man in a baby mask, kind of like the mask Eleven wears in Stranger Things. I was so in shock that I didn't even scream, I just stared, and he stared back. After what felt like forever, he slowly puts his finger up to his mask and does a shush motion, tilted his head, and raised a knife as a threat. I felt like my heart dropped and I nodded. Then he took a step towards me and whispered, Don't let the bed bugs bite. And then left the bathroom. I heard him slowly walk downstairs, open the front door and shut it. I immediately checked out the bathroom window, which looks down on my street, to make sure he had actually gone outside and was not still inside. I saw him wave at me and then run off. 
I ran out of the bathroom and into my parents' room to wake them up, told them what happened, and they called the police. They found him a couple hours later, completely high, and with a couple of stolen items. He didn't steal anything from our house, though. Anyway, every time I go to the bathroom at night now, I close the door, turn on the light, check the shower, and do my business. This happened to me last spring. I live in a quiet and wealthy part of North London, and I attend a very academic, all-girls school in my neighborhood. Since my school is really academic, we were required to complete the Bronze Duke of Edinburgh. It's like a program that gives you extra credit in life, and it's part of the school curriculum. And as much as I didn't want to do it, I sort of had no choice in the matter. So, our school is divided into six buildings. Four with only classrooms, a drama department, the music block, and the sixth form building, with a sports department on the first floor. I believe in America the sixth form are the junior and the senior years. The sports department also has a huge sports hall, a bunch of offices, and a rather small playing field. The playing field is at the very back of our school campus, and it's never really used much. Anyways, our first ever expedition for Duke of Edinburgh was coming up in a couple of weeks' time, and we all felt pretty confident about it. But since we were a useless bunch of teenagers, our teachers thought that it would be helpful for us to practice setting up and sleeping in the tents overnight. I didn't like the sound of that at all. It's just utterly creepy to stay in school overnight, especially on some little playing field at the far corner of the campus. But my parents signed my permission slip. What can I say? So the day the sleepover rolled around, we had a double PE lesson that afternoon during which we went down to the creepy playing field to practice setting up the tents so that that night wouldn't be totally chaotic. The most disturbing part about that field was that it faces an abandoned building. Even though it was separated by a stone wall, it still looked weird. It was one of the only abandoned houses in the neighborhood. The creepy house was ginormous, and it was made out of red brick. Anyways, we sat down in a semicircle while the teachers explained to us how to set up everything. I was sitting in between my best friend, let's call her Kate, and my close friend, let's call her Izzy. So Izzy was making an abnormal number of dirty jokes referring to the teacher's speech about setting up the tent. Not gonna lie, they sort of made it really easy for us. Izzy and I are sitting there laughing like two absolute idiots, while everyone else was listening in silence, until one of the teachers said they would give us detention if we didn't behave. We giggled a little more but eventually we settled down. It was now starting to get very boring. Our semicircle faced the abandoned building, so I couldn't help my eyes wandering there every few minutes. Eagerly, I was waiting for the talk to end, when something in the background caught my eye. It was a figure standing at one of the top story windows in the abandoned building. I couldn't see whether it was a man or a woman at the time, because my eyesight is bad. All I knew was that the person was wearing something really dark, like a hoodie or something. As I continued looking at the blurry silhouette for a while, it seemed like the shadow was staring directly at me. I started freaking out a little, so I nudged at Izzy and I said, OMG, look. First she looked at me, and then at the window that I pointed at. But when I looked up, right after Izzy, I saw the opaque curtains move a bit, but nobody was there anymore. I also told Kate about what had just happened. Obviously, neither of them believed me and started teasing me. I laughed it off, but I still felt a tad nervous. We then attempted setting up our tents, and our lesson came to an end. Fast forward to later that evening, and it was really weird seeing the school without any students in it. But as I was approaching the field, I saw Kate, so I felt a bit better. I was in the same tent as her because she was in my group for the expedition. We then later discussed all our teenage girl stuff as we try to go to sleep. I often had trouble getting to sleep, even in my own bed. And as expected, I wasn't able to fall asleep easily in the tent. So I kept going through my phone until it was really late and I was sure that everyone was asleep, including Kate. I was starting to drift off around 2am, but then it started to rain. It was at that moment I understood that I should have been listening to the teacher's explanation of how to correctly put up a tent instead of Izzy's dirty jokes, because our tent was starting to fill up with water. I imagined that we probably hadn't zipped up the outer layer of the tent properly, 
So I gathered every bit of strength that I had left and I climbed outside, leaving my phone. I struggled for a while, but I ended up successfully zipping up the tent. By the time I had finished, I was soaking wet, so I decided to grab a dry hoodie from my PE kit. We stored our sports kits inside the PE department, which had been left open in case we needed the bathrooms. The halls were pitch black, so I was getting really creeped out. Anyways, I went into the changing room, switched the light on, and then changed into my dry hoodie. When I pushed down on the door handle in order to leave, for some reason it was stuck, and it wouldn't move. It felt as if someone was holding the handle on the other side. At this point, I started to freak out a little more. Me being the way I am, I asked quietly, Hello? No response. Now, even though I was quite scared, I could be savage and was also really strong. This time around, I asked in a very firm, clear voice, Is there anybody there? I'm not exactly sure what my logic was at the time. Like, did I actually think he was going to say, Yeah, it's Peter. Do you want a sandwich? But again, there was no response. I started trying to wiggle the door handle free so hard that it actually came off in my hand, which I thought was extremely odd since the building was very newly built. That, and the person didn't have to hold the door anymore because I was stuck and I couldn't open the door even if I really tried. At this point, the lights went off in the changing room. Now the situation seemed as if though it came out of a movie, but reality was catching up to me as I understood that somebody really was on the other side of that door because the light switch to the changing room was outside. To be honest, I was actually having a panic attack, so without thinking I started banging and kicking the door while screaming, help, at the top of my lungs, desperately hoping that a teacher or a security guard would hear me. But I think that only angered the other person, as I saw the part of the door where the handle was built onto slowly begin to turn. I immediately run to the other side of the changing room, it was like two meters away, and then I locked myself in one of the shower cells, which was the first place that I could think of. As soon as I locked the door behind me, I heard the door opening and heavy footsteps enter the room, which convinced me that it was a man. I tried to silence my breathing with my hand, but I don't think I did a very good job, as the footsteps soon stopped right before my shower cell. At first, I couldn't quite comprehend what he might be doing, but then I see an eye glaring at me through one of the gaps in between the door hinges. This was the most scared I'd ever been in my life. I screamed like there was no tomorrow. I was so lost because I didn't understand what I could possibly do to get out of here. But then it hit me. I was hoping I was strong enough to pull this off. I swung the door open so hard I slammed the man in the face. Now I knew the door was open because I didn't hear it closing. If he closed it, he would be stuck too. So I run out of that room and down the hallway while screaming so loudly that my own ears started to ring. Now that building was about 20 meters away from the playing field, so I run as fast as I could while screaming at the top of my lungs, which woke up the majority of people asleep in the tents. I had a panic attack and I couldn't breathe for a good 10 minutes. But later, I explained to the teachers what had happened. They ended up calling our version of 911, but the man was never found, probably because I'd given them plenty of time to escape. Everybody was sent home straight after that. However, I remember clear as day that as I was running away, I turned around and saw the figure in the dark hoodie that I had seen standing in that window earlier in the day. That night still haunts me, even as I write this out. I arrived at the 911 call center at about 6 a.m. to trade shifts with my friend Caden, who worked the night shift. Oh, thank the Lord, he laughed as I walked through the door. I was just about to die. I was so tired, he yelled. A lot of people in the center took the night shift because they say that's when the more interesting calls take place. Me, on the other hand, usually handle the more simpler calls. I guess you could call it and I like my job that way. Caden took his coffee from his desk, took a sip, and walked out of the center. I sighed and put the headset on and waited. As soon as I heard the phone, I immediately picked up and answered. 911, what's your emergency? I asked. Uh, my dog's leg is stuck in a fence and it's bleeding really bad. He sounded like he was a child, maybe seven or eight. 
I don't know who to call, the kid told me whimpering. What's your address? I asked him. He told me his address, and we figured everything out. Soon, it was rescued, and I guess they were fine. About 30 minutes later, I got another call. Grabbed the phone and answered it like usual. 911, what's your emergency? I just heard silence. 911, I said, more angered this time. What is your emergency? The voice on the other line whispered into the phone and replied with, Too late. And then he hung up. A few seconds after that call, I got another call. All I heard was screaming, followed by a loud slicing noise, and then silence. I held my breath, hoping it was just a prank. But I don't think it was. I got on my computer, trying to trace the call. Eventually, I did, and figured it came from a secluded forest in Colorado. We got some officers to go out there and check it out. What they found was frightening. It was a single dog with all of its legs chopped off, and a little boy impaled with a stick. Whenever they told me about it, I think I almost pissed my pants. Whenever I found all of this out, I thought about the earlier call. A little boy and his dog. Another day passes after the incident, and I'm at my house. I called in sick, which I never do, to take in everything that happened the previous day, all my thoughts hitting me like a tsunami. I don't know if it was the same boy from the call. Who killed him? Why did the killer do this? I don't know what happened, and I still don't. A few days later, and I came back to work, and hoping everything was back to normal. And of course, it wasn't. I got a call as soon as I sat down and put on my headset. Of course, I answered like always. 911, what's your emergency? My baby is choking. What's your address? I could hear wailing and coughing in the background. My address is one seven. We'll be there shortly, ma'am. I informed the EMTs and they drove there immediately. I got another call about 45 minutes later. 911, what's your emergency? I said. Too late, the man replied. Then he hung up. I traced the call yet again and it was another forest in Colorado. We had another police squad go down there and found something terrifying. A little baby in his high chair, dead, with blood pouring out of his mouth and other gory details, along with an older woman with slit wrists. I quit my job the next day and started working somewhere else. I was scarred in my experience as a 911 dispatcher, and I want to share my story on Reddit. Let me tell you, if you decide to be a 911 dispatcher and you're reading this, please reconsider. My son, Thomas, never had a shortage of friends. Always the class clown, always the likable, relatable, funny goof that he was. He passed away two months ago. He jumped off an overpass and landed on his neck. He was 17, and I'm writing this for him because he wanted me to. I know a lot of you know about the internet and the dark web and all that. The thing is, I didn't. And maybe if I had, my son would still be alive. Please stay off the dark web. The game is called Veritatum Desire, and I'm an American English speaker, but I believe it means something along the lines of to tell the truth in Latin. I only began to notice things after his last few months. Troubles at school, which he had never had. He sat behind a girl in his class and cut a chunk of hair off her head. He was suspended. I would look through the history on his computer to find violent videos, people being murdered and sodomized, video after video, white powder substance all over his room, salt lining his windows. We took him to the dentist because of an infection on one side of his mouth. The dentist examined him and pulled me aside to let me know that my son had pulled out and crushed three teeth in his mouth himself. The last straw was when I caught him in the bathroom about two months before he died. He was carving some sort of symbol into his arm on a live stream. I figured his odd behavior must be a cry for help, thinking maybe he was depressed or suicidal. 
He was hospitalized for a week and then released. Two weeks later, my son died. A month before my son died, every person in my family received an email. Each one read, Ask Thomas about the little girl who died down the street. Ask him what he knows. Make him tell the truth. The email came from an anonymous sender, and when confronted with it, Thomas began to get very nervous and visibly sick. Who sent it, Thomas? I want to know. If this is some sick prank to scare your little sister, it's not funny. I leaned against the counter and crossed my arms. The email pulled up on the laptop in front of my son. He kept his head low, avoiding eye contact with me, staring at his fingers in his lap. I don't know what it is, Mom. Probably some spam email or something, he muttered, almost looking up at me, but quickly averted his gaze. A spam email that happens to have your name in it and information on the crime committed down the street a few weeks ago? I don't think so. I glanced at the screen for a moment. So, do you know something you're not telling your father and I about this? I said, looking back at him again. No. Tears welled up in his eyes as he stared at the computer screen. I don't know anything. What is going on with you, Thomas? This is so unlike you. Please, if you're not okay, please just tell us. We want to help you. We want our Tom back. I put my hand in his, but he quickly pulled away and wiped his eyes quicker. I don't know anything, Mom. I already told you. I'm fine. He got up abruptly and started towards the doorway. Now... I could feel the tears begin to form in my eyes as I saw him walk away. My son was almost unrecognizable. He was skin and bones, purple bags under his eyes like he hadn't slept in days. His clothes hung and bagged on him as I saw him walk to the door. I love you, I squeaked out. He stopped for a moment and looked back at me. And I swear to God, I'd never seen more pain in someone's eyes than I saw in his in that moment. He let a tear fall as he turned away again, his back to me now. I love you, Mama, he croaked out before exiting the room quickly. He began to look worse as time went on, thin, frail, tired, fatigued. My husband and I found therapists, took him to doctors, pulled him out of school, and did everything we thought was right leading up to my son's suicide. About a week after his death, I felt like half of me was missing. I couldn't move or talk or get out of bed, and I didn't. All I could do was think about Thomas, and the guilt ate me alive. I knew my email had to be overflowing with emails from clients at work, and I knew I'd have to get back to work soon. For me, for my husband, for my daughter. Two weeks later, I finally checked it. At the very top of my inbox was an email with an anonymous sender and no subject. I began to tear up, wishing whoever it was would just leave me alone and let me grieve. But curiosity got the better of me and I opened it. I wish I hadn't. The email was nothing but nine black words that read, he did it and the game is not over. Nine one one. What is your emergency? He, I want help. He took Charlie to the room. My husband, he's drunk. Help, please. It's going to kill Charlie, my little boy. I need you to tell me the address, okay? Forty-five Elm Street, Brockton, Massachusetts. I hear him crying. Oh, please hurry up. He beats him every day. My baby is only seven. Do you hear his screams? Help us on the way, ma'am. Stay put. Just a few more minutes, okay? He has him tied up in that chair. He, he tied him up and now he, oh, God, he's, he's going to... Jonathan, no, don't hurt him! What's happening? Can you see them? I want you to tell me what you see, all right? Yes, I can see him from the window. He's, he's hurting him. He has, he has a baseball bat. He, he's hitting Charlie in the head with it. Please hurry. He's bleeding so much. That monster. He has the doors and windows locked up. I can't get in to save my baby. Almost there. Just hold on. He's going to kill him. He's going to do it again. I don't 
don't know what to do. I can't lose him. Oh, God. Again? Calm down and tell me, okay? What do you mean, kill him again? What is that sound? Is that your son, ma'am? Does your husband have any record of mental instability? I have been married to him for 15 years. He's a psychopath. He has wanted to kill Charlie since the day he was born. Let me forward this information, okay? Jonathan, please don't hurt him. Stop. Oh, God, stop. He has a saw now. He's cutting off his arms. Do something for God's sake, my baby boy. Help me, please. Help me. Hold on. The address. Are you sure you provided the right address? Yes, I'm positively sure. Why aren't you here yet? What is taking so long? I don't think he'll last long. There are fountains of blood flowing from his arms and head. We are trying to speed it up, but apparently they can't locate you. How is that even possible? I'm given the right address, for God's sake! I have given the right address! Alright, don't worry. They're looking for it. Do not panic. What are those loud thuds that I hear? It's him. He's banging Charlie's head on the table. You hear that? My little boy is dying! He's pulling him by the hair, and he keeps banging his forehead on the corner of the table. I'm sure he's broken his skull by now. Jonathan, please stop it! Please, I beg of you! The sounds are quite clear, as if you're close to them, are you? Yes, I'm at the window. I can see through the glass as my little boy gets weaker. You monster, you're letting him die! Ma'am, you have to tell me the address again. Are you absolutely sure it's the right house? 45 Elm Street, Brockton, Massachusetts. This is the address. Why won't you come? I beg of you, he's in so much pain. Oh, Lord, so much blood. Oh, my God, Charlie, Charlie. Oh, God, no. Ma'am, you need to tell me the house number you gave doesn't even exist. What's happening? What are those sounds? Why is Charlie screaming so much? It doesn't matter anymore. He's dead. Ma'am, I need the address. Tell me the correct address. Sophia! What did you do? What did you do? Hello? 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 I need help! I was gonna call 911, but it's already dialed. My wife! My wife, she! Our son! Help! He's not breathing! Sir, I need you to tell me the address, alright? 75 Oak Street, Brockdown, Massachusetts. Please, hurry! On the evening of December 19th, 2019, Sophia, age 35, made a call to 911, claiming that her husband had come home drunk and he was torturing their seven-year-old boy, Charlie, which eventually led to Charlie's death. However, the incident is not as simple as it seems. Sophia explained how her husband was torturing their child in the most brutal ways possible. The dispatcher could hear Charlie's screams and cries and the sounds came from close, as if Sophia were right next to Charlie. She informed the 911 operator that she was outside the house and spectating from the window. Furthermore, she kept giving the 911 operator an address that did not exist. She kept explaining what her husband was doing to their child while the dispatcher kept hearing the screams and the police searched aimlessly for the house. The incident is peculiar because the dispatcher heard 37-year-old Jonathan's voice over the phone. He sounded utterly shocked and devastated and quickly provided the right address. As soon as the police reached the house, Sophia was sitting motionlessly over Charlie's body, murmuring, he killed my baby, repeatedly. Both husband and wife were arrested and taken in for interrogation regarding this barbaric incident. The interrogation started with Jonathan, as Sophia seemed to be in a state of shock and would not speak a word. Jonathan confirmed that Sophia was not mentally well and had been seeing a therapist for many years. When asked for proof, he gave the location of Sophia's files and records, which confirmed that she had indeed been suffering from dissociative identity disorder. The arresting officer asked, Why did you leave her alone at home with a boy when you knew she wasn't well enough to care for him? Jonathan replied that a caretaker was supposed to be at home with her. Her name was Evelyn. Upon investigation, the police found 26-year-old Evelyn's dead body in pieces in the basement. It was clear that something was wrong with Sophia. When it was time to question Sophia, she kept repeating, He killed my baby! She kept describing the way in which her husband had killed the baby, 
repeating verbatim what she had told the dispatcher earlier. She would say nothing else. It was clear it was she who had been doing to Charlie what she described while she was on the call, not her husband. Forensics proved that it was indeed Sophia who caused Charlie and Evelyn's deaths. Her fingerprints were found on the baseball bat and the saw. It was also discovered that Sophia's first child had been killed by her former husband, Benjamin, in the exact same way she killed Charlie, which is why she kept saying he killed my baby. Her therapists claimed that Sophia's behavior was due to her past trauma, and her mind was trying to turn Jonathan into Benjamin because she had never reported Benjamin to the police. And so, she had never gotten justice for the death of her first child. The case was closed when Sophia was confirmed as mentally ill due to her inhumane actions. After several failed therapies, she was kept in an asylum. Jonathan was sent to counseling as well, as he was responsible for keeping a sick person like Sophia at home with his child, and for that, he also had to suffer legal consequences. Last night, at around 2.30 a.m., I was woken up by a phone call. I assumed it was spam, maybe my ex-girlfriend calling me to say something stupid and instinctively reached over to decline the call. My tired brain didn't even bother seeing who it was as I hung it up and went back to sleep. I got another call around five minutes later. I groaned and reached to decline it again, but this time I saw who was calling me. 911? Why was 911 calling me? I checked the time. It was 2.35. A call from the police at 2.35? Confused, I answered the call. Hello? I asked. I didn't hear anything at first. Hello? I asked again. Hi, a raspy voice replied. This would have been the part where I threw my phone across the bed, but for whatever reason I decided to keep talking. Who is this? I said, forgetting for a second that it was obvious. Didn't the number appear when I called? It's the police, you fucking idiot. I remembered trying to decline the call around this point, but the button didn't work. What the hell? I muttered to myself, hearing the person on the other end laugh to himself. Idiot. You're an idiot, the voice quietly said. Irritated, I asked. You don't sound like an operator. Oh, I'm an operator, all right, the voice dryly hissed but not one that's willing to kiss your ass anymore. This was confusing. What are you talking about? I said, trying to hang up the call again, but it wouldn't even let me power off my phone anymore. I was being forced to listening to some croaky voice spout a bunch of nonsense. The voice seemed to ignore my previous question and kept talking. I am an operator and I can do everything an operator can do. And more. The voice chuckled to himself again, before he kept going. I'm sorry for messing up your good night's sleep. But you need to know about something. What the fuck? I realized that whoever I was talking to, probably part of the police, and stopped myself at the last second. What should I know about you? There was another pause before the operator began talking again. Before I ask anything, do you remember everyone who called you today? Besides you, nobody called me today. Why do you ask? The operator breathed what sounded like a sigh of relief, but his voice made it hard to hear exactly what it was. Good. That means our plan is still working. You're not the only one who picked up so far, the operator said. Plus, the simple fact that you picked up pretty much forces you to go through with what we have planned. I managed to ask, what do you mean before I was interrupted by multiple notifications. I had received four or so text messages, all from different numbers. I opened up one of the messages without thinking. It was a house. The image looked like it was taken in the middle of the night. The sky was dark and none of the windows in the house had any light in them. It didn't look like any of the houses in my neighborhood, not even any houses I recognized from anywhere nearby. I opened up the other three texts, they all showed a similar image, an image of someone's house, taken in the middle of the night. What is this? I asked. I already said, you aren't the first one who received a call like this. 
These are all from the past four months, the operator replied. His gravelly voice seemed ominously quieter than before. You're looking at dead people's houses. I stayed quiet for a bit before replying, What? You're looking at dead people's houses. All of these people lost the game, so we killed them. You're not serious, are you? The operator laughed again. I hated his laugh. His scratchy, mocking laugh so much. You idiot. Of course we're serious. Do you want to see the bodies? No. No, I don't, I replied. Coward. Fine, you don't doubt that I'm a 911 operator, right? What kind of operator talks about killing people in some game? You're not an operator. You're a maniac. I found myself shouting suddenly. What the fuck do you want from me? Why did you call me? Ugh, fine. I confess. I may or may not be a 911 operator. There. Are you happy now? Please, leave me alone. Hang up the phone. Don't call back. I'll call the police on you, even if you're already an operator. The operator started cackling, and he kept cackling for way, way too long. Oh, you idiot! You blind idiot! What police? And that's when he hung up. I struggled to fall back asleep for a bit, especially when I got another text message from one of the phone numbers that was basically recording of the whole conversation. The message claimed that he said something that gave it away, but after listening to it quite a few times... I still can't find what he's talking about. But I'm scared. From what I've heard, 911 operators can track calls. Nine one one, what's your emergency? I am in a dilemma. What kind of dilemma? An intruder has entered my house. May I know from where you are calling? Sweden Street, near old GE Road. We have sent the team to your location. Have you seen the intruder around? Yes, I saw a shadow while taking a shower. Are you sure it was not your imagination? Yes, I am totally sure about it because the shadow moved. Wait, what? Did you just say the shadow moved? Where? Yes, the shadow was at the corner of the curtain while I was taking the shower. After I saw it, I was panicked and yelled to see if it was there. What happened next? When I heard no sound, I moved the curtain. All right. I needed to investigate if the door was open. Was the door open? Yes, the door was wide open. Where are you now? I'm locked in the bathroom! Did the trespasser lock you in there? No, I sealed myself inside. Why did you do that? I found the door open, so I closed it and sealed myself inside. So, from where did you get the cell phone? I have a habit of listening to music, so the cell phone was on the cabinet. Oh, okay. Where's the intruder now? I don't know. He must be roaming somewhere in the house. Okay, don't move. The intruder may hurt you. Okay, but please send the team as soon as possible. They will be there soon. Don't worry, you'll be safe. Yes, hopefully. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. But I have a security alarm at the entrance. How can anyone enter without knowing the passcode? It's clear that the intruder is someone you know. Do you have any enemies? I'm a chef. I don't have any enemies. Okay. But we had a party last night. What kind of party was it? It was my 25th birthday. I invited all my friends. Were all your friends from your workplace? No, some of them were from college. Okay, was there any friend who had any kind of jealousy issue with you? Or was there anyone who may have had a grudge against you? I don't think so. I'm scared now. I'm going to be okay, right ma'am? Yes, the police will be there soon. You're going to be okay, ma'am. I don't think so. What's wrong? The police arrived to find that the man had killed the caller and was sitting on the floor. The man was Daniel, the caller's ex-boyfriend. Daniel and Nancy were best friends since college. They got engaged. They had a great relationship, but Nancy finally ended up being cheated on by Daniel. Daniel, being a proud, overconfident man, was unable to handle Nancy's rejection when she found out. He apologized to Nancy and asked for a second chance, but Nancy rejected him and denied his request. Daniel's friends made fun of him for being rejected by a woman. Daniel decided to get revenge on Nancy, and so he crashed her birthday party and hid himself somewhere in the house. He snatched Nancy by her neck and drowned her in the bathtub. Disturbingly, before Nancy called 911, the man had hidden himself in the bathroom cabinet. I'm just simply here to share an experience I had back in 2016 when I went on the deep web. I remember it like it was just yesterday. 
I was on a scary stories binge and listening to a bunch of different narrators retelling people's experiences from the deep web. I reached a point where I couldn't contain my curiosity, so I decided to learn how to reach the deep web myself. I'll save you all the filler so I don't make this submission too long, but I got on and immediately got to researching a few links I found. First it was a website about buying different products. It listed a bunch of prices as well as the sorts of services they offered. I soon grew bored and went to a video sharing website. The videos themselves were really low quality. In comparison they were 144p, similar to what you can find here on YouTube. The videos that piqued my interest were the ones that were titled Join Us Part 1 and Part 2. They consisted of a series of what I like to best describe as promos that seek to recruit people for some strange cult I'd never heard of. I actually tried looking them up on the regular surface web, but I couldn't find any articles. Anyways, at the end of each video was an email that let you contact them. Yes, dumb me actually decided to give them a message and ask if this was truly real, or just some sort of elaborate video series made by a bunch of bored college students. To my surprise, I got an automated email almost instantly, and it advised me I would soon be connected with a recruiter. I waited, and about 15 minutes later I got a response. They told me about the process of joining, including the information I would need to reply back with in order to be part of their so-called society. Now let's face it, I wasn't really going to give them my personal information. So to mess with them, I made up some random info and sent that in, telling them to have a nice day. I never did receive a response back. Fast forward a few nights later, and I was having trouble sleeping. I blamed it on the date I had a few hours ago that saw me drinking some pretty strong espresso alongside my girlfriend. Well, I want to say it was around 2 or 3 in the morning, my cell phone started to ring. Silly me had forgot to put it on silent. Not thinking of checking the caller ID, I answer it in my typical grumpy voice, only to be met with heavy breathing. Hello? Who is this? If you're not going to say anything, then don't call me again. They then hung up. Whatever, it must have been a wrong number. Five minutes later, I'm awoken from my struggling slumber to another phone call. Now I'm starting to get angry. I respond with some not-so-kind words only to be met with music playing, and I'm not talking about the greatest hits. This music was played backwards and it sounded really creepy, almost like some sort of strange nursery rhyme. Ten seconds of this playing, I once again say hello, only to be met with a voice. It sounded as if it was coming from one of those voice filters. That wasn't really nice of you sending me that false information. We were genuinely hoping you would take our offer and join our group. Would you still like to join? I freaked out. I instantly hung up and blocked the number, checking my doors and windows making sure they were locked. Not sure why I did that. It's not like the person who called showed up to my house, but I guess it was just instinct. Safe to say I got no sleep, and instead I went over to my girlfriend's house where I had to explain over the next 10 minutes why I suddenly showed up to her place and freaked out. She was just as scared as me, but we tried to write it off as some weird coincidence. Fast forward to when I later returned to my house. I saw there was a missed call on my apartment house phone. Yes, I was still one of those who had a landline. It's because it came packaged with my phone and cable. Already forgetting the creepy call from earlier in the morning, I play the message expecting to hear some sort of telemarketer. Instead, it was the deep voice from earlier, asking me why I was playing so hard to get. I lost it. I went to the police, and I had them ask my phone provider if they could do some sort of reverse phone search. Unfortunately, they were unable to trace the call. Now, here's the strange part. Almost as soon as this began, it stopped. I no longer received any further communication from this group, nor did I ever get an email back. I still have the email in case anyone is interested in seeing it. I can even send anybody a screenshot if you want proof. Edit. I have no clue how they got my number, although I have some theories. 
I hadn't realized it until recently, but when you send emails using your email, it can display your name. For some reason, I thought it only displayed your email address. I guess that's how they looked me up. I mean, it's not a far stretch, considering how easy it is for people to find out more about you. Nine one one. What is your emergency? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. What is the problem? We were at a party, a college friend's party, and and go on, please. What's wrong? Justin is dead, and Paul's extremely injured, and and I'm hiding in his house. Okay, whose house is it? Can I have the address? Fifty one Jefferson Avenue, unit number two zero one. All right. And what is going on? How did your friend die? Bryce killed him. We were invited to a party at his house, and he... He killed Justin. He tried to kill Paul, too, but I tried to stop him and threw him into the pool. But I could barely manage to escape and save my own life. Is Bryce armed with any weapons? No, I I don't think so. He just grabbed a lawn chair and hit Justin on the head with it repeatedly until he died. And what about Paul? How hurt is he? He got in, like, two hard hits before I stopped him. But Paul was next to unconscious when I left. Are you hurt? Not yet, but Bryce is looking for me. He'll get to me shortly. I don't even know this house. I don't know where I'm hiding. It seems like a bedroom. I climbed upstairs to get here. All right, stay put. We'll be there shortly. Yes, please hurry up. I don't think I have much longer. Just stay calm. It will be all right in no time. I hear him. He's walking upstairs. He's close. What do I do? Move to a more obscure location, in a closet or under the bed if possible. But do not make a sound. All right. I'm under the bed. Sounds good. Stay there. Get away from me, you psycho! Sir, are you all right, sir? Oh my god. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. What happened? He he came inside. He pulled one of my legs and forced me out from under the bed. He had a knife and tried to cut my throat. I kicked him in the face hard and now I'm running outside. Okay, get out of there. He might be following you. I'm outside. Paul is still lying beside the pool. I don't think he's going to make it. There's too much blood. Sir, you need to get to safety until we get there. Oh no. Here he comes. I think he saw me. Run to safety, quick. He saw me, and he's coming after me, and he's carrying a baseball bat! How long until you get here? Almost there. Help! Help! 19-year-old Bill made a call to 911 on April 22, 2020, claiming that one of his college friends was attacking him and his two other friends. The call was made from within the house after one of the friends, Justin, had already died, and the other friend, Paul, was brutally injured. Bill said that Bryce attacked Justin with a lawn chair and broke his skull. Bryce could only manage to hit Paul twice, while Bill escaped to make the call. As Bill was on the call and running away from Bryce, who was chasing after him, the dispatcher heard Bill scream, after which all contact from Bill was lost. Fortunately, the police arrived in time and broke Bryce out of his manic state. Bill had received a blow to the head from the baseball bat, but the police officers surrounded Bryce before he could strike Bill for a second time. Paul and Bill were put into ambulances and taken to the hospital. All three boys were taken into custody for interrogation purposes after Paul and Bill recovered. It was revealed that Bryce was the least like friend in the group, and he was constantly bullied at school and made fun of by the other three boys. The only reason he was in the friend group in the first place was to be made fun of and emotionally tortured and embarrassed at every step. I'd had enough, claimed Bryce. While he was being interrogated, he said that he couldn't take any more bullying and humiliation. He said that he had to take matters into his own hands. He said that they had to pay for their actions after the years of torture they had inflicted on him. The other two boys' stories were vastly different than Bryce's. They claimed that they had known Bryce for a long time and said that he had extreme anger issues and that he suffered from anxiety and social neglect. They said 
that sometimes it would seem like Bryce wasn't even a normal sane person. He would lose all sense of control, even at the slightest inconvenience. Bill and Paul claimed that once they tried to kick him out of the group and his behavior became extremely strange. He came to their homes and stayed there for a while to talk to their families and he threatened to harm the boys' families if they tried to kick him out of the group again. And this was the only reason that they decided to let him stay in the group. Psychotherapists were called in and it was confirmed that Bryce did indeed suffer from extremely uncontrollable anger issues but in no way should this stop him from being punished for his crimes. He took the life of an innocent person and tried to kill two others for which he would suffer the consequences. Despite his pleads and requests, the court ordered Bryce to be imprisoned, after which his friends moved on peacefully without Justin who was murdered even though he was completely innocent and whom they missed deeply. Nine one one. What is your emergency? There is someone on my porch. I don't know him, and he won't go away. All right. Please tell me your current address. Twelve Twin Bluff Road. I'm sending the police now, but I want you to stay with me. Tell me what this man is doing. I'm, I'm trying to remain calm. All right. My house sort of juts out on one side, so I am walking to a window in that jut where I can see the front door. So are you the only one there? Just me and the man. So what is happening? Nothing as of yet. Oh, God. What? The man is sitting there on a chair. He is just smiling at me. Oh, God. Oh, God. The police are on the way. Good. He is just sitting there. He is not moving. Why is he smiling at me? What is happening? I don't know. You know what? Move away from the window. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Why? What if he tries breaking into my house? I'd rather see him. It is your safety versus your house. I'm going to try to help you. Okay, I'm walking deeper in my house. I want you to affirm you are the only one there. Oftentimes criminals don't work alone. I don't hear anything. I'm alone in the bathroom, but I can only think about that man. Now that I think about it, something was wrong about that man. I need to see him again to tell you what exactly. The squad car is only five minutes away. Good, good. I'm going to see the porch again. Are you sure you will be safe? Yes. Report what is happening, second by second. I will. He's still there. Oh God, not again. His pupils, that's what's wrong. His smile, he's gotta stop. I swear he hasn't moved since I left. Only his eyes seem to follow me. You said something was wrong with his pupils. Oh yes, they take up his whole eyes. Almost like dog eyes. Wait, he just cocked his head. His face lost its smile. Oh no, it's back again. Three minutes and the police will arrive. He just got up. He mouthed something. Should I sit down or stand? Do you want me to come in? No, 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 oh good. He sat back down. What is happening? Nothing. He is smiling at me, not moving. Oh no, I hear creaking in my house. Quickly now, get to a bathroom. Lock yourself in it. I'm pretty much sprinting there. The creaking has stopped doesn't matter. Lock yourself in the bathroom. I wasn't ever thinking of not doing it. I'm locked in. I'm safe. The phone falls silent. Nothing is heard. Hello? You still there? Sir? Hello? The cutting edge of silence. The edge of something which is so calm. The bloodied blade. Sir, are you there? The call ends. Police cars arrive the next day. There is an investigation that same day. A police report says, after investigation, we found out that the man in question was lured into the bathroom where the murderer was waiting <laughs> silently behind the shower curtains. She ran. The 911 operator was found to be working with the criminals. The audio recordings show that she claims to have sent a police car. We urge citizens to call 911 in the event of any emergency. The events that took place that night were an isolated incident. But nevertheless, we are running full investigations in the agency. <laughs> he ran. He was never caught. He died that faithful day. Silence lived on. Nine nine nine, what is your emergency? Please, 
I need the police. Please come quickly. Someone tried to hurt me. I've been stabbed. Someone assaulted you? Who assaulted you? I don't know. I just got home and I was attacked from behind. She stabbed me. Oh God, she stabbed me. Try and stay calm. What is your location? I can get some help to you. I live in the small apartments on Chapel Road. Please hurry. She's outside my bedroom trying to get in. Okay, someone is on the way. Help is already on the way. You said the person that hurt you is outside your bedroom? Yes, she is trying to get in. I can hear her moving around outside. Go away! I've called the police, and they're coming now. Leave me alone! Just leave me alone! Please hurry. I can hear her laughing outside. She wants to kill me. Okay, just try and stay calm. You said that you are in your bedroom. Are you safe? Is the door locked? Yes, I managed to lock the door, but I don't know whether it's enough. Okay. Help is coming. Just stay on the line. Can you tell me where you are injured? She had a knife. It happened so fast she sent me. Please hurry. I'm so scared. Okay, okay. What is your name, sweetie? Emma. My name is Emma. Okay, Emma. Are you bleeding? Can you let me know where she hurt you? Oh, God. Yes, there is a lot of blood on my side. It doesn't hurt, but there is a lot of blood. Shouldn't it hurt? I will. One second. Oh, oh my God. It's coming from my side. My ribs. Oh my God. There's a hole between my ribs. She stabbed me. She stabbed me. The police and the ambulance are on their way. Hope is coming. Just keep talking to me. Can you still hear the person outside your room? No, it's so quiet now. Please hurry. I don't want to die. You're not going to die, Emma. They are almost there. Help is almost there. I don't hear anything. There's so much blood. Oh, God. There is so much blood. Emma, sweetie, they are coming. They won't be long. Just try and tell me what happened. Please help me. Please. I just want to be okay. We are coming, Emma. Just tell me what happened. What happened? I don't know. I just got home. I thought someone punched me. It felt like someone punched me. I turned around and, and I saw her. She had a knife. She was smiling. It was a woman, Emma? What did she look like? I don't know. I just ran inside and hid. And but she got in. I can't hear her outside anymore. She tried to kill me. I'm dying. Emma, you're not going to die. Help is no more than a few minutes away now. Just keep talking to me, okay? Just keep talking. Okay. Okay. Can you hear anything outside the door? No. It's quiet. It's just... It's so quiet. Emma, just keep talking to me. Stay with me. They just told me they have arrived. Can you see their lights through the window, Emma? Help is here. They are going to help you. It's so quiet. I can't hear anything. Why doesn't it hurt? My side is cut and there's so much blood and I can't feel it. Why can't I feel it? Emma, can you not see the lights? The officers told me they have arrived. It's blurry. My eyes don't feel right. Emma, listen to me. You said that you live on Chapel, the north side of town. It's quiet. My eyes... So cold. Emma, please, Chapel Road. I have not seen my parents this week. I need to see them. Please, Emma, you live on Chapel Road on the north side of town. I, I live on Chapel Road. It's on the south side of town. South? The line went silent and Emma never spoke again. It was found that the dispatcher had mistakenly given the officers the wrong address. There were two streets named Chapel Road in London, England and the officers had unfortunately been sent to the incorrect location. When they finally arrived at Emma's home, the police found Emma, still holding the phone. Her eyes were wide open and etched with terror. They were too late, and she had sadly succumbed to her injuries and she was pronounced dead at the scene. A lengthy investigation followed to find the suspect, but the police could recover little evidence from the scene. Emma Lewis's murder is still unsolved to this day. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, hello? Yes, uh, I'm in a plane and... It's... Hello, ma'am. What was that? Did you say you're on a plane? Yes, I'm on a plane. I... I... I don't know what... I don't know what's happening... All right, calm down, ma'am. What's wrong? I, I was on a flight. A flight? Yes, a flight. I was going from Texas to... To where? 
and it was going fine. I took off, the plane was full, and the pilot was speaking. Giving us the rundown. You know, you've been on a plane before, right? Yes, I, I have. What's the issue, ma'am? Well, it was nighttime, and the, the, the flight had a few hours, so I figured I'd go to sleep, and then... <laughs> it's okay, ma'am. What happened when you tried to go to sleep, ma'am? Uh, I went to sleep, but when I woke up, the plane... <laughs> Ma'am, it's okay. What happened when you woke up? The plane was completely empty. Empty? Yes, the plane is completely empty and my son... Oh my God. My son is gone and I don't know where he is. It's okay, ma'am. I'm sure your son is fine. The plane is completely empty and you're still in the air. Yes, yes. And as far as I'm aware, the plane hasn't landed at all. I just... I woke up and it's empty. Okay. Well, then who's flying the plane? That's the other thing. The plane... It's... It's not moving. Not moving? It's completely stationary in the air. The plane is moving, but it's in the air. Oh, God. What's happening to me? Am I going to die? Ma'am, everything will be fine. I just need you to listen to my voice and do as I say. Is that okay? Um, yes, I think I can do that. Okay, ma'am. I'm going to need you to get up. Can you do that? Okay, I'm, I'm standing in the aisle now. Good. Now make your way to the front of the plane, and I want you to locate the pilot at the controls. Can you do that? Yes. It's okay, I'm right next to there. I'm making my way there. What's... What's your name? My name? Tyler. Okay, Tyler. My name's in it. I'm at the door. Just the control is where the pilot should be. The door is locked shut. Okay. Can you knock on it, Enid? Hello? Mr. Pilot, are you there? Enid? I'm alright. Did you hear that? There was a noise behind the door. Let me see if I can... It open. I... Enid, are you okay? Enid! Oh, God. I'm hiding behind a row of chairs. I think. I think there's something in there with me. Something in there with you? God. I'm gonna die here. I'm gonna die. You're gonna be fine, Enid. Speak to me. This is a story that my mom told me. She heard this from a friend who claims that this happened to her. Being a 911 operator is not exactly the easiest job out there. The hours are long, the pay is mediocre, and you get to experience a lot of grim stuff. People calling in with their relatives dying in front of them. Car crashes and domestic abuse is a regular thing. In spite of all this, I enjoyed working as one. I got to talk to a lot of people and we formed a tight bond at my workplace. So I stayed on for almost 20 years, from my early 20s to my early 40s before switching careers. I have received countless calls over the years, but there is one that sticks with me to this day that gives me chills just talking about it. So here is my story. I had just started my shift that would go from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. The office was pretty deserted at that point. with only a couple of other operators. I logged in and started doing my thing. The first hour was pretty standard, nothing major happening. But then, at around 7 p.m., a call comes in. I answer the phone. 911, what's the emergency? No answer. I wait a couple of seconds before I speak up. Hello, you've reached 911. How may I assist you? Yes, hi. A voice appeared on the other line. It was a man, but he spoke very slowly, almost whispering. Could you send someone out here, please? Sir, could I ask you to please speak a bit louder? Yes, of course, sorry. I need some assistance out here. I got his address. He had raised his voice, but it was still pretty quiet. He was calm, but I could tell that his breathing was uneven. 
I realized that he was probably whispering, as he did not want to be heard by someone or something. What do you need assistance with? I need to know so I can send the proper help. Well, there's a man in my living room. A man? What is he doing? Nothing. He's just standing there, completely still. Has he said anything? No, not a word. I didn't even see him through the window when I came home. What does he look like? He's tall, slim build, almost too slim. He has a gray suit on with black shoes, light skin. What does his face look like? I don't know. His back is turned against me. Could you please send some help? I now realized just how scared this man was. He was trying to stay calm, but I could tell that he was trembling with fear. Assistance is on the way. It will take about 20 minutes. Stay on the phone with me and I'll help you, okay? Okay. When did you first notice him? About 10 minutes ago, maybe. I came home from work but did not see anything through the windows as I said. Then, when I walked in the living room, he was there. He did not react or anything. So where are you now? I am in the hallway in a chair. If I lean forward slightly, I can see into the living room and see him. I could feel a chill creeping up my spine. This was very odd. If it had been a burglar, he would have done something by now. All right, I'm going to need you to do something. Could you please walk into the living room and try to take a look at his face or see if you get any response? Oh, okay, wait a minute. He put the phone down. This took place in the 80s, so cell phones weren't a thing. Every house had a landline. I could hear some movement and then I heard his voice again. I tried to, but I could not see his face. It's hard to explain. Please hurry up. I heard the sound of a door opening. Hang on. My wife just got home. I got to explain the situation to her. I heard hushed voices talking and I could hear that his wife started crying. Even I was scared now. This whole situation felt strange. After a while, he got back on the phone. Okay. We are both in the hallway now. She has also seen him and she knows the situation. Where are the police? They are on the way, I promise. Could I please talk to your wife? I heard some rustling and then a female voice. She also spoke in a quiet voice while trying to suppress her crying. Hello? Hi, I was wondering, could you please describe the man in your living room? Yes, he is very tall and slim, gray suit and black shoes. He is wearing shoes and getting them on a new carpet. Now, when people are in a state of panic or shock, they will often say stuff that appears to be very mundane and disconnected from the situation. It's a coping mechanism. She continued, I was at the gym, so I got home later than usual. When I parked in her driveway, I noticed that the desk lamp in the living room was alight. I thought it was weird because that's my desk where I draw and it's only lit when I'm drawing, but I did not see someone in the living room. Okay, and the man in your living room, has he not said anything? No, not a sound or movement. All he has done is getting stains on my new carpet. Oh, please send someone fast. She started crying again. I could see on my monitor that the police were only a couple minutes away. The husband picked up the phone. Yes. Hi. It's me again. Are the police close? Yes. Only a couple of minutes now. I am going to need one of you to go outside and meet the police so that they can assist you. No, we can't. We're too afraid. I can't leave my wife alone. As I said earlier, this call was through a landline, so they could not go outside and stay on the call. I think we'll manage for a couple of minutes before the... Wait, what? Suddenly, he became silent. I tried to get his attention, but neither he or his wife made any noise. I heard some rustling followed by footsteps, heavy footsteps, the kind only big boots can make when walking indoors. And then, I heard the most chilling roar I have ever heard. It sounded inhuman very deep and incredibly strong. I jolted in my chair. Every hair on my body was standing straight up. Then, complete silence. Hello? Are you there? Hello? Click. The person on the other end hung up the phone. I tried calling back, but no answer. But then I saw something that still confuses me. My monitor made no indication that any patrols had been sent out to that address. I tried for an hour calling both the house and the number I got to the patrol car I had dispatched, but nothing. I continued working and taking calls, but that incident was on my mind the entire night. When I got off, I immediately drove a friend of mine who works at the local police station. 
I asked him about this, but he had no memory of any police cars being dispatched to that address that night. I was completely dumbfounded. Had I been dreaming? Was I hallucinating? I was sure that I had talked with that couple, and I also remembered that inhuman roar. I drove home and tried to get some sleep, which I managed to do after a number of glasses of wine. A few days later, I had a day off. I decided to get to the bottom of this and soothe my mind. The address was written down in my notebook and I drove to the address. By coincidence, I arrived around the same time that the call had been made, a few minutes, give or take. It was a nice area, full of expensive houses with new cars in the driveways and perfectly trimmed lawns. The house on the address did not stand out. It had a light yellow color with a garden filled with different types of flowers. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. It was quiet and the air was warm. But then I noticed something. In the window, there was a light. It was a desk light shining brightly. As I was staring at this, unsure of my next move, a car pulled into the driveway. It was a new BMW that parked. Out of the car came a woman looking the part of an expensive car owner. I could smell the perfume from the curb I was standing on. The weird thing was that she did not seem to notice me at all. I was, after all, standing right in front of their house, looking straight at it. Most people would at least react to a stranger standing in front of your house. She started walking towards the house but stopped after a few steps. I could see the confusion in her eyes, and then she spoke. Huh, that's weird. Why is my desk light on? I recognized the voice straight away. It was the wife. I froze in place, unsure of what to do. The hairs on my arms stood straight up. The woman walked to the front door, opened it, and went inside. I stood in front of the house for maybe ten minutes, staring intensely at the window with the desk light. Nothing. At last, I jumped in my car and drove away. I could not shake the feeling of complete fear. I have never heard anything about that house or anything similar to it. I later moved away from that town and have never returned. It just makes me feel weird being there. It's been over 30 years, but I still remember it as clear as day. The trembling voice of the husband, the wife crying, and that inhuman roar. I was living in Berlin in Germany, and my boyfriend at the time lived about five hours drive away. So I had planned to go and see him, like every fortnight for the weekend, and I used the carpooling site, blah blah car, which I had used many times before this. I see that a young man is heading down that way, and that there's already one seat taken by another girl, so I reserve my seat and wait for this person to come and fetch me. We meet up at the spot that he agreed to, and he explains to me that the other girl had to cancel last minute, which is totally fine I suppose. Odd, but, I mean, it can happen. Anyway, I jump in. The driver, Ben, seems pretty nice, talkative. But just before leaving Berlin, too, he turns to me and explains that he's forgotten his driver's license at home and that we must go and fetch it. Which is already a bit of a pain, because it's on the other side of town and Berlin is big. And let's be honest, too. You know that you're going away for the whole weekend and that you have a really big journey and you forget your license? I don't know. Anyway, moving on. We get to his and he parks and turns to me and says, Would you like to come in with me and visit my place? I was like, uh, no thank you. And after about five minutes, off we go. He's talking away and all of a sudden starts touching my thigh and explains that he's a personal trainer and also a massager. And I was like, well, good for you guy. I made it quite clear though that I was heading to my boyfriend's and that I was not comfortable. He continues touching my hands, my thighs, and my neck, and at that point, I was sort of like, should I get out? I mean, I am on a motorway, already about two hours away from Berlin, and it's traffic jammed. And so, unfortunately, five hours ended up being like seven hours. My plan was to pretend that I was asleep. I thought that that way I don't have to interact with him and he might just leave me alone. Thing is, I really fell asleep and when I wake up, 
I realize that I am in the middle of nowhere, like on tiny roads in the middle of a forest, and the guy turns to me and says, you know, if I wanted to, I could kidnap you and take you into the woods, right? I played tough, and I said, you don't scare me. I'm planned for all situations. He didn't seem to take any notice, and my boyfriend rang me at that point. I explained everything, and I kept him posted. So, as we come out of these woods, he decides that it's now time to eat, so we lose another 45 minutes while he does his own thing. I basically tell him at this point too that I'm fed up and I want no more stops, and he tells me that he's tired and that in order to do so and keep himself awake, I must massage him. I felt totally stuck, so I briefly touched his neck as in to say, now move. Eventually we arrived finally and my boyfriend was not there waiting for me because I didn't want him to get into a fight. But I got out of the car quickly and I reported him to the carpooling site and he's now been banned. I really hope too that this never happens to anyone else because let me tell you, while I put up a pretty tough exterior, I was definitely panicking on the inside. When I was in high school, I had a stalker. Here's the story. I was 16 years old and we had met on Facebook. He went to a school nearby and we decided to meet up for a movie. We had a really great time together and we actually ended up dating. The first time that he came to my parents' house, he had an anchor monitor on for house arrest and he wouldn't tell anyone why. And since he was a minor, we couldn't find out. Now, my parents obviously didn't allow us to hang out so we had to hang out at his house or at around town at the YMCA camp. I was rebellious and naive. Things started to get weird when I noticed his family was pretty odd. One day while we were having sex in his bedroom, I saw his father looking through the blinds. I screamed and called him out for it, and his dad ran off. He told me that his dad was into redheads and he just liked to watch us. I went to leave and his mom was doing crack in the kitchen. So, yeah, I decided it was time to break up. This is when it got bad. He actually started crying and he told me that he's in cancer treatment and that's why he needs me. That he doesn't have long to live. Blah, blah, blah. I actually believed him and I told him we could be friends. And this is when the stalking began. He switched schools to my high school, but he never went to class. He would just stand outside of my classroom looking inside until it was passing period. Whenever I would leave class, he wouldn't address me. He would always just follow about 10 to 15 feet behind me to my next period and just stand outside the classroom again. I was too intimidated to say something to him. He was 6 foot 4 and kind of a heavy set guy, so I kind of just let it happen for weeks. It started to progress to where he would follow me home every day. He would get on the same exact bus as me and walk 10 to 15 feet behind me all the way to my house. He would stand outside just staring up at the windows until around the time my parents got home and then he would just leave. I finally had enough and I told him to screw off and leave me alone. I told him that we could no longer be friends or even acquaintances and to just forget about me. However, that only escalated things way further. I started getting about 150 calls a night. Half of them were screaming death threats and in detail torture methods that he wanted to do to me and the other half were him singing love songs that he wrote on his guitar. Every time I blocked his number, he seemed to just magically get a new one. I leave even more messages. I woke up one day to see that overnight, he had left me one of those singing, dancing snowmen on my porch. He had stabbed it in the head, and the knife was still sticking out. He covered it in his liquid deodorant that I had previously mentioned liking the smell of, and I noticed there was a hole where the little song recording device was. When I pressed the hand, it wasn't the regular Frosty the Snowman that usually played. It was his own voice saying eerily, I'm going to have you forever. I'm never going to let you be. I was absolutely done at this point, and I told my parents, who then contacted the school. They suspended him from school, but he still waited at my bus stop every day and also walked to my home with me. One day he actually ran at me like he was going to tackle me or something. When I tensed up for the impact, he stopped and hugged me. It wasn't a regular hug though, it was like he was trying to crush me. I was 5 foot 1 and about 90 pounds at the time, and he actually ended up cracking one of my ribs. 
I cried, and he started crying too, before then running off. He left me a voicemail where he apologized in song. This one night is the night that I'll never forget, and it's actually the sole reason that we got a restraining order and my dad getting a gun. I woke up one evening for no reason. I was just fully awake. I got up to go to my kitchen and go get a glass of water to relax, and in the reflection of my fridge, I saw movement in my backyard. I couldn't really see well because it was so dark outside and so light inside, so I went to the back sliding glass door to get a better look. When I got a little closer, I was met with the silhouette of a six foot four man standing just outside the door. My stalker Rex was actually in my backyard under my room at three in the morning. He was just staring at me. I yelled and my parents got up, but he was long gone by the time my dad went outside. There happens to be a patio right outside my bedroom window that goes all the way to the ground, so it's very possible that he could have been on top of the patio looking directly into my bedroom window before. We got a restraining order granted shortly after that, and my stalker ex dropped out of school. I haven't seen him since in person, but every six months he makes a new Facebook and he always tries to friend request me. I just block it and report it every time. Scary stuff. Have you ever heard of that myth that if you wake up in the middle of the night for no reason at all, there's likely something looking at you? Well, maybe it's true. I don't know what he's doing now or where he went, and I really don't care to know. Nine one one. what is your emergency? There's someone in here. Where? Where are you, ma'am? I'm at a Walmart in downtown Los Angeles. Who's there with you, and what is your name? I'm Stacy. I'm waiting for my boyfriend to pick me up, but he's stuck in traffic. Walmart closes at 11. No one is supposed to be here at this time. I was closing the store. I'm the manager. How do you know someone is there? I was in the bathroom, and I heard the tap water running. And when I came out of the cubicle, the door was swinging wildly, as if someone had just run outside. Is there any way you can make it to the exit, ma'am? I was going to do that, but when I came out, I heard a man breathing loudly, and it seemed as if he were close and blocking the exit, so I ran the opposite way to hide. Please hurry up. Hold on, our team is on the way. Are you in a safe hiding place? Uh, yes, I, I think so. I'm behind the shoe rack. And you're sure you won't be discovered? Yes, I'm sure. I guess. All right, ma'am, stay put. We'll be right there, okay? I'm so scared. Stay on the phone with me, all right? You're going to be okay. We'll get you out of there. Yes, please. There seems to be a road accident on the highway. There's a massive traffic jam. Unfortunately, it will take a while for help to reach you, but do not panic. It won't be that long. Oh, no. What am I going to do now? Ma'am, stay calm. We're with you on the line. Nothing will go wrong. Help. Help. He knows where I am. How do you know that? He dropped a picture onto my phone. It's a picture of me sitting behind the shoe rack. He can see me. Oh my god! Ma'am, you need to change your hiding location until we get there. You must move to a safer spot. Okay, I'm running toward the exit now. Oh my god, he's following me! Run. The police will be there shortly. Get out of the store. I'm, I'm trying! Please don't let me die. He's right behind me! How far are you from the exit? I'm passing through aisle 5 right now. The exit is a minute or two away if I run. And he's right behind me. He's going to get me. Ma'am, what happened? Are you okay? Ah, no, no. Please don't hurt me. Ah. 28-year-old Stacy Rivera contacted 911, claiming that there was someone stalking her in the superstore she worked in. She was the manager there and needed to stay behind until all the customers left. She informed the police that she had heard a man breathing. While she was talking to the dispatcher, she received a picture from her stalker. It was a picture of her sitting in her hiding spot. It seemed as if it were taken from behind her. The dispatcher told Stacy to run for the exit. There was an accident on the highway which caused a massive traffic jam and police were delayed due to it. While Stacy was running, she told the dispatcher every move that she made and kept saying that the stalker was right behind her. When she had said she was passing through aisle 5, Stacy screamed in agony and she heard the words please don't hurt me before a thud was heard and the dispatcher lost all contact with Stacy. When the police got there, 
they discovered Stacy's body, lying limp on the floor with fresh blood gushing from her head. She had been killed. The store was locked down and investigations were conducted. The first step was to review the CCTV footage of the entire incident. Upon playing the video, the police found out that the situation was exactly as Stacy had described. Her stalker was clothed from head to toe and wearing a mask, so there was no way to tell who it was. One of the cameras even caught him taking Stacy's photo. As soon as she began to run, the stalker ran behind her, catching up to her quite quickly. He pushed her onto the ground and kicked her in the face. Then he grabbed her hair and started to bang her head against the floor repeatedly, until Stacy's screams faded away and her body grew limp. He continued to kick her in the face and then punched her dead face repeatedly. This proved that he was nothing more than a heartless psychopath. To this day, the police cannot figure out who the killer was, what he wanted, and why he ruthlessly murdered Stacy like that. Forensics claim that there were no fingerprints left behind. The killer had come well prepared by hiding his face and body with a mask, bulky clothes, and gloves. To this day, it is a curious case that has never been solved. To this day, Stacy's killer roams free. It was predicted that a possible serial killer did it, as many similar incidents were reported in the time span of a few months. The same fully clothed figure was spotted at various crime scenes across the local area, but he was never caught. Nine one one. What is your emergency? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. What seems to be the problem? I, I don't know, ma'am. I'm tied up. I managed to get one of my hands free, but the rest of my body is chained. What is your location, and may I know your name? I'm Carson. Twenty-five years old. I don't know where I am. It's very dark, but I can hear sounds. What kinds of sounds, sir? They're whispers. How did you get here? I don't know. The last thing I remember was being drunk at a bar, and then I woke up here. All right, we'll be tracking your cell phone. Please, hurry. It's as if I can hear wild animals and wails of people crying around me. I am so scared. Turn up the flashlight and describe what you see to me. All right. Give me a second. Bloody hell! What do you see? There are weird, messed up, animalistic things caged up. There are people, too. Their skin, it's oozing out some thick liquid that resembles pus. Ask the people. Ask them why they are there. What are you guys doing here? They won't answer me, ma'am. It's as if they're not in their senses. All right, where are you? Describe the room you're in. It's not much of a room. It looks more like an underground cave. There's water dripping from the walls, and it smells awful in here. We have your location. It's near an amusement park. We'll get you out in no time, okay? Yes, please. I'm suffocating. The chains are too tight. Oh no. What's wrong? Someone is coming. Take the pigs up to the lab. We'll do the rest later. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. I am here. Did you hear that? Yes. Who were they? Did you see them? Yes. They had a flashlight on. There were three men. Two were dressed like doctors in lab coats, and the other was dressed in what looked like a radiation suit. It was a hazmat suit, I, I presume. All right, I will record that information. They took two of the pigs from the cage and left without saying anything. Sir, you have to tell me a bit more about where you are, all right? Our team is there, but there isn't any sign of where you might be. I don't know. I'm somewhere underground. I, I don't know where, but I just know that I'm underground. Please, someone help. I hear them torturing the pigs. I can hear their screams. They'll do the same to me. The same thing they did to these people over here. Please, I don't want to end up like them. You have to do it. 
do something. <laughs> please. Please. Sir, sir, please calm down. We need you to help us, okay? Look again for any signs that can help us identify your exact location. Yes. All right. Um, well, there's a faint sound of music playing. Sounds like it might be from a circus or something like that. How close is the sound? It's very faint. I can barely hear it. Which direction is it coming from, right or left? It's like it's coming from above me, but slightly to the left, I would say. Okay, I will pass on this information. They're coming again. Oh no, oh god, no! What is happening? Well, well. Trying to escape, are we? Not very obedient behavior, hmm? <laughs> Take him away! No! No, stop! What are you doing?! On the 10th of June, 2018, a young man named Carson, aged 25, made a call to 911. He informed the dispatcher that he had been kidnapped and was tied up with chains in a cave. He was unaware of how he had ended up there. The way he described his surroundings was quite strange. He said that there were various animals and humans that looked deformed and injured as if someone had cut their skins open. The police had to track down the location of Carson's phone as he had no idea where he was. But even after that, they could not find him. They were standing in a field near an amusement park, but there was no sign of Carson. In between the call, his kidnappers came in and took away some pigs whom they later tortured, as confirmed by Carson. Carson later told the dispatcher that he had heard some music from far away. It was from the circus nearby, and as he had informed that it was coming from his left and above him, police started looking for any signs that would prove as a pathway for the cave where Carson was. As soon as Carson talked about the sound, the kidnappers came in and took him away. He screamed, but he was carried away and he lost his phone as well. It was very fortunate that the police were able to find an obscure vent in the ground that led to the cave. They heard Carson's screams and ran to find him lying on a stretcher down in the cave. He was tied up and there were two people hovering above him with knives in their hands. The kidnappers had a video camera set up that was recording the entire event. They were immediately arrested and their underground setup was investigated. There were several animals and missing people found there. Under interrogation, it was found out that they had been kidnapping people and caging animals in order to physically torture them and make videos of the entire process and upload those videos on the dark web. Carson was luckily saved in time, and the rest of the people were sent into recovery. The criminals confirmed that they had been doing this for over two years. They were sent to jail. Nine one one, what's your emergency? I think I was kidnapped. Pardon me? Somebody took me last night. Do you know where you are, sir? I'm at my apartment. So you escaped? No, they they brought me back. They? The assholes who took me. Please send the police before they come back. What is your address, sir? The police are on their way, sir. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Now I need you to tell me more about what happened. I was kidnapped last night, you know that. I need more details, sir. Oh, where to start? Well, they, they came in through my bedroom window. The window? Yeah, they broke it with a rock. I, I found it lying on the carpet when I got back. How many of these people were there? Four. Can you describe them? All big motherfuckers dressed, dressed in dark trench coats and neon-colored ski masks. Three of them had what I think were hunting rifles, but the biggest one, the leader, he had a machete. Uh-huh. He's the only one who spoke. His buddies remained silent throughout the whole freaking ordeal. He spoke in this weird accent. German, I think, but like deliberately awful. Obviously disguising his voice. After they broke in, they found me hiding in my closet with a bedside lamp I grabbed as a makeshift weapon. The leader told me they didn't want any trouble, but that I needed to come with them immediately. 
Of course, I was like, no fucking way, get out of my house before I call the police. Uh Uh-huh. The leader just nodded at one of his cronies who stepped forward and produced a syringe from the pocket of his coat. It was filled with dark, blackish-looking liquid. The assholes held me down and injected me. I tried to fight him off, but I'd, I'd been drinking earlier. I was still in shock, half convinced that this was all a dream and all I needed was to go back to sleep. Sir, can you tell me what happened after they injected you? Well, it hurt like hell for a moment. My, like my body was on fire. Every nerve ending was screaming and, and yet I felt cold too. Like, like my blood had turned into ice water. But then I passed out. And they took you from your house while you were unconscious? Yes, I can't tell you how long I was out, but when I woke up, I was lying on a lumpy old couch in what I think was the basement of a house. It was pretty dark, but I could make out what looked like a pool table and a mini fridge. What struck me was the smell. It was this kind of sickly sweet odor, like an overripe melon. Kind of like the disgusting perfume my high school French teacher used to wear. God, that woman was a bitch. Uh, Sorry. What physical state were you in, sir? My arms and legs were bound with what I think was some kind of medical tape, but even if they weren't, there was no way I could have moved. I felt exhausted, completely drained. When I tried to sit up, I was overcome with dizziness and nearly passed out. Uh Uh-huh. I tried to call out, but my voice was gone. My my throat felt raw. There was a disgusting taste in my mouth, like like I'd been throwing up. Uh Uh-huh. For a while, I just sat there, waiting for something to happen. I should have been freaking out, but I was in too much shock to feel any real fear. But I knew that this was a dangerous situation and that whatever came next, I'd have to be ready. Uh Uh-huh. After a while, I started to hear footsteps upstairs, loud, heavy ones, like somebody was stomping around in heavy boots. Then I began to hear arguing. It was two male voices. One of them was the leader of the assholes who took me. It sounded pretty heated, but I could only make out a few words. And what were those words? Motherfucker, useless, stupid, payment. Is that all? Yes. What happened next? The argument lasted about 15 minutes, then someone came to get me. It was the leader, still in his coat and mask. He gestured for me to stay quiet, then cut off the tape. He then blindfolded me with a bandana and frog-marched me up the stairs. We walked through a door, and I felt cold air, so I knew we were outside. Uh Uh-huh. The guy said, a mistake has been made. He then escorted me into some kind of vehicle and drove for a while. When we stopped, he removed the blindfold, and I saw that we were back in my neighborhood. So he let you go? Yes, he told me to go inside, and that I shouldn't bother calling the police because they wouldn't find anything, but... How could I not call the police? You did the right thing, sir. Thank God, the cops are here. They'll take over from here, sir. While the call itself is pretty unsettling, it's the aftermath that makes the story even scarier. The man who made the call was taken to the hospital. He had no visible injuries and didn't mention being in pain. But since he'd been injected with some strange substance, they figured they couldn't be too careful. Well, as far as I know, the man survived, and the police conducted an extensive investigation. DNA was found at the scene of the crime, but it didn't match anyone in the national database. However, the investigation did uncover something very strange. Apparently, many similar incidents had taken place in that neighborhood over the years. Break-ins, assaults, trespassing and the victims always described one or more men in neon-coloured ski masks and dark coats. The man who made this call was the only kidnapping, and my theory is that they had a specific target in mind, but accidentally took him instead. What they planned on doing to the real abductee is anyone's guess. It seems something really shady was going on in that neighbourhood, and the fact that they managed to get away with it just makes it freakier. Who were those guys, and what did they want? I'm sure these same questions also plagued my grandmother. So that's the end of the transcripts. I know it took me a long time to post them all, but I wanted to thank you all for your patience. 
Goodbye. P.S. Stay safe, all of you. I was maybe 16 years old, and I was kind of a rebellious kid. I joined Tinder to meet some older guys, and I was matched with this really attractive 20-year-old that seemed really into me. Naive, I know. Anyway, he asked to pick me up from school the following day to get ice cream and walk around a nearby lake. I said yes. He picked me up and we had a great conversation. Nothing weird, and it seemed like we really enjoyed each other's company. When we got to the lake, no one was there because it was the middle of October and very cold on the water. We walked about halfway around the lake, and that's when it got weird. He started talking to me about crime documentaries and how he studied them and knew how to kill someone without getting caught. He started making tracks in the mud and said that he would wear shoes that were too big so the police couldn't match him on the shoe size. He picked up his shoes to show me ten and a half and informed me that he wore an eight. I got uneasy. He started strolling around me while I was sitting on a bench like I was prey. He went to one of those doggy baggy dispensers. He grabbed one of the bags and started swatting me in my face. I thought he might be trying to gross me out, so I half giggled and swatted it away. On one of my swats, he grabbed me by the forearm and pulled me in and put the bag over my head. Still, I thought he might be kidding, but as I tried to get away, I noticed he wasn't letting up. I was starting to panic now, realizing I wasn't getting any air, and he picked me up in sort of a headlock position. I was kicking and trying to elbow, and I guess one of the elbows connected to his groin, and we both fell to the ground. He laughed and said, You got more fight in you than I thought you did. Was just trying to make you pass out, but I didn't even get that far. I'm proud of you. All of my stuff, phone, taser, was in his car on the other side of the lake. So I decided to play along and pretend that it was funny. I told him I needed my inhaler now and to walk me back. He did surprisingly. I got to his car and I grabbed my taser and my phone while he walked around the back of his car to the driver's side. I text my mom SOS and to track my location. When I looked up from my phone, I noticed the guy had pulled out his pocket knife. He slowly laid it into the tip of my chest, just enough for it to pierce my skin. He just blankly stared at me, and this went on for about 30 full seconds. I don't know why, but I said, you're not going to do it. This seemed to snap him out of it, and he paused, and then let out a hysterical laugh. Between laughs, he got out, that's the second time I've tried to kill you today. The whole drive home, he proceeded to tell me how he would have raped and mutilated my body if I accidentally died that day. I got home and bolted out of the car. As soon as I did, he sped off. I got a dick pic later that night, and then he blocked me. I looked him up, and it turns out he was actually 27 years old, and had a criminal record for domestic violence. That's all I could get on him, though. I reported it to the police, but nothing really came of it, though. Probably because I wasn't willing to tell my parents what happened. Either way, worst encounter of my life. I'm 24 years old, female, and I live in Michigan. This happened in 2014 when I just turned 19 years old. I got convinced by one of my friends to try out Tinder, a dating app where you can meet people. As it's notorious for one-time flings, I wasn't really feeling comfortable trying it as I wanted something a little more serious. However, after hearing the success story of my friend on how she met her boyfriend, I caved in, choosing to take my chances. I guess I should mention I never had a boyfriend up to this point as I had always been a little more on the shy side. At any rate, I quickly made a profile and after a couple of days I started talking to this one guy who we're going to call Johnny. Johnny was a couple of years older than me and lived within a 30 mile radius. On his profile I saw a bunch of selfies and pictures of him in lab coats and playing with animals. He was pretty good looking with his short brown hair, neatly combed, with blue eyes and his short stubble. Apparently he was looking to study to be a veterinarian, which went well with my goal of becoming a nurse. I wasn't trying to think too ahead, but it was just a thought I had just in case. This Johnny guy ended up messaging me the same night we got matched and he introduced himself 
before asking me if he wanted to be friends. I thought, why not? And we started to text each other every single day. And that's how it began. Every morning I would awake to a message wishing me a great day and telling me how beautiful I was. That really gave me the confidence boost I'd been long seeking for years. Month comes and goes and we're starting to become a lot more comfortable speaking to one another. We had now moved from talking on Tinder to Instagram, where he had the same photos. I did find his follower count a bit questionable as I was the only one following him. Also, all the photos he had on Tinder were literally posted within 24 hours to his Instagram. I asked him what the deal was, but he told me he had just made an Instagram account for the first time. Whatever, I thought. One day, I came up with the idea of doing a phone call, but he was always making up excuses of being busy with studying or attending classes. I understood where he was coming from since I was busy with five classes myself and I barely had time to even sit down to watch the TV. But the thing is, it got to be a little too much. Summer vacation had arrived and he was still making up excuses. This was a warning sign to me, as I love the show Catfish and I already know the signs of a possible imposter just from watching the series. Even so, I guess I was so love-struck by his looks and his messages, I really wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. Finally, however, we decided on a day and time to do a phone call, and that day arrives, with me eagerly awaiting my cell phone to ring. At a little past 9.30pm, I get a call from an area code matching Johnny's. I answer with my heart beating at a million miles an hour, my palms sweating and shaking as I stumble over my words, giving a friendly greeting. This Johnny? Hello there, Ashley. Yes, this is him. How are you? Here's something I need to describe, because obviously, just by typing it out, he would never know. His voice sounded very deep and old, if that makes any sense. It's like I was speaking to a 50-year-old. He claimed he had been in an accident when he was younger, which caused damage to his vocal cords, which explained why he was so hesitant to speak to me over the phone. But this is where I caught him on a possible lie. On one of his Instagram posts, he had a short 15 second clip of him covering a song from Imagine Dragons, and from what I heard, it sounded incredible. No signs of possible voice issues. I ask him about the video, but he says he had recorded it a long time ago and had a friend help him fix the voice in an editing software program. Don't forget that clip by the way. He soon changed the subject as he started to tell me how deeply and madly in love he was with me before dropping the question of wanting me to be his girlfriend. I was actually so taken aback that I actually said yes in shock, big mistake looking back, and I started to shed tears thinking things were finally going my way. From that point on, Johnny started to get a lot more manipulative. What I mean is he would ask me what I was doing and where I would be at any given time. If for whatever reason I didn't respond within a certain time frame, he would message me saying I didn't love him and how I was breaking his heart. It's up to this point I was being very patient with him, but I finally made a huge discovery. My friend, the one who introduced me to Tinder, and myself had been randomly looking at some Instagram posts, the ones you see when looking at related hashtags and whatnot, and we noticed something that gave us the chills. There was a picture of Johnny except unlike his posts that had two likes, this one had about 200. As for the username, completely different. We clicked on the profile and saw this guy's name was Thomas and he had over a thousand followers. We scrolled through the posts and we found every single picture Johnny had posted. Even the video where he's singing the Imagine Dragon song was posted. What really broke my heart, however, was seeing this guy was already engaged and Johnny had purposely avoided using any of those photos. I started to cry as my friend held me in her arms, and she called Johnny for me. To our surprise, he answered almost immediately, with a very enthusiastic tone. Hey there, my beautiful joy of sunshine. How are you? My friend cuts to the chase, telling him we had found out his secret, and that he was to explain himself immediately. To no one's surprise, he hung up the phone, and he proceeded not to answer with follow-up calls. Later that night, he sent me various text messages explaining he was sorry and that he was only trying to make a friend because he was lonely. I felt really bad for him, but I told him this charade needed to end. He asks me if we could still be friends, 
and I make the mistake of saying yes. So right now, you're most likely asking yourself, that had to have been it for Johnny, right? Unfortunately, I didn't title my story Catfish Breaks Into My Home for Nothing, because this gets worse. It had been about six months since the last time I'd spoken to Johnny, and I now had my first official boyfriend. One day, we had returned from a double date with the same friend I'd been speaking of, and my boyfriend, who we will call Cameron, was dropping me off at my house. By the way, my parents were away for the weekend. Once we pulled up into my driveway, I told Cameron my parents had left him some avocados from our tree in the backyard that they wanted him and his family to have. So Cameron follows me inside as he waits for me in the kitchen since I wanted to go grab something from my room. This is when things go from fun and exciting to an absolute nightmare. Once I open my bedroom door, I see a couple of things. One, my bedroom window was open. And two, I saw movement underneath my bed. I then let out a scream when all of a sudden a man crawls out, almost as if I was in some sort of cheap, scary movie. This is a man in his late 40s. He was short, a bit overweight, with gray hair and glasses. The man tells me to relax before saying he was Johnny and just wanted to meet me in person, but I'm already running to Cameron, who meets me halfway down the hallway. All I'm able to manage to get out was man in my room. My boyfriend who conceal carries by the way, immediately runs into my room and finds the man trying to escape through the window. My boyfriend asks him who he was and what he was doing in the house, but all he says was he was sorry and that he was leaving. Well, he does just that, by crawling out through the window and then running across the street to an SUV that I hadn't realized was parked there. I took a couple of quick photos of his getaway vehicle, along with the license plate, for evidence. Cameron then calls my attention over to the bed. Chills run down my spine as my boyfriend pulls out a small pocket knife from under the bed that had been left by this stranger, or I guess I should say, Johnny. In any case, we call the authorities, and an investigation was launched almost immediately. Together with physical evidence and the text conversations I provided, I was able to get a restraining order, and he was never to contact me again. As for jail time, he did get it, but I didn't pay attention to any of the details, since I just wanted to move on with my life. It's been well over five years, and Cameron and I are now engaged, and we live across the country. We don't post on social media anymore, and if for the rare times we do, we never reveal locations or even plans. I have even legally changed my name to avoid them altogether. In case anyone is wondering, I believe this Johnny character found out where I lived because of some of my posts that I had public. Also, I contacted the original Instagram account of who Johnny took the photos from, and he was just as equally freaked out as me. Last I checked, I wasn't able to find him anymore, since I'm pretty sure he either changed his username altogether, or he got rid of his account.